Hey guys welcome back to my channel. What if Naruto rewound time? Mastering the shadows of his fate with a year's head start? Movie. Sasuke's hand was electrified once again, Naruto lie there unconscious. The Uchiha made his decision. Itachi, I will now have your eyes. As he plunged his fist into his rival and best friend, Naruto woke and screamed. Again he stabbed his Chidori into him, and this time he gurgled on his own blood. It wasn't enough he still wasn't dying, so he began to stab into him repeatedly and as he continued, Naruto's struggles slowed. There was fear in his eyes but mostly it was sadness, and a look of failure. It was done, Naruto was dead. But before Sasuke had stood all the way back up there was a blast of hatred and chakra. A power unlike anything he'd ever felt. And the world went white. Zero o octal zero when Naruto woke up, he was at the Hokage's office. Both Aruka and the third Hokage were there. But wait. Wasn't the third dead? He felt his head split, as he tried to remember. Why would he be dead, and why was Naruto so certain of this? What's going on? The confused Geninax. Well, Naruto-kun it seems you used up too much of your chakra, making that many clones. I expect you're hungry after such an exertion. If you'll promise me that you won't attempt to make so many clones at once again perhaps you can get some ramen on me. After he nodded, the Hokage handed him some money, and told Naruto the good news, that he agreed with Aruka about making Naruto a genin. Wasn't he already a genin? Naruto couldn't understand it but he did understand the pain in his gut. So the orphaned hero of the leaf, who had lost all grip on his reality, trudged towards Ichiraku ramen stand. Passing an anbu on his way inside he didn't even take note that it was still dark out or that the ramen stand should have been closed, he gave a greeting and asked for a large ramen with all the toppings and spices. What was going on? Was the Hokage dead or wasn't he? What happened, was it a dream? It had to be, but he couldn't remember much of it. The rest of the night and well into the next morning thoughts of what was happening hit him. He could remember things he was so sure never happened to him. Yet, he knew they would or had in some way. He had become a genin and been on a team with Sasuke and Sakura with a lazy janin, who was always late. So why was he now being made a genin again? What was he missing? He remembered his first real mission as a blur. It was in a land of water and ice. With a face that was hidden behind a mask. What did it mean? Instinctively he entered his mind and opened the lines of communication with the Kyubi. Zero o octal zero entering the chamber he stepped into the bars, instantly the massive fox's eyes shot open. The fox had been facing the bars when the Jinchuriki entered, but shocked that the boy would just walk in, he couldn't react the way he intended so he just turned his head and acted uncaring. Gaki. So you're here. Hey fox. Do you know anything about these weird memories I'm getting? Its head rose and its one visible eye squinted at him, memories? This was not the Naruto whom he was imprisoned in. He had changed ever so slightly, but the change was growing. I may know, but it is not my problem if you can't remember something that hasn't even happened to you yet, the giant beast said dismissively. With that the great nine-tailed demon settled down and began actively ignoring his prison, waiting for him to leave so he could check that. Zero o octal zero after exhausting his mind, and his mind's voice, our newly made genin decided to take a break. He remembered that the Hokage had told him how to get his ID and so he left for the photoshoot, it was done and over without incident and he headed to the Hokage to get registered. And then a little brat ran into the room and just as he began tripping over his scarf Naruto got the urge to do something. As the boy fell, Naruto's leg whipped out and kicked his legs out from under him. Naruto. The third had never seen Naruto lash out like that before. Pranks and things, yes, but not uncalled for violence. What? He should have known better than to attack the Hokage like that, it was pathetic. When sneaking up on someone, you don't announce yourself. Even as Naruto said it, he felt as if he had heard someone else say that exact same thing to him. Down on the floor the boy held his face and glared back up at them, you you tripped me. So. What of it? Standing now the kid pointed his finger at Naruto, you must not know who I am, he accused. Yeah I do, Naruto nonchalantly replied. Your name is Konohamaru, you have two friends and you're going to be a ninja in three years. Your babysitter is a closet pervert and self-proclaimed shortcut to greatness, when in reality he can't even keep up with you. And your scarf is going to get you hurt the next time you try running with it dragging between your feet. Konohamaru blinked, stared at Naruto and blinked again. 
The Hokage was also a little surprised and couldn't find the words to question Naruto's information, so he simply sat, trying his best to at least look all knowing about the situation. All right, who are you? And how did you spy on me without me catching you? As if I would need to spy, your stealth skills are a bad joke. Yeah, well, well, you forgot one big thing. I happen to be the Ho. Cage's grandson. So what? I'm going to be the next Hokage and I'll be an even better one than him anyway, and that makes you my underling. As Naruto said this, he turned around and walked towards the window. Yeah. Well, I've never even heard of you, Konohamaru shouted, but Naruto was already out the window. Looking to his grandfather, a stunned Konohamaru bubbled up with questions about this new influence in his life. That was Naruto Uzumaki. He is a lot like you. However, unlike you, he has no family, not even a grandfather. Yet, he set his sights for being Hokage right at your age, and has worked hard to get there ever since, his grandfather explained. Glancing at the window, Konohamaru had already decided, that boy, Naruto Uzumaki, was going to train him. Turning toward the door the Hokage's grandson made a dash to follow his new target, and tripped over his scarf. Zero o octal zero the noise coming from the academy training grounds were normal except for one thing. Today there wasn't supposed to be anyone there. Naruto and his twenty clones were training, he had already begun improving greatly. He had already begun to hit the targets every time, not dead center but at least it was a hit, and his taijutsu was faster as well. And as he improved, little details kept popping up, not just in his mind, but also in the minds of the clones. He knew there was more he could do, more he could learn or relearn from his future memories, however that worked. Then he heard it, the tiniest of gasps. And so, while his clones continued working he substituted himself out and snuck up on the little spy. Konohamaru screamed and began kicking him the moment his hand grabbed the boy's ankle and flipped him upside down. Hey kid, what are you trying to do? Stop kicking me. The kicking stopped surprisingly, and Naruto remembered the sense of pride he had when the kid called him boss way back, in the future. Anyway it was time to get that back. So Naruto dropped Konohamaru on his head, getting a yelp of surprise and pain. So you came to me for training right? No, huh? How did you know? That. Doesn't matter. What does matter is that you're not ready for my kind of training. What? Why not, you have a shortcut and I want to learn it, so how am I not ready? He was right. Naruto realized. These memories were a shortcut, but they were his memories right? Meaning. He had learned them before, so it was still all him. Well, for one, there is no such thing as a shortcut in getting stronger. The older boy said as he bopped the smaller one on the head. Then what about that jutsu you were using with the solid clones? That was my own jutsu, and it requires too much chakra for you to handle. If you want an awesome jutsu you have to be ready to work for it. Naruto replied in a proud tone. Blinking he looked at the little kid in front of him, he was certainly willing to work for it, at least if his face said anything. Now, um, let's begin working for it. Naruto knew just what to teach the kid. First, we will run around the village three times, then we will work on your chakra control. Naruto dispelled his clones and began at a good pace. Not his fastest but fast enough that Konohamaru would have to work to keep up. Zero o octal zero once they had made the laps, Konohamaru could barely keep running. So Naruto knew this was the right time for it. Now, it's time for you to learn how to mold your chakra. E. But boss, I'm beat. Of course you are. In order to become Hokage you have to work hard and if you can't you'll never make it. Now open your ears and get ready to learn how to mold your chakra. Um, boss, we already learned that. Okay, well. This was odd. Naruto was certain that he himself hadn't learned how to mold chakra until he was at least a year older than the kid was now, but then, that was probably the teachers getting back at the Kyubi. So what now? What did he do last time? Oh, can you do a henge yet? Um, we learned how to, but I can't get it yet. Great we'll do that then, now here's what we do. Zero o octal zero the training went good. Konohamaru was worn out, but he was still able to produce a sexy henge by the end of the day. They agreed to meet the next day as well. However, before leaving Naruto had to introduce his new underling to the finest food in the village. Ramen. They were almost there when Naruto noticed him. Ebisu, the closet pervert himself, come to ruin his great day, and his teaching career. Then he realized something, 
Ebisu was standing on the side of the ramen stand, by his feet alone. Seeing this, Naruto also saw him standing on water somewhere. It seemed like a long time ago. Then, he knew how to do it too. He remembered this guy training him in how to walk on water. He had explained how to use his chakra better and in the end, he had been the link between Naruto and the legendary perverted hermit. But what to do now? It was true that this guy had almost taught him more than even Kakashi. That's kinda sad, but okay. He may be willing to teach him more. After a little persuasion of course. Honorable grandson, I have finally located you. The man raced over to the two kids and adjusted his glasses as he took in the sight of who exactly his charge was with. Please come with me, it is unbecoming of you to be seen with this trash. Biting his teeth, Naruto almost decided not to even try. Hey don't you ever call Naruto sensei trash, he is going to be my predecessor as Hokage, so why don't you just leave us alone? Hey, sensei. Ebisu looked as if he'd been told a joke. Naruto had had this same reaction from everybody. What could he possibly teach you? He'll certainly never become Hokage, in order to be Hokage you need to be wise and strong, he is neither. Also, you would have to master a thousand jutsu, and he has nothing to teach you there. Come on, honorable grandson, you know my training is the only shortcut to Biko. Shut up. There is one wisdom that Naruto sensei has already taught me, that there's no such thing as a shortcut to strength, and as for jutsu, Konohamaru brought up his hands and in a burst of smoke he became a teenage girl, a naked teenage girl. At this sight Ebisu's jaw dropped, he's turning you into a delinquent, how could you even think of using such a vulgar jutsu? What? Why aren't you beat? The exhausted child exclaimed as he turned back into himself. I'm above such a juvenile jutsu, all it is, is trash, just like that brat who taught it to you. Shadow Clone Jutsu, Ebisu looked up to see an army of orange clones, only about 20 of them, not enough to even laugh at. Hum, I'm an elite Jonin, boy, not some fool like Mizuki. It would take Chunin level skills in everything else, in order for that Jutsu to be anything more than making cannon fodder. Oh yeah, the army began to grin, well get a taste of this, harem Jutsu, and in a puff of smoke the entire street was filled with beauties all of whom swarmed the Jonin with what could look like unrestrained lust. Naturally he was launched into the air by his own noseblood. Zero o octal zero when the elite Jonin woke he was tied and bound to a stool in the ramen stand. It's good that you woke up, said his captor, I beat you, so now, you have to help train me. Naruto couldn't wait to see what he'd learn next. Maybe he could learn how to walk on fire or on air. And why would that mean anything of the sort? Your so-called jutsu was a mere distraction and nothing more. Ebisu quickly sliced through the ropes and was hit by a pot of boiling water. Said pot had been hanging by a rope that was tied into his binds. Leaping up and patting his burned flesh Ebisu growled angrily at the laughing blonde. You little bastard, I will make you suffer. Okay. How about a bet then? The prankster replied, completely ignoring his captive's threat. Never. Where is the honorable grandson? This was directed to Ayame who had just replaced Naruto's empty bowl with a full one. He said not to tell you unless you were gentlemen during your talk. The waitress shrugged her shoulders and put her hands on her hips, and you're not acting very gentlemanlike. Now Ebisu was steaming. Only partly due to the boiled water. No matter, I'll simply go find him myself. The waitress's eyebrow raised and she began to grin in the most creepy way he'd ever seen and I'll inform the Hokage that you were sleeping in one of my booths for the entire afternoon. That got his attention, why was this girl even causing him such trouble? It was obvious she was siding with the demon brat. Regaining his composure, the elite ninja looked down at Naruto. And what are the terms of this bet? Simple, tomorrow I get my sensei and it would be rude of me to seek outside training afterwards. So if I win, you have to agree to train me when I need help. And if you win, after my missions with my team, I will do a free mission for you, doing whatever non-dangerous chores you can think up and you keep all the money earned. And now to sweeten the deal, and I'll stop hanging out with Konohamaru, too. This actually sounded good, and what is the bet? That I can learn and master the tree and water walking skills I saw you use earlier today, by morning. And if I can't do them before I'm assigned my new sensei you win. This was good, there was no way that the brat would be able to master them in one night. But he did have the shadow clone jutsu now, and on the off chance that he figured out its hidden power the Jonin didn't want to be training him in everything. How about, 10 lessons for 10 missions? 
This way he would limit the risk and make the demon brat do more work. Naruto knew what the closet pervert was trying to do, he would teach him ten things that weren't any use at all and say he held up his bargain. Fine, but I get to pick what you teach me, very well, what did you wish to learn? He would be surprised if the boy actually had any ideas about training that were right. He'd probably be asking to learn a flash jutsu or a ramen jutsu. Um, after I can walk on water, I want you to teach me how to walk on fire and on air. He was right, this kid was such an idiot. There was no way he would figure out the shadow clone jutsu's secret. That's too, oh. I wanted to learn an actual taijutsu style that fits me. He didn't say it had to be mastered, and it was actually a reasonable request. It wouldn't be hard for him to teach that, just tell the brat how to punch right and teach him to use defense and call it a flashy name. Then he could let the brat work it out himself. That's three. Naruto thought, was there any other cool thing he remembered? Not the Chidori. He learned that was only Kakashi's. So what else was there? I got it. There's this Hyuga spinning chakra dome thing, the Kaken, Arcaden I think. That one was good, thought Naruto. He could just see Neji's face when he used that jutsu. Ebisu was now interested. If he knew what the boy was talking about, the Kaden, it was a pure chakra based defensive jutsu. He never would have thought the demon child would ask for a defensive jutsu. Besides that, it would be phenomenal with his chakra levels. However, a technique like that required a lot of chakra control. Oh well, if he used the shadow clones right he could teach it to him in a matter of weeks. After the Jonin nodded to him that he understood, Naruto continued. Then, there is this thing that Konohamaru told me to get. It's this um, af. Afrin. Affinity thing. I want you to teach me that. Well, he was a little of proud that Konohamaru remembered his explanation of the elemental chakra. Yet, that was actually going to need a lot of work, depending on his affinity. First, I'm uncertain what you're asking for. Each person has their own affinity, and it is one of five elements, earth, wind, fire, water, and lightning. They each require their own type of chakra molding. If I understand, I believe you are asking me to identify your affinity and teach you that form of molding your elemental chakra, correct? Um, kinda, but I want you to teach me the advanced molding for it, not just the basic stuff. That way I can add it to my own jutsu. Well, he could give him the basics and let him work on those for a few months. And the thought of this kid making jutsu sounded pretty far-fetched, until he remembered the harem jutsu. Very well, and the others, well, hey, you know how you said there were five of them? He didn't like the sound of this, yes. I want a jutsu from each of the other elements that aren't my affinity. They also have to be ones that only get more powerful with more chakra so I don't waste chakra using them. That, was actually a good request. To think, the idiotic Gaki had thought of his large chakra on the spot like this. Now the Jonin was getting worried. That will be acceptable. He could give him some simple C-rank jutsu, maybe modifying one or two others down, but it was very doable. But the elite Jonin was beginning to think Naruto wasn't as dumb as he acted. And that might mean he would actually have to teach him this stuff. Okay, so what is the last one? Um, this one isn't a jutsu or skill so much as, well, in class they never explained some things and I wanted to, um. Great, if the demon wanted him to have that talk, then the bet was off. I need you to teach me how to get and take care of ninja supplies. All the shops kick me out and I don't even know where to find a bingo book, or how to make explosive tags or sealing scrolls. He should have known. This was stuff he was already teaching Konohamaru anyway. How the kid had missed that during class was absurd. Win or lose, I might go ahead and show you where to get your supplies. The Hokage will also want to know that one of his shinobi is being harassed by the shopkeepers this way. As soon as he said those words the boy's eyes widened and filled tears. Ebisu was a little surprised at this reaction. On the one hand, he didn't mind what they were doing, but if the Hokage found out he knew and hadn't done anything, he would be in as hot of water as the others. This was simply a matter of doing his necessary duty as a janin. Yet, to the boys sitting before him, it was as if he had done something extraordinary. Was simply informing the Hokage of misconduct such a great thing to the boy? With all of the details worked out they agreed to meet at the academy an hour before it would open, and Naruto jumped up with a declaration of determination and raced to the nearest training ground. Ebisu was about to use a shadow clone to watch him when the waitress handed him something. Zero O Octal Zero Naruto couldn't help but laugh when he heard the scream. Twenty-seven bowls. 
how could anyone eat that much? Zero o oh, till zero that night Naruto worked off all of those bowls of ramen. He had already known how to mold chakra to his feet, as he had done it in his future past. However, getting it down again took some effort. It was a lot easier than he remembered it. Still, it took most of the night before he was able to stand on water. The tree walking had taken hours, unlike the week it took the first time. And it only took a little more than one hour to stand on the water. Now he had to master them. He knew he could to some other cooler forms of water walking. Somehow he had managed to race on the water using the water walking skill to flash around. It was like he was sliding on ice. By the time the sun rolled up, it was mastered. And so, he arrived at the academy training ground two hours before class would start, and waited for his new sensei. Zero o octal zero Ebisu was dumbfounded. He had left a shadow clone to watch Naruto's progress and see if he used the shadow clone jutsu or got any help, but instead what he saw was pure effort and hard work. Ebisu remembered what Konohamaru had said, there is one wisdom Naruto sensei has taught me, and that is that there's no such thing as a shortcut to strength. Now watching the great advances Naruto made so quickly, he realized that Naruto had actually believed that. It also brought to his mind how poor he was at everything, yet with just a brief description of the skill, he had done this. Once he had figured it out, it only took him extra time, to not only master it, but to advance past normal water walking. And to the racing he had invented. Even if Ebisu's own clone attempted to do it, and mastered it on the first try, for a kid fresh out of the academy to come up with it and master it in only half an hour it was hard to believe. It was almost as hard as that same kid learning to apply the chakra walking skill so perfectly in only one night. So after the demonstration, Ebisu resigned himself to teaching the boy more. Of course, if last night was anything, it wouldn't take as long as he thought. However. Look, Naruto, some of what you ask for simply can't be taught. The Kaiden is a clan jutsu that isn't available and fire and air walking are impossible. The blonde child he was explaining it to was sitting on the ground arms crossed and facing away from him. Liar. You're just trying to get out of it, he shouted. Even if you don't know the jutsu, you have to find out how to do it and teach it to Naruto sensei, Konohamaru added. You made a deal, and if you even try to back out of it I'll tell grandpa that you have been teaching me not to keep my word. Unbelievable. I one of the elite jonin of this village, am getting coursed into the impossible by a couple of children. Finally Ebisu agreed to look into the jutsu and try to find a way to teach it, but only after explaining that it would take time to develop it. That's okay, in the meantime you can teach me the things you do know, but I'd like to get it down before I take my first chunin exam. At least they were reasonable about the timetables, he had at least two years before the boy would be taking those exams. That was plenty of time. Besides that if he did develop those jutsu it would be invaluable to the village. Zero o oh octal zero after the class let out for lunch, Naruto walked over to see Sakura, he hadn't said anything to her since graduation. Most of the students had been shocked that he was there and even more than last time, maybe because he had been so quiet this time. Some of them actually got worried when he didn't even react to the team he was on. He overheard Ino and Sakura whispering to each other that they had been expecting him to leap for joy and when he hadn't many of the students had just stared at him until the next name was called. To him though, it was just more proof that this was all real, and he could remember the future. As Naruto approached he saw his pink-haired crush getting turned away by Sasuke, again. He also remembered her words from last time this happened, oddly he couldn't remember if she had been speaking to him or Sasuke when she said them. Thinking hard about it he remembered it was him, but there was something off. He was about to figure it out, when she turned around. Sakura was crying, she sat on the bench and buried her face in her hands. But Naruto didn't see it. What he saw was a slightly older Sakura who was also crying, and begging. Begging him to bring Sasuke back. Then he remembered. He hadn't just gotten all these memories. He had died, and he knew exactly how he died. Sasuke had killed him. Rushing off, he didn't see Sakura notice him, or how she had started to wave. Naruto ran to a ledge on a window just where he remembered Sasuke being. Sasuke didn't even notice him until a foot glued to the Uchiha's shirt and the attached leg swung out, flinging him down onto the street. Naruto was down too, and on him faster than he could even see. The vengeful orange blur tore into his old rival literally. His fists broke flesh, his fingers grew claws, and his claws shredded the Uchiha's skin through his clothes. He was a beast for these few moments, unthinking, and enraged. 
The only thing the beast's ears held were the sounds of chirping birds and a waterfall. Zero o octal zero neither of them had realized that they were being watched. Kiba was walking down the street and turned back around to see it, he had been walking Akamaru before meeting his team, and this Naruto was feral. He almost wanted to just keep on going and head around the fight, but didn't want to draw the beastly boy's attention. Team 10 also saw it. They were on the balcony across the street so Ino could gaze dreamily at Sasuke as she ate. Shikamaru had seen Naruto first and realized what was coming and when Ino saw her love get flung into the street, he and Shoji held her back. Zero o octal zero the beating was ruthless and thorough. Naruto had trounced Sasuke severely, starting with bouncing him off the pavement when he threw him down and continuing to how his fingers gashed Sasuke's skin and his fists and knees and other parts he could use, continued to bounce off of every bit of Sasuke's flesh. Sasuke couldn't fight back or even defend himself, he tried to cover one area only to have all the others hit, and his arms were also on the target list. By the time it was over Sasuke was on the edge of conciseness, hanging limply from Naruto's grasp. While Sasuke had no broken bones there wasn't any unbroken or unbruised skin on his body. Deep down Naruto felt the satisfaction of avenging himself. But he knew that this Sasuke wasn't the same one who had killed him, and this beating had to serve another purpose. If you're going to be on a team together with me, you're going to lose the attitude Sasuke. You aren't invincible, nor are you powerful. If you ever want to make your brother pay for his crimes, being an arrogant ass won't help. You won't ever be strong enough to finish him off without the team that the Leaf Village gave you. And if you ever put that team in danger for your own stupid revenge, here he let out an evil intent bad enough that Sasuke knew he would die here, bad enough that the Watchers all fell away and cowered. I'll kill you, having said what he thought was enough, Naruto dropped Sasuke onto the street and walked away. Leaving Sasuke to pass out, his last thoughts being, what is Naruto? Naruto was ready to make this work. He'd make Team 7 work this time. And while the Genin didn't think he would ever forgive Sasuke for what he had done, this wasn't that Sasuke. He wasn't dead. He still had his life, even after what happened between them at the Valley of the Ends. Zero o octal zero Sakura couldn't believe Kiba's claims that Naruto had beaten Sasuke, especially that badly. So when Ino also confirmed it, she was shocked. But the girl seemed completely shaken from the admission. Naruto, the dead last, the loser, had somehow beaten Sasuke into a bloody pulp. And if Ino said it, then he must have, because there was no way she would make up a story like that about Sasuke. And after the other teams had left, when she tried to yell at him for it, he ignored her. Slamming her fist into his head ended with her fist stuck in a metal desk. And she was stuck there until their sensei arrived two hours later. Only two? That was different, he had been four hours late the first time they waited on him. Meeting him on the roof, their Jonin told them they would do introductions and a test of some sort at training ground 7 the next morning. Since Sasuke wasn't here, someone would have to tell him. Immediately Sakura jumped up volunteering with a joyous screech. She would go to the hospital and feed him a nice peeled apple, at the instructions of her new sensei, and then tell him where they would meet up the next day. Maybe she could even convince him to walk there with her. Leaving the academy, Naruto went in search of Ebisu, who had told him to find him at the Circle of Pillars after his team activities were over. Naruto hoped the closet pervert hadn't thought he'd be out very soon, or at least brought something to do while he waited. It wasn't like Naruto could have just told him who his sensei was going to be, and unfortunately for the Jonin, he couldn't think of another excuse to let the man know how long it would take. At least this time his sensei had only been two hours late, instead of the four they had waited last time. Naruto still wasn't sure why he had been early. It was shocking. The thoughtful Genin soon found his temporary sensei, ironically, in the training ground right behind Team 7's own. It took about 10 minutes of running to get across training ground 7, and into number 17. The Genin having no idea where the circle of pillars was, had needed to use one of his few emergency resources. One sexy jutsu later, he had gotten a full map of Konoha from the academy geography teacher's office. Not that geography was the only thing the guy taught, he also taught history of the five, and international politics, but Naruto had never really participated in those classes. As he entered training ground 17, he passed a row of towering training posts. The line of them went all the way around the training ground. Must be how it got its nickname. The vessel thought. Each post seemed to get taller heading east, but shorter heading west. 
as the genin continued inwards he could see where they became normal sized and began getting taller again heading north. The whole training ground was about 5 kilometers across. Inside the circle was a mixture of lands. The far side had a massive curving stone wall, just inside the circle. Probably so anyone who fell from the highest posts could catch themselves on it. It covered about a third of the way around the circle. Coming inwards was various trees and a small lake fed by a rapidly flowing river, which passed right through the grounds in an outward curve. The tree line stopped at the far side of the river. On this side of the river was its beach. Further inwards, in the center of the grounds, was a massive stone column going up as high as Naruto could see. How he wasn't able to see it from training ground 7 was impossible. Except that it seemed to become more and more visible as he got closer, like if it was hidden by Genjutsu or something the farther out you got from it. It was huge, at least a kilometer wide, and encircled by a ravine that went about 6 meters deep and 10 wide, all the way around. Around that was a stone path, flat and wide. Almost like a track, it even had a few obstacles Naruto could see as it started to curve around the other side of the stone center. To the east, was a pile of rocks that rose out of the lakeside and climbed all the way up to the top of the wall, before curving and steeply cascading down. On the near side of the rock pile was large uneven chunks of grassy land, which changed into the grassy plain he was on at the entrance. To the west side from the entrance was a flat packed dirt training area with ten more training posts near that area's center. Each of these, while normal in height, had different thicknesses and a rounded top. One, the thinnest, even came to a point. This was where Ebisu waited. Just beyond that, was the river's exit out of the training grounds, where the tree line started, and the trees increased in size as they grew closer into the forest at the wall. He couldn't see where the river came in, the genin decided it must be around the other side of the stone tower. After a brief greeting, which was more respectful than the demon container had expected, the closet pervert told him he hadn't expected him to find this place right after. So he had occupied himself while waiting. In truth he'd been intentionally vague about where it was so he could have time to prepare, both while the boy was in class and while he was searching. It wasn't like it took me that long to find you. Sensei was late for our introduction. Seeing the disbelieving look on the stuck-up adult's face, Naruto switched the comment from a complaint to something more believable. Ebisu had said he looked up to his perverted sensei right? Yeah. I got Kakashi the copy ninja, as my sensei. He was probably on some secret mission for the Hokage and that's why he was late, not that he gave us a reason. The Jonin coughed and adjusted his glasses at that, looking to Naruto with a reproachful glare. Yes, well, a Jonin of his caliber has no need to tell Jenin anything. One can only wonder how you got him for a sensei. Naruto replied with much less enthusiasm, that's easy, I'm the dead last and they always put the dead last with the rookie of the year. And the only one in the village who can teach Sasuke Teme how to use a Sharingan is Kakashi, duh. I coulda told you that. Ignoring complaints the boy had about his superior teammate, Ebisu re-evaluated his time frame. With the knowledge that the Naruto would be training under the copycat ninja, alongside the Uchiha genius, Ebisu decided that the little orange genin was going to need a lot of his problems fixed immediately if he was going to even keep up. Firstly, with the team the boy was on, their sensei was likely to focus on the clan air, and leave the other two to their own training. However, Naruto's basics being so, so poor, they would hold the whole team back unless the genin himself was able to correct them. There was little hope for that. Assisting the pariah turned out to be vastly more important to the village's reputation than the janin had ever considered feasible. The team he'd been placed on would need to be sent on higher rank missions sooner rather than later if for no other reason than to let the village brag about having an active Uchiha in the ranks. It was also likely that the Chunin exam deadline he had established would now be moved forward to sometime in the next year. It would be either this coming exam or the next. He couldn't possibly hold to his bet with the boy in that short amount of time. The only thing he could do about it for the moment was to see how far he had to go with what he had to work with. And so, his first task was to get an idea of what the boy was already capable of. In order to begin, I need to know the full extent of your abilities or lack thereof. So you need to tell me everything you can do that you think in any possible way could help with your being a ninja. And be honest about it, the more I know about your abilities, the more precise my own training schedule for you can be. The list was short and only included what he learned at the academy, which was incredibly less than he should have learned, and the shadow clone jutsu. It wouldn't be enough. 
How the boy was able to learn water walking when he couldn't even float a leaf was confounding. Besides that, all the boy's basic abilities such as rope escape, substitution, general kenjutsu and for lack of better classification, intelligence, were all lacking. What had the instructors been teaching? While the man could understand their bias toward the beast, there was no way they could have possibly held the boy back this far without endangering the other students. So Ebisu decided, against his better judgment, that he needed to reveal the secret of shadow clones. Once the boy had a grasp on retaining the feedback, the agonized Jonin could start him on an education spree disguised as training. After he had ensured the boy had the basics of shinobi theory and rules, he would give the boy a break from the mental strain and work with him on his atrocious taijutsu. Uzumaki-san, there is an aspect of the jutsu you acquired that as yet seems to still elude you. The boy looked at him in confusion. What do you mean? The clones work great. They're not sick or weak or stupid looking or anything. Brat just listen to me. The shadow clone, while meant to be a solid, was not created for battle or labor as you have been applying them. Looking the boy in the eye, the trusted educator for the honorable grandson braced himself for what was likely to be an extended lecture. When the clone is created, it is a shell of chakra that extends inwards based on the quality of the construct. However this shell is empty and hollow. By itself the shell can't be sustained for more than a few moments, and furthermore it can't move or perform any autonomo or independent functions. The Jonin hastily dumbed down his words at the easily confused expression his unwelcome student displayed. It's like an eggshell without the egg inside it, if you only have the shell, it's there, but you can't cook breakfast. And the understanding set in. There was a reason he was chosen to teach the third's heir. Now, in order to use the clone, you must fill in the egg. You fill the shell with your own chakra, thus it requires vastly more chakra than a normal clone. This chakra is what sustains the clone and gives it its intelligence, allowing it to move on its own. The boy was nodding his his head almost exactly like Konohamaru had when he explained the jutsu to the younger boy. The younger child had been begging to know what it was, and to ensure the boy understood the dangers of attempting it, Ebisu gladly gave him a full explanation. Only finishing, when he was certain the boy had a firm grasp on the amount of chakra he would need to build up if he wanted to use it. Seeing the similarities between their enthusiastic learning expressions gave the Jonin a bad taste at the back of his throat. The blonde clearly understood what he was being told, even if it had required dumbing down. The Jonin had his students' full attention. And there were no pranks, no misbehavior, or distractions. Clearly the boy wanted to learn. It was as he had begun to suspect. The boy's reported behavioral problems in class stemmed solely from the treatment he received at the academy. Privately Ebisu allowed his mind to picture what they boy could have become if he had been the one teaching the container from the start. When the clone's shell is disrupted, from either chakra or a physical blow, the shell will dissolve. At the same time, the chakra that had filled it will return to the clone's creator, as in you. When you receive the chakra from the clone you will also receive all the information it carried with it. Meaning, you will remember everything that the clone experienced. Naruto was clearly surprised. I had considered the possibility that you knew, after Konohamaru told me about your training the other day. To say he'd been shocked was a little short, once he had agreed and sent the boy off to class, he wanted to immediately request an audience with the third himself on the matter, however he still had to relieve himself of his own untamable ward. It was as he was debating the avenues of care for the boy to be placed with, that the honorable grandson begged to know what the jutsu was. Explaining as he did, how he had found Naruto sensei using over a dozen of them in his training. Which was cause for question. If the fox vessel did know the secret, then why hadn't he used it during the bet? If you didn't know you were receiving memories, then why did you have your clones training too? Well it was mostly to figure out how to do it and once they got that down I either saw how they did it or they told me. It just meant I could try more ways faster. In actuality it had been because once one of them remembered something they could tell him and if he thought about it for a moment he would remember it too. Naruto had recalled many of the minor improvements he'd made in his training over the last year that way. But he could still only vaguely recall his future life. Alright Naruto, we should start by getting you accustomed to, reading the feedback, as it is called. First I'm going to have you create a clone and I'm going to work with the clone on a new jutsu. Hey, this better not be a trick to get out of your 10 lessons. Naruto wasn't sure anyone would be willing to teach him something not on the list. Never you mind that, boy. This is a variant of the shadow clone. So really, 
I'm only assisting you in your chakra control, which I might add will need to be mastered far, far more if you wish to have any hope of completing the whole ten lessons. Besides that, the jutsu I have in mind does in fact, fall under a section of lesson number ten. Well, you still got a lot more than a single jutsu to teach for that one. The genin was a little shocked. Ebisu was actually planning out a fair deal to him. The man he remembered hated him. Maybe it was the bet, or could Ebisu actually be that good a teacher that his pride as a teacher wouldn't let him simply half-ass it? That explained why the old man hired him anyway. We will get to that, yes. But for now, create your clone and then I want you to run from here to the memorial stone and then back to the line of training posts you passed to get here. You will circle the posts on the outside until your clone dispels, and then come back to perform the jutsu. I will not be telling the original you any part of the jutsu so that you will need to recall only what your clone has learned. If you can't perform the jutsu then I will instruct you to make a new clone and restart your running. After making the clone, the real brat took off at a speed the Janin could only assume was as fast as the Genin was able, reminding Ebisu that he needed to teach the boy how to set a pace when running. Looking to his cloned student, the special Janin began explaining how to perform the shadow clone projectile jutsu. The boy quickly understood the concept of casting his shadow clone onto something other than himself and was easily able to pick up making the shadow clone of a rock in his palm. But when it came to throwing the rock and cloning it at the same time, the Genin was unable to do so. Deciding that it was good enough for his purposes the Janin struck the Genin with a very painful nerve strike. If the feedback from that didn't catch the brat's attention then this method of teaching him wouldn't be possible. The Janin had considered numerous times in the last half hour about why the boy wasn't able to receive the memories, and it occurred to him that it may have been the sheer mass of chakra the boy had. Which meant if the original wasn't actively watching for it, then it would have to take a sizable shock to bring the memories to the surface. Zero o octal zero it took Naruto another ten minutes to arrive after he received the memories of the shadow clone. His path around training ground seventeen was not a very short one. He had only gone around once since he started. It had to be at least twenty kilometers. As he ran he watched the posts get taller, and once he hit the wall he found that they were no longer spaced evenly, there were even some that were posted in the ground farther out so that if you were hopping, as Naruto assumed they were used for, then you would have to turn. This continued and even got worse as he passed the end of the wall. Soon they began to slant at angles as well. As they became shorter, some of them even started to sway in the breeze. These were made of entirely different types of wood so that the sway could be measured. Once the posts became low enough that he could see their tops, the running genin saw that unlike they had been when starting at the ten training posts, the tops of these ones were no longer flat, they had rounded or angled or even bristled tops. He was almost back to the entrance when he felt it, like someone blowing air into his ears, or a really big sneeze that built up and up but never came. It wasn't unlike his own lost memories of the future. He could see both what he was doing now and what he remembered doing then. The Jutsu Ebisu taught him was able to make a copy of his tools or whatever else he had in his hands and he also felt the phantom shadow of a really bad pain in his chest, just at the shoulder. Arriving at the ten posts, Naruto paused to catch his breath and in a few short breaths he had it back. Hey I think I remembered it on the first try. We'll see, on another topic, when running for long distances, it is not beneficial to push yourself to your top speed from the very start. The Janin was clearly irritated at him, eh? But that wasn't anywhere near my top speed. I can run loads faster if I want to. Given the tales he'd heard about the boy evading the Anbu, the special Janin wasn't sure if that was merely an empty boast or if it had merit. However, his last, boast, had been the topic of their bet and that had ended so wonderfully, hadn't it? With a heavy sigh, the Janin explained. The track around this training ground is roughly 16 kilometers long. The average civilian would take two hours to run that, if they were able to keep going for the entire length. Not at all likely. The average academy graduate can usually do it in only an hour at a moderated pace. You failed at taijutsu and are reported by the instructor to have the worst physical conditioning out of your peers. You may be faster on your feet, but the goal of long distance running isn't speed outright, it is speed over time. Meaning that if you need a break to catch your breath, then you are pushing too hard, and need to slow your pace. Having to stop when being pursued is one of the first weaknesses of a protection detail. Which is why most of the royal or wealthy clients will ride shoulder carts when being escorted. Four Chunin can carry one of those, with a passenger inside it, 
over 10 times the speed that a civilian with no regular exercise could possibly run, and still not need to stop for breaks any more than usual. When training by running long distances, the goal is to build up that. Endurance is the key. Naruto was almost shocked at the thoroughness of his explanation of long distance running. Once more the closet perv was outdoing his future memory's expectations. As part of teaching you a taijutsu style, I will require you to perform physical exercise as I assign it. The first thing I will be assigning, starts tomorrow. From now on, every morning, you are going to run that track once before you eat breakfast. And you will not run at your full speed, you need to pace yourself. Run at about three-fourths of your fastest speed. When you can easily finish the track in half an hour at that, without the need to catch your breath afterwards, then start running it twice. Anyo. Why are you going so far for a bet? I mean, you're teaching me a jutsu that wasn't part of the deal and you're making sure I know things and explaining why, and. The look on the boy's face as he asked the question was almost as pitiful as the question itself. Ebisu really had a hard time not seeing the honorable child he was already hired to train, reflected in his newest student. Had no one ever explained things to the kid? Naruto, when we made that bet, I agreed to take you as my student. Even if it is only for something as trivial as a bet, I don't take that lightly. That is why I was entrusted with the Hokage's own heir. The child of his deceased firstborn son. And while I only agreed to ten lessons, those lessons have some very specific requirements. Many of which I simply can't meet if I am teaching you as you are now. Thusly, I must teach you from where you are now, until you reach the point in which I will be able to complete each lesson. I understand that some may not have held teaching as a standard to be lifted, but I did not get to where I am through taking the easy route. It was only a little scarring, but the Jonin opened up a lecture he had planned on giving his own team, when he taught one. He had prepared it long in advance, back when he was still a member of his Genin squad. Hard work is something my sensei drilled into each of his students, and is the only true shortcut to strength. But hard work isn't just about training your body, it is about putting all of your effort behind everything you do. It is much like how a child will put everything they are into to what they are doing, from playing at the playgrounds, to throwing a tantrum, from being happy to being sad. The youngest children have yet to learn how to hold back their efforts and become lazy or content. They will always try their hardest and cry their hardest when the time calls for it. True hard work is when you can try your hardest at everything in the way those children do. To be fully invested in every aspect of your life and community. That is, the Jonin had to give a wry grin, as his teammates' words found their way out of his mouth. The power of youth. Naruto looked at his temporary sensei as if he had grown a second head. The Jonin, which he had gained some respect for as a teacher, was now spouting that same youth crap as bushy brows and super bushy brows. What the hell was going on? He wasn't one of them in the future the Genin could remember. Seeing the boy's strong reaction Ebisu could only assume the Genin had met or at least seen his teammate before. Feeling one's eye twitch wasn't that uncommon for those who knew made a guy. First in irritation at him, then in despair at his continued behavior, and most pleasantly in laughter at the reaction of others who were just meeting the man. Allowing himself to have an amused smile, the Genin explained to Naruto exactly how he knew that man in green tights. Once the boy was calmed down he continued his educating. Explaining how the jutsu he had taught Naruto was both part of the tenth lesson he'd asked for, to maintain his kanai by not having to use them a projectiles, and how it related to the chakra control refinements he needed before being able to move on. He also informed the genin that he would be teaching him another variant of the shadow clone. When the boy gained a suspicious look, Ebisu stated in no uncertain terms that he would only teach him the variant once he had been officially enlisted into the Chunin selection exam. He would be teaching him the explosive variant of both, explosive clone and explosive projectile clone. Neither of them would be one of the four jutsu he had agreed to teach either because he already had an idea of which jutsu he wanted to teach the boy. Zero O Octal Zero The Explosive Clone. That was way cooler than anything Naruto had ever learned. Even from what he learned in his last life well as far as he could remember. There was something about a balloon and a toad, but for the life of him, the vessel just couldn't figure out what putting a toad inside a balloon had to do with anything. Other than that it was something the toad hermit had taught him, and he taught the fourth, so it had to have been something cool. Meh, he'd remember it eventually. So he moved on, and listened to the man explaining things to him. Ebisu continued to tell him why he was willing to teach Naruto yet another extra jutsu, and the answer was advertising. 
Because the exam was so public and had so many spectators from all over the five nations and their surrounding smaller states, it became an important resource to the village. The showing there had to be of quality. The better they performed, the more people would hire them. And that meant everything. Shinobi were paid to exist by the daimyo. But that was only really for a few elite, which were meant to be his personal guard. The village on the other hand was funded by clients, they paid for a mission. A tax went to the daimyo and a tax went to the village funds, and the rest was paid almost directly to the shinobi who performed them. Based on the amount of taxes the daimyo received, he may pay more or less to fund the village. The mission tax and the daimyo's funding were what allowed them to operate. By funding the academy, and paying village's own required missions, at cost to the village itself. This included routine patrols and gate duty. As well as the T&I department. It also funded a percentage towards stipends such as the Orphans Fund created after the event 12 years ago, and for retired or wounded shinobi who needed to be supplemented until the village could place them in another profession. Most of the injured ones were either mended and sent back out, or an agent in the village found them new jobs. Most of the oldest or more capable injured were put in the Anbu Training Corps, as anyone good enough to train them and not injured would be in the field. The daimyo himself could also order a mission, and paid very highly for it to be completed. If however, he thought it would be done better by someone else, then he was more than allowed to hire others. And so, with almost all of their prospective clientele in attendance, their good performances were a must. Therefore any team not ready to excel would be held back from the exams. Of course, the exams were not the only way to become a chunin. While there was an exam every six months, only about half the chunin in the village were promoted by exam. Many were promoted either for excellent work that almost demanded it, or during field command. Others, while not excelling at any one thing completed a spectrum of Chunin level training courses. As it worked out, with the Chunin selection exams you were promoted on your performance in the areas a shinobi worked at. Most of the time it only required higher genin level skills, and the right mindset. In a field promotion or rewarded promotion, it was based on infield actions that may or may not be entirely about not panicking or good judgment. The spectrum promotion wasn't like that. While the others required you to have the mindset and maybe passable Chunin skills in only a few areas, the spectrum promotion required you to have fully Chunin level skills in almost all aspects while reaching to have passable Jonin level skills in a few. The Jonin exam was the exact opposite of that, where you were promoted mainly by spectrum in an exam, and only rarely by other means. These were Tokabetsu Jonin. Ebisu was one of those promoted by other means and he only personally knew a few others promoted like him including his teammate Genma and that woman. But there were around a dozen or so in the village. 0 o octal 0 Once the Jonin had explained to Naruto how the exam really worked, he set the boy to working on the jutsu he'd given him. Intentionally neglecting to tell the boy how much more important it was for his teammate to take the public exam for the publicity. Ebisu knew for almost certain that the village council would be pushing for the Hokage to order the Uchiha into the exam and that meant Hitaki would know too, and would focus on his main student. Thanks to a certain acquaintance of his, Ebisu also knew that Naruto's own performance could jeopardize the chance of the Uchiha passing either of the first two stages. The Hokage wouldn't officially arrange the exams for a few months, but the next one was scheduled to be held here. He only learned that they were planning so early because that contact had been recruited already. It was whispered that the whole thing was supposed to be rigged so that the Uchiha would make it to the finals. But Ebisu couldn't believe that was possible now that he knew who else was on the boys' team. His acquaintance had told him what she'd heard about the first exam, and even asked for some ideas on the second. Thinking about it now, the Jonin decided to make a few extra suggestions. After a few tries, the blonde had created a shadow clone rock in his palm. While it wasn't ready to be field tested, it did display the memory recall he had desired. Having served its purpose, there was no longer any reason to work on it at the moment. The child had it down enough so that he could practice on his own. It was time to catch the boy up. On everything. Having Naruto make several shadow clones, Ebisu did the same. Each of his clones took one or two of Naruto's. Heading out into the training ground to find each of them their own spot to sit and discuss the nature of being a shinobi. Each group would cover it all, and each location would help the different clones to form different thoughts and ask different questions. This was even more so for the clones who had more than one student, each clone would ask a question the other hadn't thought of and that would cause that one to think of even more. He had a basic outline written out for not each clone, but each location in the training ground, 
with examples to pick from and illustrations already placed at the chosen spot. As he had planned the clones learned all of the basics at least three times over before they dispersed. In most, it began with him explaining how chakra works, the parts of spirit and the parts of physical energy, as well as a brief explanation of the natural chakra around them. From there it would go in only a few directions, one being the need for the body and mind to be balanced, or how important it is to use them both and ensure a proper exercise is achieved for them. Another was pointed into how chakra was used, from the way it was shaped, to how verbal commands and hand seals influenced the efficiency of it, how they were not necessary and in order to become a janin there were even a set of jutsu that must be performed without them called the frequently flying five. He explained how chakra was formed in the body and how it was used in jutsu, how it could be added to tools, or even made into sealed tags and scrolls. He explained the difference between shape and elemental jutsu. And the difference between basic elemental manipulation that was practiced with the first five forms of leaf and palm exercises and the advanced elemental manipulation, which were trained in the usage of extreme variations of the first five forms or by using certain jutsu, the advanced affinity few. These were required to actually convert your chakra into the element of choice. The Janin explained how each element was a counterpart or complement to another. He explained the weaknesses of each and the most likely ways they were to be used. Naruto himself, and his various clones had all remembered this conversation from last time while they were eating, but this time it was much more. Many more details and little explanations for why one thing does this and another thing does that. And when one of the genin had a question, instead of brushing it off or giving a half-assed answer, he changed his entire lesson over to an explanation to cover his query. And each of them had pictures or examples, they used what Naruto asked to further the topic, and even asked the boy questions for him to answer basing the next explanation on his own words or example so that he could understand it in his own way. He moved on to how jutsu, shinobi and missions were all ranked. During this section the janin explained the commonly grouped jutsu, starting with the academy 3, all of which were normally required before graduation. The chakra control collection, which several other clones had covered even during the last section of the lectures. He explained the essential 8 and the traveling 10, an assortment of jutsu taught to all fresh chunin, and usually picked up by most of the older genin. The essential eight included rope escape, self-explanatory, detail detecting, which allowed a shinobi to use their chakra in a way to help them augment their observational skills and memorize details more effectively. It wasn't as effective as sensory enhancement but still improved their abilities vastly. Silent footstep with the complementing genjutsu stepping in secret, this was a skill for silent walking and the genjutsu silenced the sounds you made, emphasizing how the art of deception and stealth was the main core foundation of being a shinobi. Sealed tag activation, genjutsu release, and wire use all minor skills that most learned in the academy or shortly after making genin. The map of killing strikes, which was simply basic anatomy, and finally, the shunshin, a jutsu that allowed you to move instantaneously for a short distance. All except the last one were normally learned as genin, and Ebisu had it on good authority that the Uchiha had already learned them. While Naruto thought back and recognized some of them from Sasuke Tami's arsenal. Continuing on, the Janin explained that these were some of the things Naruto would need to learn soon. And if he hadn't learned them in a month or so, Ebisu said he may even give Naruto the instructions of some of them. The traveling ten however, were a jumble of D-rank jutsu that most genin could use to simply make life easier while taught immediately after promotion they were essentially unnecessary. He covered the advanced affinity few and again some of his clones had been over this already, they were specific jutsu taught to enhance the advanced affinity elemental training. The frequently flying five, also covered previously as the five bullet jutsu, requiring three of the five to be performed sealessly to make janin. The major miscellaneous, composed of ten jutsu, two from each element, which were the first major jutsu taught to those who had each elements. Then he covered the specific career paths of shinobi, from frontline fighters to medical nin and genjutsu specialists, learning the major misc, medical musts, or instrumental illusions respectively. Tracker nin who evolve into hunter nin only after learning the hunter nin have to haves. He explained the anbu, the T and I department, and what they really are, and the village council, as well as the once used military police. He even went into the various clans and why and how they became parts of the village covering all their basic information and their most commonly known customs. Each of his clones covered all of these topics, 
while some focused on one or another with more effort, each topic was covered entirely when added together. It may not have been the full academy education, but Ebisu prided himself in how he had stripped out only the most useful and essential information about being a genin. There was no way he would have covered it all, but he had planned on only covering chakra and its uses for today's lecture. The Janin was more than surprised when, at the end of the lecture, he discovered that his clones had managed to move on to the jutsu groups and even into the career paths and village clans. He had planned to cover those topics later on, and still needed to cover international diplomacy for missions out of the village, a brief course on the geography of the world and internal laws and structure of the village. But from what he'd seen today, he was certain if the clone method worked he'd be able to cover all of those in only one or two more lessons. It appeared the genin soaked all of it up like a sponge. While he would enjoy stroking his ego with this, the fact he'd taught the village dunce how to understand it all, Ebisu knew full and well that the boy had been more than able to understand the concepts on his own. In the time the clones had been learning, the originals were having a different lecture, this one was entirely based on the benefits of meditation and calm. How being level-headed and focused improved every aspect of his training. Ebisu explained at length the various methods for meditation, calming the mind and achieving focus. Near the end of the lecture he had Naruto perform each method he explained in turn. During this time, he also gave the boy a much more detailed lesson about the chakra control collection, leaf floating, tree walking, water walking, chakra sensory and sensory enhancements, and finally the chakra submersion meditation, in which you allowed your chakra to flow through the environment around you and feel its existence. This was usually done under a waterfall, but could also be done on other types of elements. While he hadn't actually taught the boy how to do it, it would come. And sooner rather than later. When it was finally time to finish the discussions, the clones all prepared. Ebisu had Naruto sit on one of the thicker training posts and take himself into the deepest meditation he'd achieved thus far. One by one the genin clones dispelled, pausing for several minutes between each to allow the boy to accept the memories before moving on. Ebisu's own would dispel later when he himself could meditate. As he watched the boy absorbing the memories he saw the mixtures of emotion and apprehension, understanding and excitement. The boy displayed a vast array of strong emotions which told the Janin stories after stories of what the boy had been through in his childhood. When finished, Ebisu instructed Naruto to go over his memories and meditate on them. Then accepted his own clones, in the same way his student had. Each memory of each discussion was like a needle in his mind, and a tug on his heart. The boy had learned so much more than planned and was so focused on learning that Ebisu's small remaining prejudices towards the boy dissolved in his admiration of the perfect student. He could barely understand how the academy could have held the boy back so much. And he was beginning to suspect that the boy, while far more intelligent than expected, was illiterate. It was obvious he had trouble reading some of the illustrations the Janin had included. But the way the boy quickly figured out each word he didn't know solely based on context shamed the village educational system to its core. Zero o octal zero as time passed, hunger set in. Standing from their places on the training posts, the two shinobi headed out to the next training ground out. Number 7. Taking out a bento ebisu had prepared, they ate near the memorial stone. The janin had also thought of a lecture to cover proper eating, but when the boy's first bites were the vegetables, he found himself asking about the boy's diet directly. At first it hadn't always been ramen, when the hokage first gave him his apartment, Naruto had bought many other foods. But the meats always had little worms inside them and the worms made him sick when he ate them. The boy had assumed it was the worms because he'd eaten other meats before and they never made him sick. His veggies on the other hand always made him dizzy. It might have been because he didn't cook it right. The ones old man Tucci put in his ramen were good. The hungry teen always felt more awake after eating there. He only bought milk once a month because if he bought more than the one it would make him need to use the bathroom too often. Now, he mostly just stuck with cup ramen. It was cheap, and he didn't get sick eating it. Ebisu had been convinced. He would be taking over the boys shopping until the Hokage fixed this too. It was no small wonder how Naruto had survived this long. Deciding not to go into his discussion over food, it wasn't as if the boy had had much choice in his eating habits. Ebisu instead pointed to the stone they ate it, and asked if Naruto knew what that was. Naruto looked back at it, and memories of his time on Team 7 flared to life. Yeah, it's the hero's stone. The memorial that helps us remember all of those lost in the line of duty to the village. The genin briefly wondered if he would have been added to it after he died at the Valley of the Ends. 
Naruto's reply was a solemn one, but Ebisu hadn't expected him to know. Then, seeing the look of remorse on the boy's face, the elder shinobi had to wonder how many times the boy had looked on it, hoping to see a name, something that would give him a family, while at the same time hoping not to find anything because it meant he could still find his parents alive. After having eaten, Ebisu told the genin it was time for the initial taijutsu training to start. Returning to the ten posts he explained that the first thing they would do was evaluate his taijutsu by having a spar. His stances were wrong, his movements were wrong, the only thing Naruto had going for him was that his speed, creative comebacks and durability made his self-deprecating style effectively unpredictable. As they spared, Ebisu had to acknowledge that the boy had worked hard on his speed and strength. But he could tell the boy had no clue about the real advantages behind the chakra walking methods. It was only slightly covered in the discussions between their collective clones. And while the genin would eventually be able to figure it out on his own, Ebisu felt slightly vindicated of his past opinions of the boy. Explaining to him how to channel his chakra into the muscles only took a few moments. The boy's speed and strength almost quadrupled instantly. Since the spar had dwindled into a lesson on chakra manipulation, Ebisu simply shifted pace and began coaching the boy through a few stances. The boy had been sabotaged here. Even so, Ebisu was disappointed in Naruto. Shouldn't he have been able to see that the other students were doing it differently? Then Ebisu realized who his instructor had been for Taijutsu. The little genin had placed so much faith in Mizuki. Only for it to cut him back time and again. It seemed this would be another chance to use the methods of teaching which Naruto's clones allowed. After having the blonde clones move in the correct ways, Ebisu explained to them, how each movement was meant to flow into the next. Having a clone show a single move to a corresponding clone at the same time, they worked through all the basic academy stances. He also explained how the physical movements didn't carry over. This meant that Naruto would have to go over all of these himself, every day on his own. When asked why they used clones if that was the case, Ebisu flat out told the boy they weren't doing this for the exercise. That was Naruto's responsibility. They had used the clones so he could show him all of the movements. Learning how to move was as much mental as physical. And because the original performed the moves with his real body, while his clones were being explained in detail what each step did, and why, he would get a much better understanding of each movement. Once completed, Naruto should be more than capable of practicing on his own, without being shown new steps or needing corrected further the way most academy students did. It took Naruto a few moments to go through each form in the corrected movements using his new understanding of each step and pass. Satisfied that Naruto had it down, Ebisu declared that they needed to work on a most major hole in his style. Defense. Why defense? Because his style involved the use of clones in battle. If a clone gets hit once, it will dispel. Think Naruto, if your enemy cannot touch you, they cannot beat you, and if they can't beat you, that makes you the eventual winner no matter how else the fight ends. And if your clones don't get dispelled by being hit anymore, they can win a fight for you while you finish the mission. Naruto was convinced and complied when instructed to take his forehead plate off. He made the two clones requested. Then he put the plate back on. This training was in the most basic form of defense, evasion. Naruto, the one with the forehead protector, was only allowed to dodge attacks. He couldn't block, counter, or attack back. And to the real genin's horror, if the clones managed to knock him out, they would be treated to all the ramen they could eat. The clones attacked hard and fast. Naruto took more damage than he dodged at first. But after a few frantic beatings, he began moving much faster. Not only was this from putting chakra into his speed, but also from the fear of being hurt more. Ebisu's comment that pain was an excellent motivator didn't help. After about half an hour of this, the janin called the chase to a halt. He allowed the boy to rest for a few moments and explained to him how his movements had worked or hadn't. Once Naruto was rested up, he repeated the training. This time Naruto was able to dodge most of the hits but the clones were also moving faster than before. He let another half hour pass before the janin told him that it was enough for the day. He would be required to go over all his forms and movements once every day. Ebisu suggested doing them on water once a day as well. However he should do this dodging training only once per week and never with more than three clones. Promising to move on to blocks, parries, and counters the next time, they left the training grounds in search of the shopping district. Zero o till zero each shop they stopped at had been expecting them, 
and while normally they were open until sunset, which was still a few hours away, they all seemed to be empty, it was slightly eerie to Naruto. Almost worse than the glares, the few people who were out, hastily made their way once they noticed who was coming. Ebisu took Naruto to several shops, first was the tailor, who measured Naruto and took the requests for his outfit. Ebisu requested a fully equipped Anbu uniform made to his fit. While it was missing the flak jacket it came with a dense male sleeveless overcoat slightly resembling a black flak anyway. And when told that he wasn't going to be charged for this out of pocket, Naruto ordered a new orange outfit as well. I'm not going to get all dressed up just to paint a fence or catch that blasted cat. The uniform you ask for is good for real missions, but when it comes to those D ranks there's no point in wearing it. Not able to fault the child's logic, the Jonin wholeheartedly supported Naruto's second uniform, and made his own alterations to Naruto's requested outfit. Naruto didn't hear anything too different, so he let the Jonin speak. He had to know what he was doing right? While those were being made the duo went to the next shop, a seal master's shop. They weren't actually seal masters, that was simply the name of the type of shop. It wasn't that hard to make sealed tags and usually Jonin could create their own easily, but many Genin dropouts or injured wouldn't have enough skill to teach, and while learning their next trade or job would be able to come here, where under the supervision of an adept they could make the tags. They made everything from exploding to chakra suppressing tags. There were a vast amount of tags to be made, and Naruto had only known about two or three before that morning. The explosive tag he knew. The flash tag created a bright flash of light, usually sent up into the air like a flare, but could also be used in trap making. The concussion tag created a bust of pressure that almost always gave the target a concussion. The chakra tag held spare chakra, and much like a soldier pill would help replenish the user. Chakra's suppressing tag did the opposite of that. It suppressed the chakra. Gravity tags were how Lee had made his weight so powerful, and were almost always used with movement resistance tags which had nothing to do with air or skin or anything Naruto would have thought. No, they operated by inertia or somehow restricting gravity itself to the object. The real understanding of it was beyond Naruto. Barrier tags were easily explained and usually could only be used in groups, these ones were made for various levels by various skill levels. While the other tags verified in small ways they were mostly only the size of the resulting use or the trigger of it. Barriers on the other hand had hundreds of different variables, and could be used for hundreds of different purposes, some sealed sounds into a room, others sealed chakra or demons like ghosts and things, and still even more could seal solid things like people or water or even germs. These were the only tags that Naruto didn't receive. Ebisu had ordered several of each of the others, and explained how each was used and how they could be incorporated into traps. He also ordered several sealing scrolls, which he cautioned Naruto to never try sealing a sealed tag into. He had purchased the materials for Naruto to begin making his own with as well, but the Jonin flat out told him it would take months before he would be ready to even start learning. That done, they headed to the tool smiths. Getting his kanai and shuriken was a simple number asked for. But that wasn't all they made. The toolsmiths made many different tools, not just kanai and shuriken. They also made shinobi wire, weights, and bracers that were sent to the trailers. Spring-loaded launchers, and many other things. The toolsmiths did make most of the blades, but they weren't swordsmiths. These were usually made separate and delivered to the tool shops to be sold. Here, Naruto got his new set of kanai, shuriken, wire and his new bracers for the anbu uniform. He was told to wait on the weights until he was up to Ebisu's standard of conditioning. He also got a windmill and a pair of giant shuriken and a tanto. A short sword that was almost small enough to be a knife. This was going to be used for any hand-to-hand -hand clash with larger blades because it could be repaired easily and with the sparing usage kanai and shuriken received they weren't near the quality of an actual sword. Which explained why being a swordsmith took so much more work. Sealing all of his new tools into one of the sealing scrolls he'd received, they headed on to the herbalists and apothecaries. There were several of these shops to stop at. And each one had different items, from numbing salves to acid powder, poisons of all kinds and medicines of all kinds. They had soldier pills and emergency field rations that were able to power a jonin for days. They picked up three or four things at each of the few smaller shops, and over a dozen things at each of the bigger three. Naruto recognized these three from the discussions earlier that day as being the clan shops of the Ino Shika Cho. As they selected each item, Naruto was told of its use, its make, and its counters. 
by the time they left his head was almost swimming. And finally it was back to the tailors. The battle suit was standard black ambu uniform with a male overcoat and bracers. All of it had been made with chakra conductive threads and metals so that it would adapt a transformation, or a hidden veil genjutsu more effectively. The only thing truly missing was the mask. His new orange outfit was a four-piece set. It had his normal orange pants with a long black stripe down each side. A long-sleeved mesh undershirt, made densely enough it was almost as tough as the male. An orange jacket much like his first one, but this one didn't have a white collar. Instead it came right up to his neck, tightly binding in place around it. Its arms were also blue like the shoulders were. The red Uzumaki spiral had to be patched on. It also came with a bandage set that went under and on top of it in places. The bandages held pockets for weights and helped to brace his flesh much like combat tape. They were made of a durable armored threads. Not as good as mesh but much denser and layered making it about the same. After some final adjustments were made, they went to cash out. And like with each of the other shops before the prices, influenced by Ebisu's presence were considerably lower than Naruto had been used to. Ebisu's initial response to Naruto's reaction was heated, but that was why he was here, wasn't it? True to his word the previous day, Ebisu had told the Hokage about Naruto's treatment. He had been told to assess it himself and report back before any punishment could be performed. And so he had. Today as Naruto waited for his sensei, Ebisu infiltrated each shop and inspected what he could. There was much more to tell about a shop than they realized. He had requisitioned a few, assistants, from his acquaintance and they were able to tell him exactly what money had come from the genin and where he had been in the shop. In some of them he never made it past the entrance, but the fact he had entered was proof enough he'd been turned away. More so, transactions from one of the tool shops had him leaving with metals that smelled exactly like the scrap bin in the smithy itself. While the money that had come from his pocket was more than enough to buy the highest quality they had. This resulted in the Hokage himself fining all of the involved shops. The monetary compensation was placed in a fund which Ebisu was currently using to supply Naruto with what he needed at the correct prices. Not that any money was actually transferred. It was more like a tab being opened with a positive balance. Once everything was gathered Ebisu topped the whole shopping spree off, with a gift of his own. One not purchased by the villagers' greed, but instead traded for with a promise of meal, company and booze, a lot of booze. For both of them. A bingo book. One made up to date by the TNI department. Holding more than the standard intel, it told of each bingo, with all the info they could verify. Down to known associates and even which foods they ate. It even included theories on what strategies would be best to use, as well as what to recognize as a reason to plain just run. Ebisu had considered telling Naruto that these weren't handed out to just anybody, most were actually made by the user, but the Jonin was also certain, that as it had been included in the bet, he'd have to teach Naruto how to make one instead. So he'd asked her. She had truly put her full effort behind it once he mentioned who it was for. Ebisu had to give her credit. The bingo book was far better than he'd seen before. And the cost wasn't as bad as she could have demanded. What were a few drinks and a dinner anyway? Finished shopping, they headed to Naruto's apartment. Where Ebisu performed a check on all of the genin's old tools. And after learning what he had about the boy's diet, he checked his food as well allowing one of the assistants he'd kept with him for just this purpose to slither into the boy's foods and pantry and finally his garbage the genin never even knew the creature was there while the spy was working he showed naruto how to maintain his tools and gave a few demonstrations on their use he also promised to teach him to use them accurately later on as ebisu left the boy to the rest of his night the janin decided he was going to need even more attention from the hokage his parting words were that the next time Naruto went food shopping or shopping for anything for that matter, he should tell the Janin, so he could attend. They would be meeting again the day after tomorrow to set up their training schedule so it would correspond with the one Kakashi had in place. 0 Octal 0 The Hokage's office was open and bright when he arrived. The third did keep long hours, but it was also empty. Void of paperwork or personnel, the office stood open with only the elderly Hokage and his desk. The door closed ominously as he entered. For a brief flare of chakra, the room was ablaze in intricate patterns of the vast ceiling arrays decorating every wall. You must have enjoyed having the day off while poor Jemna cared for Konohamaru Chan. The elder was standing at the window facing it, but the Janin knew he truly watched the glass, allowing his eyes to focus on his office. Ebisu knew what would come next. 
He had explained the whole bet to the Hokage and the third had laughed it off, already knowing about it from his own secrets. It was the one reason he had so much leeway with Naruto's education. Not that he would tell the boy or his own charge, but the bet had been made a B rank secret. Pending the discoveries it revealed, it would possibly be made a rank. And only Naruto was allowed to share it. He had been expressly told to keep it hidden from the boy's janin. The third had been kind enough to explain away the secrecy to his grandson, but it went far deeper than the simple pride of the boy's official janin. That started with the treatment and correction of the shops, it ended with his status as a jinchuriki. Today I watched as a boy, harmfully neglected by the teachers and peers in his life, was given the first true education he had ever had. I watched as a man I know was biased to his plight, began to feel the pain that I see every day in my adopted son. The janin swallowed his nerves and kept his jaw tight. As the Hokage turned on him with disgust at what he'd learned. The aged shinobi knew. Everything Ebisu had learned had been somehow conveyed to the raging elder, and fury was incarnate. Within moments of his arrival, the Hokage's trusted educator could see shop owners being dragged bodily out of their homes from the window of the office. Some were violently brought to justice as they were dragged screaming to the streets. The one doing it was also recognized. She had easily cast a genjutsu to keep bystanders unaware as the shopkeepers begged for help. No one would see them, no one would hear them, no one would save them. One by one the earth clones that woman had created gathered them and dragged them into the pits of hell they would reside in until she and Ibiki killed them. The next day no one would know where they went, and their loved ones would soon be visited for counseling by Yamanaka no doubt. Taking his seat at the large desk, the cold-faced shinobi began talking explaining almost as Ebisu had to Naruto, why they were going to die. The spy Ebisu had delivered, had found the traces of no less than a hundred different poisons, only a few truly fatal. But many were placed there over several different lengths of time ago. The elder personally knew the boy hadn't replaced the garbage bin since moving in. It was only Ebisu's bringing the issue to light that had warranted a full investigation. In the short time since that first spy reported in, all of them were deployed. Not just her summons which had already reported similar, if not the exact same poisons in the shops Ebisu had investigated that morning, but also the best trackers from the Inazuka and Aburame. It had been less than an hour before they had identified the scents of the ones who used the poisons and some of them even carried them still, including the hateful wife of an innocent shopkeeper. Those that weren't dragged out would be dealt with, but these were only the ones where true, hard and solid evidence had been found. This wasn't the first time he'd heard about Naruto's nutritional issue though. When he had first learned of the boy's diet, he found out simply because a small girl whose father owned Naruto's favorite stand, had come in bawling when she heard what Naruto ate. And when he told her that he had no control over what the boy wanted to eat, nor could he make sure on a daily basis that the boy didn't let his food go bad, it became known as the time a child had thrown things off his own desk at him in his own office, and gotten away with it. In truth, he had been so pleased that she cared about Naruto-chan's well-being, that he honestly wanted to reward her. Instead she was sent to a cell for a week, but he was concerned by what she'd said. So he had sent a chunin to the boy's place to check it out, and to see what foods the boy did have. The only thing not rotten or spoiled in some way was the cup ramen of which he had an abundant supply. He had known the boy was being overcharged, and mistreated at some shops, but he would never have thought they would outright turn him away or sell him bad food, and it was well within their rights to demand whatever price they wanted. He had unfortunately assumed the boy's love for the ramen stand had been because the girl would often play with him when she was younger. That and the fact they gave all her ruined ramen to him for free when she was starting out. After visiting him and explaining how to properly refrigerate and keep the food he bought, the Hokage moved on. Gazing in on him, he saw the boy had all but stopped even buying the foodstuffs that had gone bad. This led him to asking the Ino Shika Cho Nutritional Corps aka the Jonin's wives, to create some, special spices, which he commissioned to be added to all of the boy's meals at the ramen stand. Her father picked her up from the Anbu a week after her outburst, with the first batch of spices and a check for their ongoing E-rank mission. He had made a point, to personally pay them for a case of coupons made specifically so he could send the boy there if it had been too long since his last healthy meal so the boy would be certain to get the nutrition he needed. That one case had lasted for the last six years and still had at least another year's worth left. They would receive the coupon and cash it in at the bank, later that week, to be paid for the meal. 
he was also well aware of the fact that the two working there had taken to giving the boy free bowls too. Learning what he had today, the Hokage understood why the girl was so upset. He decided that he would be making another investment in their shop sometime in the next few days. Turning away from the janin standing before him, Serutobi ordered him to provide a full and complete training course for the genin. And when the chunin exams came, he expected the boy to be promotable. Our Ebisu would face dire consequences. Note. Special thanks go out to Perfect Lionheart, for some of the jutsu theories. Ebisu's lecture on Naruto's endurance was more a lecture on pacing himself. We all know Naruto is an endurance god, but do you really think that anyone would have told him to pace himself? Especially with the fact that he lasts so long anyway. Also he said Naruto was reported to have the worst condition, now who would report a thing like that I wonder. Ebisu didn't teach him any of those jutsu mentioned, he only explained that they existed and why. Ebisu is only going so far as to catch him up to the basic academy graduate level and keep his end of the bet. Which was. Fire and air walking, a real Tai jutsu, the Katen, advanced elemental manipulation for his affinity, a jutsu from each of the other four elements that only get stronger with extra chakra, and getting and maintaining or creating shinobi tools, tags, and a bingo book. Please keep in mind that Naruto has basically forgotten all of the future, and is re-learning it all. He barely remembers most of it. As displayed by his lack of understanding about the Rasengan and Toad summoning. He is remembering things slowly. But it will be a while before he has his full memories back. They went for lunch at about noon so two hours plus the half hour it took to find training ground 17. Then about 40 minutes spent on the shadow projectile jutsu, another couple hours on lectures, and an hour or so on food and taijutsu leaves them at about 6 or 7 when they go shopping. The shops are open until about sunset here so they have plenty of time. A 7 km wide circle has a perimeter of 15 and change kilometers, if the posts were extended out just a bit as Naruto passed the wall it can become 16 kilometers. if ran in 40 million equals 24 km per hour equals 15 mph so he ran 10 miles at 15 miles per hour in 40 million. Yeah, that whole spill about his diet kinda played out as I typed it, it was not planned and I had no say. My fingers typed and typed no matter what I did. It really doesn't fit with the ideas I had for this story but I can work it in pretty easily. Uchiha Sasuke enjoyed the texture of the bark on his back, the grass in his fingers, the warmth of the sun shining on his bandaged skin. He was leaning against one of the many trees in training ground 7, waiting for his team. Team. The Uchiha thought to himself. He was on a team with him. The indignant boy remembered the savage beating he had received only yesterday. It angered him to no end, that his skills had been unable to even defend against the dead last. But also, he was excited. The blonde had held back, he had somehow fooled everybody as he became stronger. How? Looking over at the would-be Kunoichi, he thought back to the night before. At least now he understood why he was on a team with such a pathetic teammate as her. Zero o octal zero he remembered her coming to the hospital to visit him and for some reason the nurse had given her charge of him. She was supposed to see to it that he got home safe. At least it got him out of the hospital, he had thought. Yet, when he got home, he told her she could go and began his way to the Uchiha dojo, only to be yelled at as if she could give him orders. No training. You need to rest up and eat, and then, you're going to bed. If you even think of training when you're so hurt, you'll be back in the hospital for the rest of the night. He knew by the way she spoke that nurse had actually given her the authority to have him taken back by medics if she reported it. Besides, he could use the rest if he were going to be really tested tomorrow. Following him inside Sakura had him show her to the kitchen. I'll make you something to eat. You need to eat your fill tonight because Sensei said it would be best to skip breakfast in the morning. That was how he found himself eating with one of the few people he actively ran from. It wasn't that he needed to run so much as, she was annoying. He actually preferred Naruto's constant attempts to beat him, over the drooling of his female classmates. When he finished eating, Sakura came back from the restroom, and told him she had drawn him a bath, and if that wasn't enough she pulled him to his feet and began undoing his bandages. While she did this Sasuke was certain she was mumbling criticisms on the quality of how it was wrapped. It had been a simple civilian wrap, shinobi bandaging was only slightly different. Once the bandages were off he waited for her to leave before getting into the bath. He still thought he was going to be peaked at, but a few moments of making sure she was gone and was able to relax. The soak was good for his injuries and here, he thought over how his other teammate had beaten him. 
There was no way he had just gotten that much stronger, and that's when he realized that the boy had been acting weak on purpose, he hadn't even passed normally, so that he had been hiding his real strength. The shinobi way was the art of deception and it seemed Naruto knew it. It also explained why Naruto was able to trick so many in the village, and how he somehow managed to evade the Anbu for as long as he could. Many of their classmates had thought he was exaggerating or just plain lying when he told them. But now, Sasuke had no doubts about it. When he exited the bath, he was startled to find out that his useless teammate was still there. And it only became more surprising when she took out a pouch of ointments and salves. And again he found himself put out by a girl he avoided. He sat there in only his small clothes as she applied the medical creams on the majority of his body. Then she rewove his bandages in a very different form than they had been at the hospital. He had to admit it was a much better one. He had already begun feeling relief. Next the new, pink mystery led her properly wrapped ward to his bedroom to be tucked in, much to the indignation and resistance of an even worse Lee humiliated Sasuke. If I come back, Uchiha Sasuke, and those bandages have been disturbed, I will make sure you stay in the hospital for the next week. Got it? And for the first time, Sasuke found fear for one of the girls who chased him in the academy. Zero o octal zero when he had awakened, he had been pleasantly surprised. It was as if all of his aches had disappeared overnight. And they literally had. Remembering her earlier words about not eating because of the test their sensei was going to give them, the drowsy genin decided to eat a quick meal. There was no point in skipping a breakfast for her stupid diet. When Sakura arrived that morning, she changed his bandages again and this time she used combat tape on top of it, bracing all his joints and muscles. It restricted his movement a little but on the whole he felt as if he'd gotten stronger through this ordeal. Sasuke had to admit that she had some uses. As she told him on the way here, apparently her top academic marks included how the body worked in the field medical skills, but they had not been used in practice. So she only knew the house of the medical bandaging for shinobi, and hadn't actually done it on anyone before. As his teammate babbled away, Sasuke thought over what she had told him. Keeping one of his ears turned towards her incessant voice in case she said anything else worth hearing. He had never given much thought to the medical field. He knew his path was on the front lines, fighting, not in a tent, fixing. But the little details she had memorized paid off big time when he needed them. Even as he walked to the training ground he could feel his body healing. A tingle there from the ointment, and itch here from clotted blood over his many lacerations. If he was ever hurt, he would need medical aid like this to get him back in the fight that much sooner. So maybe the dobi was right. He could use his teammates to help him prepare for his eventual clash with his elder brother. Sakura was a good bet for the medical needs his many battles would require. Not like he'd get out of every fight without a scratch. If he wanted to grow stronger he needed to fight strong opponents and that meant fighting against those who could cause him as much damage as he could cause them. And speaking of stronger opponents, could he really keep calling him the Dobi? How had Naruto been so fast? How had he grabbed him with his foot? The beating he'd dished out was far, more, than anything the boy had been capable of in the academy. Just how much had the boy held back? How strong could he be? The genin was actually excited to test himself against Naruto and not have to hold back for fear of setting his training back. Yes, Uchiha Sasuke could use this team. Zero o octal zero Uzumaki Naruto was not a morning person, well not at first. It normally took him a few minutes to get going, today should have been an exception. Days like this, when he was certain he would be, showing the world how awesome he was were supposed to be easy to wake up to. Today was not easy to wake up to. He had been up all night in fact. Well, in a way. His clones had been out setting all the traps he'd planned out and many others they had come up with on their own. This time around wasn't going to go the way it had last time. He had come up with the perfect lines for his introduction, and he was ready to attack bastard sensei with vengeance for last time. The fog over his memories seemed to begin lifting as he learned to meditate. He had spent most of the morning on one of ten posts in training ground 17, rightfully named the Circle of Pillars. That had been just after he had ran his first morning lap, a a a a n d eaten breakfast. Yeah, it was good to know the future, anyway. He meditated over his memories not only of the future, but also of the traps his clones had lain the night before. It helped that he had used his shadow projectile jutsu and every single one of them was a cloned tool. He had no real tools out there. And while doing that, the clones had figured out how to throw them. He had the jutsu down. Drawing them all on a scroll, 
he made a very crude map of training ground 7. It was a small scroll, thin once rolled. He could easily slip it into Sasuke's pocket later. Addressing it to Sakura Chan, he pocketed his trap map. It was about an hour after they were supposed to meet. That meant they still had a few hours until Sensei showed up. It was time to join his teammates. The excited Genin could barely keep his calm as he walked into the training ground. What would they think of his new uniform? He had intentionally worn the outfit Ebisu Sensei had designed for him. Its similarity to the Anbu uniform should make him look more serious about being a shinobi, and would only highlight his improvement. Hopefully it would be enough for them to completely forget who he was before, not that they remembered all the dumb things that had happened to him over the year that hadn't happened yet, it wasn't as if he remembered much of it either for that matter. He could remember only bits and pieces, but he was certain he'd been humiliated more than a few times. The mission ahead of them, the Chunin exam, he knew he had faced Neji, and that he didn't like him, something was missing there. And something really bad happening just after, and then. Boobs? Something to do with blowing a frog up using a balloon. He wasn't sure about that one, but he could clearly remember a giant frog. And then Sasuke. He had left the village, they had fought, and Sasuke had killed him. He didn't know why. He wasn't sure who was right or wrong. But Sasuke had killed him. So it must have been something big. Something that made the Teme think he had to leave to kill Itachi. Naruto saw the man's face in front of him. It wasn't as blurry as the rest of his memories, but he had no idea where it came from. The upcoming test on the other hand, was something he clearly remembered. And he didn't want to live down the thousand years of death again. And even if he still couldn't remember much about the big mission with the mirrors and swords and things, he was sure whatever it was, the seven years bad luck didn't carry over. How many mirrors had he broken for that to keep being such a clear memory? And what the hell? Was with the mask that kept showing up inside them, was he going to get super ugly or something? Nah. Couldn't be. He did remember a few things from the mission though. Words. The words that echoed through his soul. He wasn't sure where he had heard them but he knew they had meant everything to him when he did. And now he would use them, and all the things he had learned over the last few days to make an image. An image that would become his new face, his new self, his first step towards becoming Hokage. He had barely stepped into the training ground when the Uchiha forced him to dodge. The boy's foot passed through where his head had been. He had rolled forward into the Uchiha's guard and as he came up he caught his rival's extended leg before the genin could land from his kick. Lifting him up, Naruto tossed him bodily into a tree. The Uchiha took no time bouncing back to his feet and pressing his attack. Naruto could almost see every move the Uchiha was going to make before he made them, by watching the muscle movements he had learned about the day before. Not only that. But his speed was different. His movements were slow far slower than they had been in Naruto's memories. That was understandable. He didn't have his Sharingan yet, and he hadn't learned to tree walk either. Naruto vaguely remembered their battle when he died, but only just barely. Sasuke had been able to water walk then. It was no wonder he was so much slower. At least now Naruto understood why Sasuke was able to get so fast. He had been using chakra to make himself faster, like Ebisu had shown him. But now, Naruto was the one who could do it, and Sasuke had no clue that he could. Naruto easily avoided every strike, kick, and lunge Sasuke made at him. Sasuke's movements were growing more and more aggressive, as his face became enraged. Naruto had him beaten, and hadn't even attacked once. So this is what Ebisu Sensei meant by not getting hit. The closet pervert was onto something there. Finished pissing the Uchiha prick off, Naruto went on the offensive. He easily caught one of Sasuke's fists and slammed his own into the stuck up Tami's gut. As the genius curled over, Naruto whispered into his ear. Then the Anbu lookalike picked him up by the back of his pants, noticing the little sticker on the Uchiha's bandages with a suppressed giggle. Discreetly slipping the scroll into the boy's pocket, Naruto tossed him face first at Sakura, knocking them both over. For a moment he saw her surprise, no, shock. No, absolute complete fucking mindfart. Her mouth was hanging open. Her eyes were wide and comically bulged outwards from her face. She didn't even realize what he had done until the Uchiha landed on her. She had just lost all her opinions of him in those few seconds. He caught himself before he actually thought that maybe now she'd go on a date with him. She had made her choice. She wanted Sasuke. And he had died to fulfill that promise. 
his chances with her were over the moment he had agreed to bring the Teme back. Even if it hadn't happened yet, he had given up on her. It was time for him to move on. Sasuke was up on his feet in moments, oddly enough he dragged Sakura up too. Her eyes looked at the Uchiha in almost as much shock as they had at him. Oi! Sasuke, you shouldn't exert yourself so much, Sensei said he had a test for us, maybe you should be resting up for that instead. The Uchiha's glare at him hardened, and Sakura's look of shock finally came undone as her rage at him expressed itself. What the hell do you think you're doing? Attacking Sasuke like that? Again? You have no right to be telling him to rest, you jerk. Turning back to the Uchiha she grabbed his arm, and rather forcefully lead him back to his spot by a tree. Sasuke, you really need to rest up. You shouldn't be fighting with that idiot in your condition. Don't forget that we still have no idea what Kakashi Sensei's test is going to be. He might want to do a physical exam. The look on the Tem's face when she began giving him orders was priceless. Naruto actually had trouble holding his laughter in. Once he had control of his vocals again, he spoke, it looks like Sensei is going to be late again. I'm going to take a nap. Sasuke, don't forget what you were told, eh? With another chuckle the genin lay back and closed his eyes. Zero o octal zero it was a nice nap that was interrupted. A good, happy, relaxing, comfy, interrupted by a kick to the ribs, nap. Courtesy of a less pretty than earlier pinkette. It wasn't just him was it, or did she actually lose her attractiveness for a few minutes? Holding his side, Naruto climbed to his feet. Good of you to join us, Naruto. The nonchalant tone of voice, the orange book predominantly covering his already masked face, the silver gravity defying hair. Kakashi sensei, exactly as Naruto remembered him. It's not noon already is it? Naruto turned to the Uchiha with his question. His rival simply shrugged. Let's start off by getting to know each other. There's no need to rush into any stressful situations. Their sensei began. Naruto didn't hesitate. He jumped up and began introducing himself. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. I like ramen, training, and learning new things. I hate when people treat me badly because of my birthday being the same day as the festival. At the comment about learning new things, he only heard one snort. I swear Sakura wasn't this mean last time, Naruto thought to himself. His sensei didn't even flinch at the hint about the Kyubi. I don't like people who think they're better than others just because they have an advantage that others don't, and I can't forgive anybody who would betray or abandon the people who care about them. He said this he gave a pointed glare to each of his teammates, making absolutely sure not to look at Sasuke any more than the others. My plan for the future is to become an awesome shinobi by following my five shinobi truths, and my five guidelines to ninjutsu. As Naruto declared his last statement his shoved his hand out to count on each finger. First, never give up or go back on your word. This was something he had believed for the longest time, even before the memories. Second, hard work is the only way to become strong. There are no shortcuts to strength. It was kind of funny. To think that the so called shortcut to strength that Ebisu sensei had been preaching was the same youthful dedication to hard work that had the bushy brows duo so tough. Not a shortcut at all. Third, True strength is found by protecting those precious to you. And fourth. When you have something precious to you, you must protect it. With both arms, with both legs and with every other part of your body. His memories of that mission, while a blur, rang clearly with those words. Both rules were dear to him. Even if he didn't know why. And finally, my fifth Nindo. Naruto was ready to see how the Jonin reacted to his own words being parented before he ever said them. Not that he was going to say them exactly. That would be too much of a giveaway. Those who abandon their comrades are worse than the worst scum. Kakashi's reaction was a slight widening of his visible eye, and a narrowing of his peripheral vision as he began to re reassess Naruto. Not that Naruto caught either of those. To the genin, his sensei hadn't reacted at all. My five guidelines to ninjutsu 1. A shinobi's path is deception. 2. Always be ready. The best victory is a battle that's won without a fight. If you can eliminate the threat before it happens then do so. 3. If the enemy can't touch you, then they can't beat you. This means contact with fist or chakra. A genjutsu is far harder to evade than any kanai. 4. Anything available to a shinobi can be a weapon or tool, however if a tool isn't used to protect what's precious to you, then it is dead weight. And 5. 
You haven't truly mastered a jutsu until you can do it silently, from every part of your body, without vocal commands, or hand seals. Each of his guidelines had been a lesson learned from Ebisu Sensei. Over the last day Naruto's entire view of him had changed. He had never had anyone teach him as much as that man had. And from the few hours they had spent together Naruto felt as if he had gained more than even the whole year of life that he had lost. Taking a deep breath Naruto took the famous youthful, nice guy pose. It was time to finish with a closing statement. I am going to become Hokage. And I will protect all of the people precious to me. Believe it. With that said he sat back down, signifying that he was finished. Zero O Octal Zero Hitaki Kakashi was not a fool, no matter how many times he acted like one. And he was fully aware that there was something wrong here. Naruto, asleep when he arrived, should have been bored and impatient. That small oddity could have been explained by him not sleeping well because he was too excited. But what couldn't be explained was the outfitting. It was as close to an Anbu uniform as one could get without being put under suspicion for impersonating the Anbu. At the same time while his body language and attitude hadn't changed, he seemed calmer. He was more intelligent than he was a week ago, hell he was more intelligent than he had been at the academy yesterday. The Janin could see it. The boy knew things that he hadn't before. His rules and guidelines were a single step towards the suspicion that the Janin felt festering in his gut. The Sandame had rigged it. There was no other explanation. The ex Anbu member had heard about the scroll theft, and that Naruto acquired a certain jutsu from it. Obviously, the Hokage had felt that the opportunity to force feed the boy knowledge via clone feedback was too great to pass up. This apparently had to have been paid for by bribing him with a new outfit and tools. And that last Nindo of his, it was as if the old man had been trying to mold him into Kakashi's own personal Obito chibi. How dare that old fool use his past like this? Sasuke was the next to speak although he didn't get up for it. My name is Uchiha Sasuke. I like training, and testing myself against strong opponents. I dislike being caught off guard, or unprepared for something. My plans for the future are to test myself against as many stronger opponents as available, until I can kill a certain man, and then to revive the Uchiha clan. The Uchiha was wrapped soundly in medical and combat tapes. Not the standard civilian wrap, or even the shinobi combat weave. Clearly the one who had done it, had studied extensively on the human body to maximize the range of movement and durability of the weave. The Janin was mildly surprised at the extent of the boy's wounds. Nothing too damaging was done, but the total amount of minor injuries spoke of rage and violence. He couldn't believe his ears when he was told all that had happened to the boy. An ambush with shadow clones could understandably result in Naruto's victory but his few checkups on the boy over the last year or so had him certain that there had to have been an exaggeration about how ruthless it had been. Seeing the outfit and the slight, but drastic changes in Naruto, almost changed his mind. Sakura spoke next, the Kunoichi clearly hated Naruto and even more clearly had a crush on Sasuke. Mentioning how taking care of him had made her feel, and how caring for his children would be a rewarding life. Subtlety must have come as hard to her as it did to the previously orange boy. But no point in wasting a minor opening, so the Janin gave an off-handed comment that maybe she could be the team's medic. Her eyes brightened up at that. With their introductions over he said a few words about himself and offered to explain the test. Taking out the two bells he told them the rules, explaining as he did that they were not genin yet. When the possible medic objected that one of them was injured he merely replied that they may have to finish a mission injured, so there was little difference. It was a shame that the Uchiha was hurt as badly as he was, but that didn't mean he would change his test. And if they failed, they would go back to the academy, and he would eat their lunch in front of them. His eye narrowed when both boys subtly became amused. Sakura was the only one to react with the panic he had expected. So I'm guessing both of you boys ate breakfast. They looked at each other and Naruto's grin was almost reflected on the Uchiha. Almost. Even after I said you'd throw it up. It was Sasuke's reply that came, just another thing the Janin hadn't expected. Even if we vomit, it was early enough that the nourishment has been absorbed. Neglecting to feed your body out of the fear that you might vomit is like not sharpening your kanai because someone might cut you with it. At that he even sent a small glare at the pinket, message received? I'm not taking stupid risks when it comes to my shinobi career. Each of them had straightened, they were all ready to fight. One last thing and he would start the timer. I am a Jonin, against me you will have very little chance of victory. 
so come at me with the intent to kill. Their eyes hardened, he shouted, goo, and two of them vanished. With a sigh, the Jonin look at the remaining would-be Jenin, and raised his eyebrow. Sensei, do you mean it? Naruto was in a ready stance, but his head was down, his eyes just barely visible, were almost cold. At his lack of response the Jenin spoke again. Do you really want me to attack with the intent to kill? Ah. That was it. The poor not even a Jenin obviously thought he had a chance of hurting a Jonin. No surprise there, he had already beaten a Chunin with relative ease. Naruto, it's okay. I'm far above Mizuki's level. I won't die. So hold nothing back. You mean it, no holding back, I can use any tool I have to kill you, and I won't be punished for it? That question wasn't as unexpected as anything else Kakashi saw today. There were only two possible reasons he would ask a question like that. Either he was asking for permission to use that chakra, or Mizuki had been punishing him if he ever got too good. Use only whatever you feel comfortable explaining to your teammates, but don't hold back out of fear of the consequences, even if I am hurt, you won't be punished. There. That should help his resolve. It not only hid the first reason while letting him know that if he wanted to explain it to his teammates he could, but it also let him know there would be no punishment if he did use it. And it ensured he knew that victory wouldn't get him in trouble here. Kakashi was mildly amused when a small amount of killing intent flickered to life in Naruto. Don't underestimate me sensei. The genin looked up at him with a snarling face. And the level of killing intent he was producing spiked. I'll kill you. The Janin could actually feel the chakra flowing through Naruto, it was unreal. It certainly wasn't that chakra, but his own. How much had Naruto been holding back exactly? If this was what the boy was talking about then it explained a lot. All those times he would escape pursuit, his many successful prank infiltrations, even the easy defeat of Mizuki. In a flash Naruto's fist slammed into Kakashi's open palm. His speed was at least Chunin, and the power behind the fist. It almost felt like. Guy. Zero O Octal Zero Sasuke remembered this feeling clearly. It was the same as when Naruto had said those same words to him. Terror. The complete and absolute certainty that he was going to die. If not for the knowledge that Naruto was on his side, the Uchiha might have fled. He remembered the words the Dobi had whispered in their spar. Sensei's test is going to be a trick of some sort, you need to look underneath the underneath, under his words to what he's trying to get out of saying them, and under that to why he would want that result. But above all, we need to work together no matter what he says. The scroll is for Sakura. It was a clear hint that the Dobi knew what the test was. He had inside information and the fact that he would pass it to him like that could only mean that they weren't simply waiting for a late teacher. The Jonin was watching them. So when he landed from the toss, he passed a message to his landing pad and deftly transferred the scroll as per instructions. Forgoing the payback spar he had desired in lieu of keeping his true abilities his own until the test. When Naruto moved, his body seemed to vanish, he was fast. Whatever punishment he thought he would get for not holding back must have been there for a long time there was no possible way to get that fast overnight. Sasuke didn't know what happened between the Dobi and their taijutsu instructor, but it had to be directly relevant to his secret skill. Was Naruto getting punished unless he held back, or had he accidentally killed their sensei? It didn't really matter anymore, his secret was out. Naruto's quick maneuvers of hand to hand had almost caught the Jonin several times, whatever it was Naruto was doing had managed to push the Jonin from his crouching position. Then Naruto leapt back and when he landed, he wasn't alone. What was that jutsu? Naruto had never been able to perform the clone jutsu, and yet their sensei was dodging these ones like they were solid. It almost looked like he had their sensei cornered when the Jonin struck out and killed all of the clones, with a single hit to each. When the smoke dispersed there were no Naruto's left. Where had the original gone? He was about to come out to try his own luck at the Janin when the entire area was covered in kanai from above. The Janin leapt away and all the kanai vanished like the clones had. Naruto landed back on the ground where his clones had been killed. His Anbu-ish uniform, added to his speed and movements perfectly granted the illusion that he was a real shinobi. There was a single moment of pause between them, then out of nowhere Naruto threw himself to the ground. Another four kanai flew right over him at their sensei. Sasuke shot a look at his other teammate. She had been the one to throw those, and she was on the move. The Janin dodged the Kanai of course, 
but his leap out of the way put him in mid-air, with Naruto on the ground out of his line of fire, the airborne shinobi was an open target for the Uchiha. Taking the advantage, Sasuke leapt out catching their sensei with a quick taijutsu combination, which the Jonin bizarrely used to launch himself back towards the ground. The moment his feet touched down though, Naruto's feet hit him square in the gut, just before Naruto burst into smoke as a giant shuriken almost cut their sensei in half. The sacrificed log fell to the ground and cleanly split apart. Sakura was on the move again. And clones were everywhere making noise. Sasuke took the chance to silently slide back into the trees. When the clones found their sensei, he would join the fight immediately. Zero O Octal Zero This was so bizarre. She had been dreaming of being on a team with Sasuke for who knows how long and it was never like this. Not that she hadn't considered that Kami would require a balance to be kept and put her least favorite person on the team with her most favorite. But even in the fantasies faulted by Universal Balance where Naruto was a member of the team, Sasuke had always been the one in charge. Except in those ones. Her inner self almost made the Kunoichi blush. The ones where she was in charge were unrelated to this issue, she couldn't believe that Sasuke had told her to follow Naruto's lead, he has information we don't, keep the scroll hidden. That was what he said to her, while lying on top of her, it was wrong. First it was the beating the Baka gave her poor Uchiha, yesterday, then he mocked him today. And now, Sasuke wanted them to let Naruto lead. It was madness. Insanity. It seems to be working too, her inner self admitted. When she opened the scroll that was placed in her hand when her crush pulled her up, she felt her heart and jaw drop at the same time. Well, it wasn't Sasuke's declaration of love, it wasn't even his handwriting. No. Instead she held a sloppy, grungy map of the training ground. The poorly written key signified that the grounds were layered with hundreds of traps. Not ten or twenty, not even a single hundred, but hundreds. No wonder Naruto had needed that nap. He had been up all night setting traps for their test. She kind of felt bad for kicking him as hard as she had. Well she'd never doubt Sasuke's plans again. If he said to follow Naruto's lead then follow him she would. It was as if the Baka was a different person entirely now. He was calmer, smarter, way 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 w-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-
With Naruto sending a mass of clones at him wave after wave, he was kept busy while the other two would prepare their own attacks. The one time he had tried to swap with a clone and hide among them the original would vanish and they would all be pelted by Kanai from above. During his fight with the Anbu-esque Genin, Kakashi was constantly targeted by a relentless onslaught of projectiles. They would even take out Naruto's clones when the opening presented itself. Haruno wasn't anywhere near the disappointment he had observed from before, to think she had layered the place with traps beforehand was unusual especially for this generation of female genin. Not only that, he couldn't seem to predict where she would strike out from. None of the information he had on her helped him to expect her most logical trap placement. She had actually used one trap to set off six others that were all in the treetops. It was as if she had a completely separate personality picking the locations of her traps. And every time he had to recover or would go off balance, Sasuke would strike. He had precision, and an arsenal of small fire jutsu that most genin wouldn't be able to use, and the large fireball he sent at him was well beyond any of the current batch of genin he had seen in the academy this year. The copy Nin was most surprised at the raw speed and strength Naruto had. It was so disproportionate to what he should have that it almost made up for his horrendous hand to hand skills. Those, oddly enough, posed their own problems. His style was so bizarre, and almost counterproductive that it was hard to follow. And worse, was that it had points of absolute fluidity and precision littered throughout it at random. Kakashi couldn't predict anything with his movements. He was almost tempted to open Obito's eye until he heard the genin's arm dislocate for an especially nasty jab to his throat. The kid was taking damage to use this style. No wonder they told him to knock it off. Then Naruto used the shadow projectile jutsu. Kakashi had known about the scroll theft, and he was informed by the Hokage the boy hadn't learned any other jutsu. Naruto couldn't have figured it out on his own could he? That was just absurd. Altogether their teamwork was unexpected, they hadn't even tried to compete, working with one another from the very beginning. He had tried not to move any faster than a high genin speed but at this point he had been forced to move at mid chunin speed several times to avoid being hit by a stray fist or kanai, and the Uchiha had almost forced him into Jonin level speed with his quick turnaround attempt at the bells, flipping upside down and launching off of a clone at them. The copy Nin was almost willing to let them take the bells, just to see how they would resolve his little ruse. And so, he tried to arrange an opening, letting the bells go. But instead of his genin taking the bait, the Jonin had taken a blade and found himself bleeding from a vicious stab to his side, courtesy of the pinket. Obviously she had thought the opening had been a trap, and prevented her teammates from getting caught in it. He still couldn't believe he, a Jonin, had been stabbed, by the least of the three not even genin. Even as he held a hand to the bleeding cut, not too deep, she had barely punctured the skin before he'd moved. If her lunge hadn't been so unexpected it never would have landed, how was he going to live this down? The timer should have gone off already, and seeing no real end to this constant assault, Kakashi decided to show them exactly what a Jonin was, and what it meant to fight a losing battle. Vanishing from their area he waited until the bell finally went off. Once it had, he reappeared next to the originals of Sasuke and Naruto at the same time, the genin wasn't the only one to use a shadow clone. With the words, my turn, his fists slammed into their guts targeting stomachs specifically, immediately causing them to puke. After all, he did say they'd throw up breakfast. All of Naruto's current clones burst as a third Jonin Sweden Jutsu struck. Then at a low Jonin speed he and his clone began smacking the boys from every direction with a single open hand from each of the clones. At the same time, the third Kakashi targeted the trap user, and sent small fist-sized bullets of mud raining down on her. Every time Naruto tried to create clones they died instantly from the most painful nerve strikes he knew. When the Uchiha tried to curl his arms were dislocated. No matter where Sakura went, the mud kept pelting her and when she tried diving underwater he electrified it. And almost immediately the three of them were bruised, bleeding, and unconscious. Kakashi looked down at them once they had been laying down on the grass and hosed off with a clean Sweden jutsu. The first team to have ever passed his test, he could barely understand it. From what he'd learned about them yesterday, Naruto had attacked the Uchiha in an ambush, likely with his clones, though he didn't have any real details, the boy was soundly beaten and the Uchiha should have been eager to fight against the blonde. Furthermore Sakura had a passionate dislike for the boy while the clan survivor had the same feelings for the girl. It didn't add up, but then again it kind of did. If Naruto's attack had been as brutal as he had heard, 
then the Uchiha may have began respecting him. The girl could have taken his cues and followed Naruto's lead, accepting him as the alpha of the group, especially after that pressure of killing intent. And it was obvious that she had rebandaged Sasuke this morning. The Uchiha definitely hadn't seen the property of Haruno Sakura, label placed on his lower back, by the girl's bandages. The tramp stamp was only visible to him, because they had been fighting. His body hurt. That was normal for what he'd just been through. However he wasn't normal. Naruto knew that his pains should have already passed, unless he hadn't slept as long as he had thought he would. Opening his eyes Naruto could barely make out the form of their Janin sensei standing over him. The beating he had given them had been completely uncalled for. Where the hell did it come from? Bastard sensei hadn't done this to them last time. Naruto was sure of that. So why? Why had the masked Janin gone on the offensive? There was a groan from beside him as the Uchiha began to wake. His hand lifted from the ground and covered his eyes. What the hell? The Uchiha moaned. No one ever told you that I wouldn't fight back. Their sensei's voice was almost cheerful. Bastard. Had he enjoyed that? Well since all three of you have woken up, congratulations. You managed to actually pass my real test without even trying. Blinking the pain from his eyes, Naruto looked around for Sakura. She was on Sasuke's other side. She had actually managed to sit up. Her hair was a tangled mop almost completely covering her head and shoulders. It was soaking wet. And so was she. When Naruto tried to sit up as well he realized he was wet too. Well that explained why he had woken up. Sensei must have dumped the whole river on them, if the soaking ground were anything to go by. Oi. What do you mean we passed? And why the hell did you kick the shit out of us for? Naruto accused his sensei. The test was never really about the bells. Their sensei explained. It was about the mission to get them, and how you would perform it. If you had all attacked on your own, you never would have gotten close. And if you had fought each other. Letting that statement hang the masked cyclops gave each of them a pointed look. The only way a group of genin has any chance to win against a janin is if they work together and get very lucky. However even that was a test. You were given a mission that would normally have caused you to fight against one another, and in order to see the true test you needed to be able to look underneath the underneath. That was something I thought you would have had trouble figuring out without it being explained, but even a janin can misread someone. Naruto tried to ignore the look Sasuke was giving him. You are all officially genin. Meet back here tomorrow at noon for our first mission. I would suggest spending your free mornings training here together and your afternoons working on individual training in one of the other public training grounds. Pulling out his book their sensei turned on heel and began walking away. His suggestions echoed in Naruto's ears. Last time he had told them to be there at 8 in the morning and then never shown up until noon. Why did he give them a different schedule this time? Why were so many things so different? First he showed up at the academy two hours early, then they had introductions here instead of on the academy roof, and he actually fought during the test, now this. If things like that could change then what else might be different? What else might be changed from what little he could remember of his past life? Naruto, the Uchiha had turned to look directly at him. How did you know about the test? And things just kept changing. Sasuke had just called him by his name. Zero o octal zero after talking his way out of the Uchiha's curiosity, Naruto fled to the training ground behind their own. The circle of pillars. Training ground 17 held all sorts of landscapes and terrain. From the trees in the back to the cliffs on the wall. The river and beach that flowed behind the stone column. The circle of pavement that went around it, separated from the column by a deep trench. The grassy plain in front and the ten training posts where Naruto meditated. All of it was encircled by the hundreds of towering posts that gave the training ground its name. This was where he had agreed to meet his supplemental sensei tomorrow. But that didn't mean he couldn't train here without him did it? Taking his seat on the widest training post Naruto began meditating. He had lost many clones during the test, and he had yet to release the rest of them still out there. Slowly he allowed the chakra of his copies to re-enter him and absorbed with the chakra all the thoughts and feelings that the clones had experienced. He wasn't anywhere near good at reading the feedback. But he was able to get more than he had the first few times he'd done it. A couple clones had been all that was left by the time he finished meditating, and those were the ones he'd assigned to stick around until the training ground was clear so he could reclaim his gear used in the test. His traps had all been cloned tools, but in order to use the shadow projectile as often as he had, 
he had lost a real tool each time. It wouldn't be very long before the other two finally went home, or wherever they were going. Until then Naruto would go over the forms and kata he had learned for his taijutsu. The test had gone great, he had made his impression and earned their respect in a matter of mere hours. As he moved from one stance to the next, the blonde considered his previous concern. Things were changing. As he had meditated a few moments ago, he had gained a clear view of his previous version of the bell test. His sensei had tied him to the training post for trying to eat the lunchboxes. It was a foolish thing to do, and he had been punished for it. And that was when Sasuke and Sakura passed the test, allowing them to become genin. His memories of a certain technique that their sensei used on him brought out a whole new disrespect for the man. However unlike then, this time they had all fought together and his sensei had beaten the living hell out of them for it. What happened to change it? The time displaced teen spent his entire training session trying to figure it out. When the answer finally came to him, he almost had a panic attack. The only things different were things that had been affected by what he did. The thing changing everything was him. It started with his bet. Ebisu sensei had been forced to train him and that was how he got so much better than he was last time around. Next it was his fight with Sasuke before team placement. That must have been what caused Kakashi to change his test. Sasuke hadn't been there so they hadn't introduced themselves. Sakura had been the one to fix him up, if the fact that her name was stamped on the bandage on his lower back said anything. Something she had done had gotten Sasuke to open up during the introductions this morning. And everything else had been him trying to make sure they passed, his traps, his warnings to Sasuke. They had been what got the three of them working together from the beginning and that was why they had passed the way they did. Sensei had only fought back because Sakura had cut him a little. Her surprise attack had surprised all three of them. And the fact that the very tip of her kanai had tasted blood was something Naruto had never thought would ever happen for the girl. Every single thing that he did changed things. And everything could be changed if he didn't try to keep it the way it was. How could he be sure they would get the same missions or even the exam? Naruto was certain nothing he did could stop the exam from happening in the first place, but how could he be sure they were in it? He needed to find a way to make sure things happened as they were supposed to. And then, when he had the chance, he would stop Sasuke from leaving before he made it out of the village gates. Zero O Octal Zero Uchiha Sasuke wasn't fooled by a single one of the excuses Naruto had made. Saying things like, that's just common knowledge, and, everybody knows genin teams are three genin to one janin, didn't explain anything. It was all bullshit. Sasuke had seen several genin squads with only two members and he had witnessed firsthand as several of his clansmen were taken as apprentices. Naruto knew something before the test. There was no doubt in his mind that the blonde had been the one to set up all those traps Sakura was using. It wouldn't surprise him if the boy had somehow been behind her little ambush of their sensei too. Still, Sakura was the only one to have gotten the drop on their sensei. She had actually drawn blood. Even if it was only a tiny splat on the point of her kanai, the blood was still blood of a janin. When he and Sakura had tried to look closer at the traps, they all vanished in a cloud of chakra. The scroll with the map disappeared with them. All that was left were a few kanai and shuriken that Naruto had used in the actual battle with their sensei. A pair of clones quickly swept all of those up. Solid clones. When did Naruto learn to make those? After the beating he had taken the Uchiha had began looking over every memory he had of the dobi, he had thought the dobi had just been holding back a little, but now. His speed and technique from the bell test were leagues above what the proud genin could manage. The taijutsu style he was using was so unfamiliar to the Uchiha. Even their sensei had been taken by surprise. And the sheer amount of these solid clones he had used. If Sakura's understanding of the concept of substantial chakra constructs was right then Naruto had at least a hundred times the amount of chakra Sasuke had. Talking it over with the kunoichi brought the two of them to a single conclusion. Naruto was not a genin. He couldn't be. There was no way the Naruto they had known could have been hiding his abilities so well otherwise. If he had simply been hiding without any true training then he would have slipped up. It was a bizarre conclusion, but they were convinced. He was a spy for the Hokage who had been placed on the team. Once Sakura had confirmed where Naruto lived they had no doubts. No child his age would be allowed to live alone in the red light district. At first Sakura thought that he had been replaced entirely. Like maybe he had been dropped from the program and someone else took his place. But Sasuke was certain that wasn't the case, or his disguise would have been disrupted when their sensei had attacked. 
The pink cat admitted she knew he was the same person too, because she could feel the same body size and shape when she kicked him. If he had been in a henge it would have felt different. It actually made more sense if he had been a plant even back in the academy anyway. Naruto had always been pulling things in class and always got bad grades even when he did the work. It took a little arguing but they soon agreed that the adults did treat him differently than the rest of the students. All of the hushed whispers as he walked by their parents, the glares always sent his way. They had assumed his treatment was because of his behavior. The only one who seemed to like him had been Aruka, and he was the boy's main target most of the time. The Conclusion Naruto, a shinobi who lived in the red light district and was good buddies with their sensei outside of class, who had the ability to completely hide his true skills, which were on par with at least Mizuki sensei, had more chakra than anybody they had heard of, except maybe the Hokage, and routinely evaded the Anbu, was being treated like his very presence was an insult to the other instructors. The only explanation that fit, was that he was a secret agent placed there by the Hokage because of the number of clan-born students in that class. And the other sensei didn't like a full shinobi infiltrating their class. He never did his work because he was always bored from having done it already. Finally, once they had graduated Naruto had been put on their team to protect the Sharingan. Sasuke knew that since that night, he had been placed under guard by the Anbu when he was alone. And since Naruto had been there with them even before then, it meant he wasn't there simply to keep the Sharingan safe. That must have been a new mission. It also explained how he had been made a genin anyway. They had probably expected him to be finished when his mission at the academy was over and that was why he failed, he would have been able to simply drop the act and return from his mission. As skeptical as the two of them were about that final conclusion, the alternative was that Naruto, the goof, had been flawlessly hiding at least chunin level abilities, that surely would have passed him from the academy a long time ago, and that he had been getting punished when he displayed them as part of a village-wide scheme to keep him down for something that he or his family did some time in the past that nobody was allowed to talk about. Shinobi infiltration, or village-wide secret conspiracy against a hyper, super genius, moron as a person. Easy answer in a shinobi village where they all trained to be shinobi. Zero o octal zero morning arrived with Naruto making his lap around the circle of pillars. He wasn't sure why, but last night had been a very strange sleep. It felt like he had been told some huge joke and he couldn't remember it. Whatever it was, his mood had been affected greatly by it. Everything seemed to make him laugh today. It slipped his mind that his shadow clones had only returned with his missing tools after he'd fallen asleep. But the tools were all there in the morning so he repacked them and dressed in his new orange. Today Kakashi would likely take them for their first D rank. But if not, it meant Naruto's slim grasp on the few changes he had made was worse than he thought. Try as he might, Naruto couldn't remember what his first D-rank mission was. All he remembered about it was that Aruka had yelled at him in front of the old man for complaining about it. That wasn't the only time Aruka had yelled at him for it either. Naruto had one more hint at what the big mission was. He had been begging for a new mission and Aruka had been there then too, which meant that it was going to be during a break in the academy. Classes started up again in a week, and they would go on for three months before the next break. That must be when it would happen, during the spring break. Naruto had until then to figure out how to ensure they were on that mission. Otherwise there was a chance that their sensei wouldn't let them take the chunin exam. And that meant that whatever happened in the end would happen differently. He wouldn't get the chance to save the old man. Naruto wasn't sure how he knew the man would die, but he had been so sure the old man had been dead when he first returned he wasn't going to miss the chance to save him. His musings finally came to an end as he sensed movement just outside the training ground. It was Ebisu Sensei. Ah, Naruto. You've already taken a lap this morning? The Janin quickly jogged over to the ten posts. Yeah Sensei. I was going through my keta before grabbing something for breakfast. Straightening his glasses the bandana-browed shinobi considered. How long until you are to meet with your team? Noon. The look Naruto received from Ebisu told him that the Janin hadn't expected it any more than he had. In that case I'll treat you. I know a good place to get tamagoyaki and yakuzakana this early in the day. I guarantee they'll serve you with the utmost respect. Naruto certainly wasn't going to waste this chance. Not only was his sensei going to treat him, but it was at a place he'd never gotten to eat before. Ebisu led him across the village to the market district. As they walked Naruto explained how their bell test had gone. Ebisu had been surprised it had gone so well, 
thankfully he had thought of excuses for Sasuke so he had his newer revised ones to tell his sensei. The man chuckled when Naruto told him about Sakura's tramp stamp of legal possession, and he gaped at the fact that she, out of the three of them, had managed to bleed the janin. Arriving at the restaurant they took seats at a table near the far corner, in a private booth. Naruto had to do a double take when he saw the waitress quickly, but not appearing rushed, heading in their direction. She draped herself over the janin. Her pink kimono spread as one of her legs wrapped around his waist. One of her hands seductively caressing his jawline. Bisu honey, please tell me you haven't forgotten our arrangement. I have not, Mitarashi chan Nature was certain that the closet perv was getting close to passing out as he turned red from her touch. Ah so formal, if you talk like that then people might not get the wrong idea about our relationship. Naruto knew her from somewhere. He was also certain this was not where she belonged. Hey, I thought you were a shinobi. What are ya doing working here? At the genin's question, the familiar woman turned away from her victim and gave a wide feral grin. I'm serving tea to some very important customers, she exclaimed. As she did so she also squeezed his sensei's arm into her generous bust. The blushing adult had explained several instances like this over his education. It was simple security to have a shinobi of their village prepare and serve accommodations for any high-risk visitors. But who could have come to the village at this point in time? The Chunin exams were several months away. The blonde voiced his question. She gave him a sultry look as she answered. Why Naru kun, don't you know that when providing services, her face came very close to his as she spoke into his ear. Every customer is important. Ebisu sensei cleared his throat. Before Naruto knew she had even moved, the seductress had draped herself back over the janin, and was whispering in his ear. His reaction however, was a sudden reduction of blush as his face became stern. Well I did promise Naruto-kun breakfast, the man sighed. Giggling, Mitarashi whoever, bounced off of him. The result drew the man's eyes straight to her chest behind his sunglasses. From the angle his head was turned, Naruto had a bare glimpse of his eyes from the side. Pervert. I'll bring you both plenty to eat. And then maybe I can serve you dessert later tonight. Just. The. Two. Of. Us. As they waited for their food Ebisu pulled out a small square of paper. Let us begin our work on item number five. Your advanced elemental training. Handing Naruto the paper, he instructed the genin on how to use it, resulting in a split cutting all the way through the square. Ah, you are a wind user, fortunately for you that element can be added to many different skills even without jutsu. Such as using it to extend the reach of your blade or kanai and even boosting the speed of your thrown weapons. He was simply restating it. Naruto remembered from many different points of view the lectures on how chakra could enhance shinobi tools. Wind and lightning were the two most kenjutsu type elements, fire could be used to make the blade burn but fire didn't really cut. While water was a good supplement to kenjutsu, it wasn't a direct enhancer. And without certain bloodlines, earth was a purely defensive element when it came to kenjutsu. Unfortunately, the janin continued. There are very few wind users available to instruct or even assist my instruction. I know of several anbu who use it however they cannot be spared, there are only four others in the village who might be able to assist. Ebisu adjusted his glasses as he began his list. The first option is your sensei. Through his dujutsu he has acquired many wind jutsu. In using them he may have gained some understanding of them. Naruto's thoughts on that probably showed on his face, because the lecturing hastened past the copycat. The next is the Hokage himself, his element is not wind however he is quite capable of using it. He is busy, but I can ask for pointers to give you from him, or he might even be able to get some from an anbu for us. That was an idea. How awesome would it be to get training from the Hokage himself. His son however, is a wind type like you, but he currently has his own team to train. The last is an elder of the village who was an extremely skilled wind user. It would be best not to consider him for this though. His time is spent elsewhere. They continued to discuss the issues of training in that element until their food was served. Ebisu sensei would request the pointers from the Hokage, but he could at the very least get him started on the leaf splitting palm. Said Jutsu was the wind type of the first five forms. The instructor had just began explaining the primary scale of steps that could be taken using solely the splitting leaf palm, when she returned. As she served them, she bowed low enough that both males could see she had loosened the sash holding her kimono closed. Ebisu's hand immediately gripped his nose to prevent the coming bleed. With a wink at the pervert, 
The kunoichi stood, turned and walked away. Ebisu's eyes were glued to her retreating form until she vanished around the divider. Shaking himself out of his trance the janin ushered him to eat. The food was amazing. Grilled fish and an omelette with toppings and sides to spare. Naruto had eaten food like this before, but for some reason eating it this time gave him the same feeling of being extra awake as eating at Ichiraku's. As they ate, Ebisu asks about his plans for team training. I don't know. I guess I was just going to wait until Sensei told us his plans. He wasn't sure if Kakashi would even be having them train together. He had told them to train on their own in the mornings, which was different than before. It was entirely possible that the fact they had impressed him was what he had been waiting on last time around. The Janin nodded his head vigorously, his bandana swishing as it moved. Yes, that is a sensible intention. However one must at least have an idea of their goals. What thoughts have you considered about your team training? Well I was kinda thinking I'd just keep training with you or by myself when on my own, and do whatever team training that sensei gave us. The blonde ducked his face into his food when Ebisu gave him a disappointed look. Naruto, you are part of a team now. That means you need to think about more than just making yourself stronger. Increasing their strength will only increase yours in the end. As a small flush of shame entered his face, Naruto told him his thoughts on the janin telling them to work individually in the mornings suggesting that he already had things planned for after the mission. Ebisu sighed. As long as that was their plan, the janin advised him, after Naruto did his lap and Keita they would be able to meet every morning to train. They could even eat out like they were this time if Naruto was doing well. Naruto was about finished with his food as Ebisu pressed the issue of team training. He was adamant that since Naruto could waterwalk and they couldn't, his first course of action should be teaching his teammates to do so as well. Naruto didn't want to lose his advantage against Sasuke, and even more so, he didn't want to change things any further. But it wasn't like he could tell Ebisu about why. So he settled for arguing that he shouldn't have to give up his hard work to someone who would just copy everything. But the Janin chuckled and replied, sharing your training with your teammates is the correct thing to do, it would be abandoning them to do otherwise. Still though, if you do share your training, you don't have to do it for free. Wait. You mean I could make them pay me for the training? Naruto was sure that it wouldn't work. Sakura would think he was trying to get a date and Sasuke wouldn't be able to accept it without hurting his pride. No certainly not. The man quickly rejected Naruto's inquiry. What you can do however, is to trade the training for jutsu. Do remember that the requirement of our bet only includes teaching you the advanced elemental conversion. While it is possible to use wind in an excess of ways without actual jutsu, the Uchiha is certain to have the wind jutsu he could trade. Sasuke would never go for that. He's too proud to give up anything in exchange for getting taught by the Dobi. It sounded like a great idea. Naruto could actually get behind it. But how could he ever get the others to agree to it? Once more his sensei proved to him exactly how little he really knew. That's not a problem at all. Just inform him that an added benefit of the training is that if he manages to learn it, his chakra control should be well past the level at which he would be able to activate his Sharingan. Most Uchiha are able to do so after the tree walking training. I'm sure that if you bait the deal with that, then he'll agree without hesitation. That would definitely work. But Naruto still didn't want to lose his advantage against the Uchiha or change things any worse. But as he no longer had a reasonable argument, the Genin resolved to simply drop the subject. 0 Octal 0 When they met at the training ground for their first mission as a team, Naruto's return to the color orange was as surprising to his team as his first outfit change had been. It seemed they had thought he would be permanently garbed in his Anbu-esque uniform. He explained to them that the Anbu uniform was his formal outfit and he didn't believe this mission would require it. Both Sasuke and Sakura shared a look. At the same time, Kakashi's visible eye narrowed into a squint. There was little talk as they made their way to the mission office. Just as Naruto remembered, Aruka sensei was there. He hadn't paid any attention to the others during the last time that they had learned they would only be doing chores. This time, he watched as their expectant expressions quickly morphed from surprise to defeated groans. His reaction was a little less than the adults had been expecting. He didn't argue or groan like his teammates and so, instead of getting yelled at the way he had before, both of his sensei were staring at him as if he'd loudly passed gas. Again, his teammates looked at each other. He wasn't sure why, but that look made him feel as if he was missing some kind of big joke and felt a ghost of laughter rising in his chest. 
Their first mission was painting a fence. So while their sensei took the scroll, they followed him to the address listed. As they worked Sasuke and Sakura began whispering out of earshot. Naruto considered creating clones to help, but decided against it. If he did create a clone, the construct would be just as distracted as he was. His dilemma over whether or not to teach Sasuke to water walk was beginning to eat away at him. Sure he could teach Sakura, if she'd let him. But then, she would turn around and show Sasuke. And while that might help her to bond with him, Naruto still couldn't think of a way to get her to agree to it. It took the whole mission, but he eventually decided that this time, Sasuke would stay in the village. He could change things right? If he changed things, they wouldn't be what he remembered. But he didn't want Sasuke to be the guy he remembered. So why not? Already his act of revenge had changed the boy's attitude towards him. So why not stop Sasuke from leaving in the first place, instead of trying to make sure he could bring the boy back this time? If he really was the one changing things, then that meant all he had to do was make sure he only changed certain things. Things like what he did around his teammates and friends. Those couldn't have too much effect on the big stuff. And as long as they went on the same big missions and took the Chunin exam things should stay roughly the same right? He could only remember one mission that could change anything before the exam, and that was the foggy mission where he had gained two of his rules. Anything else should be fine to change. This meant that Naruto could do everything he could to stop the Uchiha from leaving. The best way to stop him was to make Sasuke want to stay. To do that, the blonde needed to rebuild his bonds with Sasuke and make them even stronger than the last time. Which meant he had to forget his anger at the boy for what his other self had done. He needed to stop thinking of him as the guy who abandoned them, who killed him in the Valley of the Ends. Naruto need to forgive and forget that Sasuke. This new Sasuke couldn't be, Sasuke Teme. He was a different person. He would become a different Sasuke. Naruto had come to his decision. In order for this Sasuke to become different, he had to treat him different. His actions were what changed things, so if he changed the way he acted towards Sasuke then it should change what the boy felt. To that end, his rival and one-time friend was no longer Sasuke Teme, just as Sakura was no longer his Sakura-chan. From that point on, Naruto would fully support Sakura's efforts to gain Sasuke's love. This Sasuke was not the Teme, instead he would be. Uchiha Haim. Sasuke flinched and glared at him for announcing the boy's new nickname. What do you want Naruto? The newly titled princess demanded. You think we could get this knocked out a little faster already? Let's pick up the pace, cuz we're already almost finished and I want to see what kind of training sensei will have for us when we're done. Both of his teammates lit up at his suggestion and they had the rest of the fence painted only a few minutes later. The masked Jonin led the way back to the mission's office with the signed mission report. His pace seemed to have increased the same way theirs had while painting. The Hokage had already left and Aruka sensei was the one handing out the day's payments. After turning in their mission, instead of getting a new mission or being dismissed, Kakashi told them they had five minutes to get to the training ground or they wouldn't get to sleep tonight. After he had made good on his words about throwing their breakfast up, all three of them bolted out of the office. Their arrival at the training ground was punctuated by a ringing timer. Naruto had ended up dragging Sakura along by her arm when she began to fall behind. Of course because she couldn't keep up, he hadn't been able to run at his full speed. He would have just picked her up, but he was certain she would have hit him for trying to carry her. As it was they had only just made it. Their sensei was already there sitting on the memorial stone and reading. As the timer rang he slipped his book in his vest and addressed them. Okay boys, you two are going to spar while Sakura is going to fix her endurance problem. He announced. Then looking at the kunoichi he continued, Sakura, you're going to tag the monument and then run back to the office and tag my clone. We will both be counting so you should get started, you have until nightfall to make a hundred laps. With a gasp of despair, Sakura deflated and ran over to the hero's stone. Then she began her way back to the mission's office. Zero o octal zero as Kakashi thought, Naruto was holding back again. The genin wasn't moving anything like he had been in the bell test. It was as if he wasn't even channeling his chakra at all. The genin was sparing solely with his body's own speed. Naruto. Why are you holding back? Without missing a movement the boy responded, so Sasuke can keep up. The Uchiha balked at that, but then his eyes flared and he pressed harder. Forcing Naruto to dodge and weave away before continuing. He won't get stronger if he doesn't at least stand a chance of beating me. At this speed he has to work for it, but it's still possible. 
and that means that he will work for it, as hard as he can if necessary. Kakashi hadn't expected that answer. It was too matured, and more, the Jonin had thought that Naruto would be wanting to show off. But instead the boy was focused on helping Sasuke improve. They continued to spar like that until Sakura had finished her laps. Their wordless clashes becoming less and less even as time wore on. Naruto appeared to still be fresh after their hours of contact. By the time the Pinket returned from her final lap Sasuke had become thoroughly exhausted. The moment Sakura tagged the monument the last time, Kakashi announced that he expected all three of them here the next day at noon. Then he vanished in a swirl of leaves. Picking himself off the ground Sasuke gathered his things and began trudging towards the Uchiha district. Uchiha Haim. Naruto called out before Sasuke had gotten too far. Hey, you should ask Sakura if she wants to eat dinner with us. Sasuke had been slightly stunned by the continued use of his new nickname, and the fact that Naruto had basically implied that they were going regardless and mindlessly complied. Sakura's mouth hung open as she began to blush. Hastily agreeing she rushed to catch up with them. After eating at that the last place with Ebisu Sensei had gone so well, Naruto decided to let the other two pick their dining. Which meant that when Sakura saw Ino, they had no choice but to go to the Yakuniku shop where Team 10 was dining. Naruto had been intending to start bargaining with them over the training during the meal. However since they were dining with Team 10, the male blonde tried his best to simply be the happy kid he had been when he first graduated last time around. Sasuke naturally sat in an open seat causing Sakura and Ino to get into their usual argument about who would sit next to him. With a raised eyebrow, Shikamaru stated that Sakura's name was already on him. He left his statement hanging when Ino glared vengeance at him. Sorry ladies, but Uchiha Haim requires a proper dining environment as such me and Choji will be sitting beside him. The tubby boy looked at him in shock, when Naruto simply picked up Sasuke's chair interrupting the boy's search for the written name as he had to hold on to keep from falling off, and moved it to the other side of the table, taking the seat on the other side of it from the larger boy. As soon as Ino heard the name he had called Sasuke, she grinned, Haim ha. Huh. Well that explains some things. Naruto didn't know what she meant, but a tremendous sense of overwhelming doom settled on his shoulders. As they ate she told them about how her dad was busy making house calls for some sort of food poisoning epidemic. From what she had eavesdropped there was a single person involved with all of the shops affected and she thought they were trying to find out who had been the one to poison them all. Shikamaru told them about their sensei and what all they did for their test and then Naruto and Sakura regaled them with stories of their own bell test. Zero o octal zero that night was restless. Naruto had eaten too much trying to keep up with Choji, Ino's random comments still made Naruto feel like he'd done something horribly wrong and he still hadn't been able to start changing Sasuke yet either. Although he was certain that the boy's stuck-up attitude had been a little better while they ate. The Uchiha had actually told Shikamaru about their sensei and agreed to play a game of shogi later that week. Through most of the night Naruto spent his time awake going over everything he could think of to help change his friend. He even rehearsed his plot to trade Sasuke's jutsu for water walking and how it would help him unlock his dojutsu. The genin tried to remember the last time Sasuke had unlocked his eyes, but instead all he could remember was the Uchiha dying, and the color red. Dot and anger. Rage. Well, he knew that hadn't been the way it went or Sasuke Teme wouldn't have been able to kill him. So for now it did nothing to help Uchiha Haim unlocking his eyes. There was something else, he wasn't sure what it was though. It had something to do with the mask, and the mirrors, and maybe a girl? Thinking about that mission made his chest hurt but he didn't understand, who was that girl, why was she so important, he had flipped through his bingo book, but outside of a few pictures he thought he recognized, only Sasuke's brother stood out in his memories, he was certain that the fish dude that was with the clan killer was Hoshigaki Kisame, but Naruto had no idea where he had even seen the two of them together. He could remember something about boobs and a toad, and the perverted shinobi, but that had nothing to do with the mission that he was trying to remember right now. That mission with the words of his past, and the deep-seated feeling that he had made a mistake carried him off into a fitful sleep. Zero o octal zero the next morning Naruto finished his laps and did his keita with a weary slump. Once done, he left a clone at the training ground to let Ebisu know where he was going. He was going to talk to Sasuke about the training and once he had taught it to Sasuke, the Uchiha could teach it to Sakura. The clone would explain his ideas to the man and get whatever instructions he had for Naruto to do for the day. 
then the clone would come to Naruto and tell him about them directly to ensure nothing was lost in the feedback. It only took a few minutes to find Sasuke. He was already up and training in the Uchiha training fields. His body no longer wrapped in the bandages that he had worn the previous two days. Making a clone to tell his other clone where to find them Naruto announced his presence. Yo. Uchiha Haim. I got some training plans I want to talk to you about. The Uchiha immediately stopped his agility motions and trotted over to the edge of the field to glare at Naruto. Did you know about the tag? The Uchiha's borderline accusation was laced with venom. It wasn't really safe for my health to say anything. Naruto grinned sheepishly and rubbed the back of his head. He was ready to bolt if Sasuke retaliated. We both know Sakura has been looking for a reason to hit me and I didn't really want to give her any now that we're genin. The taller boy almost flinched. Not fully but more than just a blink. His downcast expression lost the heat of wrath from only a second ago. What kind of training did you have in mind? So the Uchiha had been changing already. He hadn't said anything about Naruto being the dobi or even sneered at him. Sasuke had simply asked what he had in mind. Well I know a pretty cool chakra control exercise that I can show you. I'm told that most Uchiha unlocked their Sharingan during this training, and since you haven't yet, I was thinking you might be willing to trade for it. At the mention of his clan's dojutsu, Sasuke's eyes narrowed. What would you know about the Sharingan? Other than that you, Sensei and your brother are the last who have it. The basics. Sasuke was clearly surprised about something he had said. Naruto thought he heard him mumble the word, Sensei, but that didn't make any sense. The dojutsu of the Uchiha clan, he continued. It is capable of providing the user with a time dilated point of view, allowing faster reaction speed, a higher level of detail oriented perception and it also much like the Byakugan gives the user the ability to actually see chakra and chakra networks, thus granting the autonomous copying of any motion or jutsu performed by those being observed. It is primarily a reaction based tool, however it is also an effective genjutsu instrument and can easily cast or break most genjutsu with little skill or effort required from the user. By the time he had completed his textbook description of the Sharingan as Ebisu Sensei had explained it, the Uchiha's jaw had dropped just like Sakura's had been doing lately. Snapping his fingers to get the boy's attention the blonde grinned widely, it looked like he had convinced his teammate already. I can give you the training that I offered or you can wait until Sensei gets around to it, but if you want to go on higher rank missions sooner, then we can't just sit back and wait for them. If you agree to trade training I will expect you to share this training with Sakura. She probably wouldn't want to do anything I suggest but I'm willing to bet she could get the training down faster than you do. How much? The Uchiha cut right to the point. Any wind jutsu you have. Not the training. Sasuke shook his head with a small smile. How much are you willing to bet that she can finish this training faster than me? Oh. A matter of his pride. It was unintended but perfect. Well how about if she does, you have to ask her on a date and you have to tell her that she'll get the date if she does before you start teaching it to her. And if I lose, I'll let you copy some of my jutsu. That was perfect. Not only did he help Sakura out, but now Sasuke was more motivated than ever. Deal. The Uchiha agreed without hesitation, obviously thinking about getting his hands on the Shadow Clone. What is this training? Yuna. Not yet Haim. First, Naruto wagged his finger at him. My price. I'm a wind type and there are no wind users available to teach me any jutsu of that element. I'm sure your clan has at least a few wind type jutsu written down right? Well, if I teach you, then I need a wind jutsu or two in exchange. Sasuke thought about it, his face expressed a deep conflict. Then he brightened, do I get to copy any jutsu I give you when you finish them? Only once Sensei says that I'm doing them effectively, with my levels of chakra I tend to waste a lot and we don't want you copying me if I'm too sloppy. That was the main reason he had axed Ebisu for the four jutsu he had. Because his past encounter with the man had explained how he wasted too much chakra. The Uchiha agreed once more. They had a bargain. Zero o octal zero. The deal was set. And what a deal it was. Whatever rank the fake really was had become irrelevant the moment Sasuke was convinced that Naruto could help him unlock his Sharingan. Note to self, the Uchiha thought, find out what the fake was talking about when he said our sensei had the Sharingan. If the orange-colored genin was right about the training, the Sasuke would have gladly paid any of his jutsu for it. Once he unlocked his dujutsu he could simply duplicate any of the jutsu he saw. Besides that, 
because Naruto had agreed to let him copy the jutsu he gave him, he would even be getting extra training in using his dujutsu afterwards. What was a few wind jutsu compared to that? When he agreed to the final deal he was told he had to pay up front so that Naruto could be training on the jutsu while he trained. So the Uchiha rushed into the Uchiha compound. He made his way towards the collection of jutsu he had gathered from the empty houses. The Uchiha had a jutsu library. However with them gone, it had been transcripted by the bank with all the other major valuables of the clan. He had access to it whenever he wanted, but it couldn't just be left in the empty compound. Still he had found many hastily written jutsu scrolls and notes throughout the compound as he took inventory. The entire compound had been inventoried within the year. The majority of the houses had been emptied of anything that wasn't decor and furnishings. All the tools, cloths, foods, toys, papers, and anything else they had found had been sifted through. Cash and valuables went to the bank with the library. All food items were donated away. He had needed to make choices on almost all of the rest of the items found. Most he had simply put off, by sending them to the bank vault. He had all the clothing found sorted and placed in storage. Several items had simply been donated, but the majority of them bore the clan symbol. He had given most of the toys to the local orphanage, along with any of the children's clothes that didn't have the clan emblem on them. As repayment for that kindness, the Hokage had waived all fees for the upkeep of the clan until he became a shinobi the other day. He had all tools stored in a single location, basically the military police armory had been boosted by any other tool that could be useful. The documents however had been sorted out before being given to him for allocation. Many had been from the military police, which were confiscated as village security files. Others had been sent to the bank as valuable assets and financials, the rest had been given to him for sorting. There were journals and letters and autobiographies, there were even a few half-written novels. He had thrown out all the attempts to recreate the Icha Icha series without even looking at them. Mostly though he had sorted out the jutsu kept by individuals. Most of the jutsu he had found had been added to the library, but if the jutsu was already there then he added it to his collection. His sorting of these had been just as meticulous as the sorting of the library had been. He easily found three wind jutsu that would work. He had more than a few in the library but only seven in his collection. Picking the lowest rank of each type of wind jutsu, impact, blast, and cutting, he headed back out. To where Naruto was speaking with his clone who vanished in a cloud of chakra before the Uchiha got in hearing range of their conversation. Zero o octal zero after explaining the various steps of the chakra walking training methods to the shadow clone, Ebisu decided to spend the day with his original charge. Not all shinobi could just power through the training. The correct method of learning was a series of broken down steps, from geta walking, in which one wears a pair of strapless clogs, to water walking was a vast number of steps, and it all began with picking up a leaf on the back of one's hand. Once he wrote all the step on a scroll he gave it to the clone to deliver to the original and told the clone that he expected the original to master all of the steps as well. Each step helped to refine the process and could very well increase his control proportionally. Charging out behind the clone Ebisu headed off the Hokage's night nurse, who would be dropping Konohamaru off at Gemna's. Today, Ebisu would see how quickly Konohamaru could pass each of the steps. He began by having the boy float a leaf on his forehead for 10 minutes. Unlike all the times he had told the boy to do it before, Konohamaru didn't complain once. Then he asked the child to try picking one up with the back of his hand. It took about 20 minutes before he could pick it up and hold it. So he moved on to the same task with the foot. As the Jonin watched Konohamaru's improvement he couldn't help but acknowledge the effect Naruto had on the boy. Nothing he had ever said to the child had gotten this much effort out of him. By the time they broke for lunch, Konohamaru was able to walk with the geta on his feet. After that they would begin walking up increasing inclines until it was time to move to the stone wall. The last step before tree walking. Naturally Konohamaru wouldn't be able to get that far as quickly as he had come this far, it required much more chakra capacity than the child had, but it was a great progress. The last three days the Jonin had gotten the vessel caught up in most of the academy lessons. There was very little left for them to cover that applied to practical use. The rest of it was simply history and politics. They would cover maps more as they continued but yesterday's work on geography had been quite successful. It was time for him to work on the bet. He had already started Naruto on item 3. The Taijutsu. He had taught the boy every basic kata for all the styles he knew. He focused heavily on defense. 
But that would always be a work in progress. With the Uchiha on his team, Naruto had only six months to get most of it down, but that would have to be enough. Item 5. The wind element would also take time. It was likely that even with the shadow clone jutsu, they wouldn't finish it before the exams. In working on it he could also help Naruto with the wind jutsu he received from the Uchiha. He would locate the other four jutsu and teach them to the boy once he had finished learning at least one of those. Once the boy had gone through each step of the true chakra walking training, he would start Naruto out on his first idea towards item 4. The Kaiden. He would have to either find someone willing to teach it to him, or arrange for them to teach it to Naruto. It was even possible that he may be able to reverse engineer it to create a jutsu of the same effect. His work on item 10 was mostly complete. Naruto knew how to get and maintain shinobi tools. All that was left for that was teaching him about the processes of making the tags in the bingo book, and making good on his extra promise of explosive cloned tools. Items 1 and 2 however, would not happen until after the exam. That was certain. From the progress Naruto had displayed already Ebisu was sure that those two would be the only things he had left in the bet by the end of the next year. Reflecting over his past assumptions, he was astounded to find his opinion of the child so greatly changed. When this had began he was certain it would take years to teach him everything. Now he was actually planning for most of them in a period of six months. The scrolls Sasuke had given him were obviously copied from the Uchiha library by different people. Which meant Uchihaheim had kept all the notes and such about jutsu from his clansmen. The three scrolls each held a jutsu, and the author's notes on learning them. All three were C rank ninjutsu, one of each type of wind jutsu. The air bullet was an impact type. It compressed air into a ball and sent it to impact with whatever you aimed it at. It was also one of the frequently flying five, alongside the dragon, water, and mud bullets in the lightning fang. The vacuum palm was a blast type creating a current of air that would blow the target away. It was one of the advanced affinity few alongside the fireball, waterflow spout, filling the glove jutsu, and the static palm which was more commonly called the shocking grasp. Each of these were the jutsu used when teaching shinobi to fully convert their chakra into the element of their affinity. The final scroll held the cutting breeze. It was a more advanced cutting type than the cutting palm jutsu, which Ebisu had mentioned when covering the traveling ten. The cutting palm was used to cut minor things like rope or bark or grass. Next in the traveling ten was the moisture spout which basically created condensation in an area to gather water from the air itself. Then there was the air shift, using chakra to push air into motion which blows away smoke and scents. After that was the friction thumb spark which created a minor spark of flame used for lighting fires in the static pinch which gathered static buildup in the air and could produce light. The soil shift, slightly shifted loose soil softening the ground for sleep or for digging a fire pit. Increasing this skill allowed the user to perform the soil subshift that extends downwards to dispose of waste. The earth shift was larger still, and could move large amounts of earth for making fire pits, trenches, or shelters without actually digging. The final jutsu in the traveling ten was the casting veil, an area-wide henge that disguises your camp as what it was before you began setting up. It could also be used for many other disguises but that was the use that got it into the traveling ten. The tenth skill was not a jutsu but instead it was the use of sealing scrolls to pack, carry and unpack all your things. Naruto would have to learn the cutting palm by working downwards from the cutting breeze it seemed. The three selected jutsu would more than get him started learning to use his element. Uchihaheim had chosen well. Tucking the scrolls into his pocket. Naruto walked to the closest tree and snatched two leaves down from it. He knew that Sasuke could hold a leaf to his forehead. The genius had done it often enough in the academy, so Naruto passed over that one. They would begin with holding a leaf to the back of each of their hands. As he described the first step, he reminded Sasuke that he would have to teach each step to Sakura, so he needed to pay attention to how they were explained as well. Attaching the leaves to his own hands, Naruto did the first few of the basic stretches he had learned from Ebisu. When the Uchiha Genin mirrored his actions without losing his leaves, Naruto moved on to the next step. He stood on one leg and used his foot to pick a leaf up and move it over, then released it and repeated the motions with his other foot. It took Sasuke several tries to pick up the leaf with his foot, but once he had that, moving it and releasing was easy. Naruto had him repeat it twenty times, instructing the other genin to have Sakura repeat it the same number as well. By the time they finished to this point, his clone had returned with the strapless Geta. 
Three pairs, one in each of their sizes. Naruto gave Sasuke his and Sakura's, and waited as the older boy quickly put the kunoichis away. Naruto didn't have much difficulty attaching his feet to the geta. However when he picked his foot up, he released as he would when taking a step up a wall. Giving a nervous chuckle, he repeated his step. With Sasuke following him, Naruto began a lap around the Uchiha compound. Every so often, one of Sasuke's geta would come off, and the instructing genin would make them return to the gate and start over. He told the Uchiha that he needed to make ten laps around the compound on the geta, without allowing them to slip off before he could continue. As Naruto understood it, this was meant to build up both the chakra capacity required, as well as the leg muscles being used to hold one's body upright. They spent most of the morning working on those laps. Unfortunately, they ran out of time before Sasuke could make all ten. So they headed to the mission's office to meet their team. Zero O Octal Zero waving at his other teammate, Sasuke followed Naruto into the mission's office. Sakura was waiting there already. And much to Naruto's apparent surprise so was Kakashi Sensei. The fake's questioning of the man's presence so early, received the answer that the Janin was hurt by his student's low opinion, and then the one-eyed shinobi pulled out that book and flipped to somewhere in the middle. Turning to the kunoichi, Sasuke began whispering to her about his new training. After she heard what he was describing, Sakura whispered back. Do you remember where Sensei was when you used the grand fireball jutsu? Yes, he was standing on top of the water. The Uchiha understood where she was going, do you think that's what Naruto's teaching me? It's at least a chunin level skill for sure. I mean, I haven't even heard of it until our test, and if one of our academy sensei could do it, don't you think we'd have at least heard something? Which brought question. Where did Naruto learn it then? Sakura was deep in thought trying to find an answer when their team was called for mission selection. Deciding to tell her about the bet later, Sasuke resolved to discover the truth. Zero O Octal Zero The days of that week passed much the same. Naruto sent a clone to his lessons with Ebisu who finally covered all the lectures he had planned and moved on to tactics exercises in which he would ask the clones how they would do one thing or another based on the situation. Naruto would have to go off by himself and meditate before lunch, but that was a simple matter. This way was the only sure method of reading the feedback without missing anything. After their mission they would race back to the training ground and Kakashi would set Naruto and Sasuke sparing while he gave Sakura her task. Each time it was something to do with building endurance. The first training session had been the laps, but the second one was climbing a rope. When she made it to the top she had to come down with a ribbon their sensei had placed. She had to get all of the ribbons down, before she would be finished. Elbowing Sasuke when Sakura slipped and almost quit, brought the boy to encourage her. The next day Sensei had her dodge as he threw small pebbles at her. He only stopped when Naruto stepped in. Sakura had been hit several times by that point. She had a nasty looking gash on her cheek and she wasn't able to stand on one of her ankles. So Kakashi gave her the day after that off. Only to try repeating the cycle when she came back the next day. Which luckily for her was interrupted by Sasuke's own training injuries. Sasuke had finished his 10 laps on the second morning of their private training and so they headed over to the hill Ebisu Sensei had described to him. It was steep, but not vertical. So when they climbed up it, if Sasuke was going to fall he could just lean forwards and catch himself. As Naruto knew from his memories of learning it last time, running gave them the momentum they needed to get to the top in one shot. This clashed with his instructions of taking it one step at a time. And when his clone had axe, Ebisu told him to start with the run to get the Uchiha used to the climb, but don't move on until he could do it with deliberate steps. He had that down the same day. And so they agreed to start at the wall the next morning. He finished both the wall and walking up the tree in only a matter of hours. It seemed that the earlier steps had helped much more than Naruto thought. At the time they only had about an hour left before they had to leave but Sasuke was on the clock here so Naruto took him over to his family's dock on the Uchiha lake. He laid flat on the dock with his chest and arms hanging over. Placing both hands on the water Naruto tried to duplicate the method he used with his feet. It only took him a few minutes but Sasuke needed the entire hour to be able to hold himself up. The goal there was to perform on 100 push-ups off the face of the water. Sasuke was so close. Agreeing to skip lunch for this was one thing you didn't do when you could make clone go get your food. So while they waited on the food to arrive Sasuke extended himself so that only his feet were on the wooden dock, while the rest of him hung over the water. 
His hundred push-ups had to be slow or his body's momentum would unbalance him, but he had them done before the hour was up. Sasuke had completed the water walking training the next day. It had only taken four days for the Uchiha to learn how to water walk. And now that he had, he needed to unlock his Sharingan as they had agreed. The only way Naruto could think of to do that was to do the leaf exercise on his forehead while on the water. When that didn't do the trick, Naruto sat right there on top of the water to meditate and force himself to remember how the last Uchiha had unlocked his Dujutsu last time. He knew that the tree walking training had been during that mission, but he couldn't seem to pull anything new up. All he could remember was a great sorrow and rage at the Uchiha's death. So instead of focusing on his Sharingan, Naruto decided to try it from the other angle. The tree walking training. He focused on Sasuke as the boy climbed up the tree beside him, he would keep pace with his rival step for step. But it didn't seem enough. He had stayed out after Sasuke headed back and he fell asleep. Breathing deeply Naruto tried to remember waking up. And a face flashed in his eyes, the girl. She was so cute. But Naruto could also feel this sense of despair. He didn't understand how he knew, he couldn't even remember it actually happening, but Naruto was sure he had watched her die. It was brief, but he could almost see her running. Towards something or away from something he wasn't sure, but that proved to be the key. He could remember thinking that she was too fast. Opening his eyes, Naruto leapt up in triumph, he knew what they needed to do. Looking over at his teammate who was still standing on the water with a leaf attached to his face, Naruto reached down into the cool lake and picked up a rock. Zero o octal zero it was time for him to start teaching Sakura. As per the bet, Sasuke told her that he would agree to go on a date with her only if she could learn the skill in three days. Their sensei had given her the day off again today. He had wanted to make her run laps again but when he saw all the wounds Sasuke had received from Naruto, again, the Jonin relented and had her tend his injuries. At the same time he told Naruto, they were going to spar and both of them vanished, leaving the two real genin to themselves. Even with his Sharingan activated, Sasuke had missed their movements as they rushed from the mission's office towards the training ground, of course, there was the possibility that they had just been clones dispelling, since it seemed both of them did that now. From what Naruto had taught him, the Uchiha benefited greatly. Once he figured out how to channel chakra into his eyes he learned that Naruto was channeling it into his muscles. Sasuke didn't even need to copy that, to figure out how to do it himself. And that led him to a new possibility for Naruto's improvements. His chakra capacity was enormous. And if Sasuke could increase his own speed by putting chakra into his body, then so could Naruto, and he had more than enough chakra to explain the sudden increase in speed. But as Sakura said, that still didn't account for his improved intelligence. It only explained how he could so easily hide his speed which was probably the same thing all advanced shinobi did. So he dropped the matter and told her about the deal, not mentioning that fact that the offered date was part of a bet, as per their agreement. The Pinkette was excited and determined to win her date. Sasuke told her the deadline was three days. It had taken him four, and he doubted she would be able to match him, but deep down he worried. He had been wrong before, and Naruto, the fake genin, had bet that she would be able to do it, so what did he know? Zero o octal zero one arm pulled up, as the other reached higher. Sakura hung at least half a kilometer up. This rope she was climbing was connected to a tree at the top of a cliff, she had been told to climb down and bring 100 large rocks back up. That wasn't as hard as it sounded now that she could channel chakra into each fiber of her muscles, and she had been so smug as she awaited her chance to show his sensei what she could do. She had half planned to simply walk down the cliff without the rope, but her sensei seemed to be a step ahead of her. He instructed her that the rocks had to be brought up two at a time. One on the bottom of each foot. Even so, Sakura couldn't stay down about the training, no matter how exhausting it was, she would meet it with joy. She was going on a date tomorrow. Her inner self was completely occupied with what she would wear and how she would rub it in Inobunta's face. The afternoon she'd had off so she could tend to Sasuke's wounds and been wonderful. First, he had her attach a leaf to her hand and move through a few basic stretches. They were similar to the ones they had learned at the academy but they were more specific. She didn't even feel the effort of the leaf as she memorized the stretches Sasuke was showing her. The twenty leg swings were slightly worse. Her ankle was still paining her. When he told her about the next step she asked to do the laps the next morning. She needed to soak her leg and wrap it for the run. That had taken the longest out of all the steps in the process 
but she had gotten through them without needing to restart even once. Sasuke admitted he had needed to restart many times, and because of that, it had taken him more than one day. The rest of the exercises all the way up to the water push-ups were simple for her to master in an hour. The walk up the hill, was once up and then down, the climb up the wall was the same, and she didn't even leave a mark on the tree. If not for the fact she had to do 50 of the on the water push-ups, she would have finished them all that morning. She had to wait until after her second set of laps assigned by their sensei before she could wearily take on the challenge of walking across the water. However, before she went home on that second day, she had learned to water walk. With a groan about making Naruto suffer, Sasuke dropped to his butt and put his head in his hands. Not exactly the response she had wanted, but he eventually asked what she wished to do for their date. Sakura wanted to go off and shout her victory to Ino. She wanted to sing in joy, but she had been too sore to do anything. So she went to bed. Keeping Sasuke's comment about eating in mind, the next morning she decided she had burned enough food, she could splurge a little, and devoured the food her mother had cooked for breakfast. Shamefully, she had eaten every last scrap she'd been given. And then, in her gluteny, she'd asked for more. Sakura didn't know what had come over her, but she had eaten until her belly was distended. She felt devastated. How was she ever going to fit into the outfit her inner self wanted to wear? Seeing her distress, both her parents began laughing. But their answer to her plight was simple, and she would already be stuck doing it. She had to burn it all off. Train until her body was thin again. And so, Sakura pulled herself one more arm length up the rope. Below her, hung a pair of large stones attached to the bottom of her sandals with chakra. She couldn't wait to tell Ino. She had a date. Zero o octal zero. Uchiha Haim had actually been nervous about his date with Sakura. Naruto half thought that the boy would simply be the cool and uncaring rookie he had always been. It was actually kind of cute to see him primping himself up for the date. Every so often he would shoot a glare at Naruto as they did their mission at a rushed pace the way they always did. Naruto could remember how last time around, they used to drag it out, lazily performing their task with as little effort as it took. Perhaps that was why Sensei was actually training them this time around. Naruto had been urging them to finish their missions quickly so they could get to training, and they never spent much time on the mission at all. Once it was finished, Naruto and Sasuke squared off for their daily spar. Now for what happened next, it needs to understood that Naruto hadn't been ready, he didn't mean to do it, he hadn't wanted to ruin their date, but, it happened anyway. For the last few days, while Sasuke had been training Sakura, Naruto had returned to Ebisu's care. The man had restarted his training by going over all of their taijutsu together and then having a light spar. They had moved on to having another round of clone dodging. When Naruto had done well with that, and had avoided most of the injuries, Ebisu gave him permission to parry attacks. They covered redirecting and maneuvering attacks for a few hours and the next day he set some clones on him once more. His movements had to be ingrained, and so they did this for a few hours as well. The day after that, he was taught how to directly block a strike and which strikes to block. This had been the morning before Sakura told him she had done it. Not that he doubted her. And so, the morning before the date arrived, and Naruto had been given a final clone defense challenge. Learning to counter attack. Sadly this took far more clones and much more time. But by the time he headed out for his mission, every fiber of his body knew how to maneuver an enemy's attack away and hit back as hard as he could. So when their sensei said that instead of dodging practice, Sakura would be sparring with Naruto today, the boy wasn't ready. Throughout the week and a half that they had been sparring, Sasuke had been getting faster and stronger. Naruto didn't use his chakra to spar with him, but it was still a hard spar for the boy. He only barely managed to not get hit most of the time. Sakura wasn't that good. When the pinket attacked with the kind of punch she used back in the academy, Naruto reacted with instinct. His left hand quickly swept her incoming left hook to the side, and placing his right hand on her elbow, he hyperextended it until there was a snap and then as his left hand pulled her in closer, his right hand flicked forward into a fist that impacted her square in the face. The three swift motions flowed from him almost instantly, and were over before any of them realized what had happened. The punch gave out a crunching sound and Sakura flew backwards. As she hit the ground, she began to shriek. She seemed unsure whether to grab her broken arm or her gushing face. Sasuke was at her side in the blink of an eye. Naruto however, could only stand there, eyes wide, and paralyzed in shock at what he'd done. 
Kakashi Sensei didn't say a word, he simply tapped his foot waiting for them to continue the spar. Gaining his sense of time back, Naruto rushed over to see if she was okay. And to beg for forgiveness. It had been an accident. Honest. He hadn't thought she'd jump into the punch. Sasuke looked at him as if he were crazy. But admitted, he also didn't think she would try attacking with a straight hook against an opponent of his level. Finally getting bored, the Jonin gave his input. Um. Are you two going to keep going or is one of you giving up? At that, Naruto bolted up angrily and shouted at him. You lazy azishol. She's hurt. Shouldn't she go to the hospital? And besides that, shouldn't a Jonin have been able to see that she wasn't dodging and done something? The Jonin simply shrugged. Well the match is still going and since neither of you have won or quit, leaving would be a forfeit. Pulling herself up, Sakura shot an angry glare at their sensei, and threw herself at Naruto with as much hate as she could dredge up. Unfortunately for her, she had done this while the orange genin was still facing the other way. And he reacted once more, on instinct. Zero o octal zero it had been a month since Team 7 had been formed, and Naruto still hadn't found a way to ensure they were placed on that mission. He had done what he could towards helping his teammates get stronger, and he knew that there were at least two more months until the break in which Aruka would be assigned to help in the mission's office once more. But what if the mission was requested before then? After all of his meditation, Naruto had only recalled a few more hints at what had happened during that mission. He could remember sitting on a boat as it passed under an unfinished massive bridge, and he could remember the man who had requested it. The drunken old man hadn't been in the village yet. Naruto had clones watching for him, but he didn't know what to do if he ever saw him. Silently, Naruto finished his morning jog. He was no longer needing to catch his breath, and he had finished the run in only 28 minutes. That meant it was time for him to do another lap, which was fine with him. His morning runs had become the part of day he dedicated towards his past. Whatever. Outside of that mission Naruto had also remembered a few more things about his life before he died. One was that Shikamaru had made Chunin. Naruto wasn't sure how or why, but it was a clean memory. So far he had been able to remember few clearly, starting with his graduation and the bell test, and then he remembered the actual mission assignments they had received during that first week. After that the missions became a blur as he must have simply glossed over them while focusing on his training outside of the missions. He remembered the day Kakashi Sensei gave them their applications for the Chunin exam. He didn't remember much about the exam itself, except that he had made it to the finals and Hayuga Neji had done something to piss him off. Then there was the feeling of dread. The same one he felt for the cute girl from the blurry mission. He knew the old man was going to die during the finals. Was it a heart attack, or did he fall off the balcony? As much as Naruto wondered what happened, he didn't know. It was possible he had only found out afterwards. If the opponent he got after his victory against Neji had beaten him, then he might have been knocked out before the old man died. Of course there was also the month in the middle of the exam, when he met the Toad Sage. Odd as it was, Naruto was certain the guy had been standing on a frog statue behind the women's bath. While Naruto completely believed that that would be where the guy was, it was harder to think anyone would build a statue like that and be dumb enough to put it there. Still, he had sent a clone to check every now and then, to see when the frog statue would appear. He had also figured out why the guy was so awesome, because he was the man who had trained the Yandaimi. He was also the one who wrote Kaka Sensei's pervy books, but that didn't really matter to Naruto. What did matter was that the Genin could remember going with him to find the next Hokage, and then something about large boobs, but knowing Aero Senin, that would have little to do with anything he needed to remember. So Naruto passed over the memory there, in lieu of the memory of Sakura weeping at the village gate. The mission to return Sasuke to the village was an ever-present image in the back of his mind. He could still feel the crushing weight of his own blood in his throat. Other than the image of Sasuke's brother which he couldn't place along the memory timeline, that was all he had. He could clearly remember almost everything about Ebisu Sensei, but that was clear to him since he met the guy. Ebisu Sensei was almost nothing like what he remembered. He was calm, and patient and actually wanted to help. Vaguely Naruto wondered why Konohamaru didn't get the same treatment. But his mind was really focused more on the fact that Ebisu seemed to have changed almost overnight, or over day as it were. Naruto was almost certain the change had happened on that first day when he had done the clone lecture. Since then Ebisu had begun training Naruto in almost everything. He had began Naruto's clones working on cutting the leaf, 
and they had almost completed his taijutsu training. Naruto's mixture of his old style and what Ebisu taught him, turned out to make his randomly perfect motions mixed into the haphazard and often unbelievably crude motions an effective countermeasure against almost every style Ebisu could use. Naruto got the feeling that the man was more frustrated by his accidental style's effectiveness than the fact he was getting beaten. While Naruto sparred with his sensei, the clones worked. Not all of them had been assigned to the leaf. Others had been given stones they were told to hold small stones on certain parts of their bodies as they ran against the current on top of a river. The idea was to get him used to channeling chakra out of every part of his body while still being able to move. It also helped to increase his chakra control to a level at which he would be able to perform the jutsu they were working on. They began by trying to have him spin on the river while holding leaves to his skin. That didn't work for a variety of reasons. First he blasted the leaves off, so they tried stones instead. While that helped, Naruto still ended up going down the river. So putting the spin on hold they simply made him run against the flow of the river while holding the stones. They could build from there. When Ebisu asked why not try the spin on the ground, Naruto stubbornly argued that he didn't want to leave any marks on the ground from his learning the spin. The Jonin didn't understand why it had to be hidden, but he accepted it after only a mild dispute. The clones set to split the leaf eventually managed to cut it. All the way through. Thanks to Asuma Sensei's suggestions. The elder man had explained wind manipulation to a fine point when Ebisu Sensei had axe. The two Jonin had discussed it for hours it seemed. At least, it took hours for Ebisu to tell Naruto everything he had learned. From the leaf, they took the next step and began cutting other things, such as small strips of wood, and then bark, and moving on to actual branches. According to Ebisu the final two steps were cutting a waterfall and then cutting through a full-grown and living tree with one's feet. But those were in the highest extremes and it wasn't likely he would finish them by the upcoming exam. 0 o octal 0 While Naruto was making progress with Ebisu, his training with Team 7 had been stunted. Because of her broken arm, Sakura couldn't spar. She couldn't do half of the endurance training Sensei had planned for her. So instead, she ran. And since he was the one who had caused it, Naruto ran with her. As they had ran during that first day, the Pinket told him how her date had gone. She was angry with him for certain, however she had also spent most of the previous afternoon being cared for by Sasuke-kun. So she could forgive him. From there, they spent the laps around random parts of the village talking about one thing or another. From what she had told him, she spent her mornings studying for her Irionin tests. She had perfect scores with the academic side just as she always had. However unlike in the academy, her practicals were also perfect. Even with only one of her arms useful, she was able to not only keep up, but surpass the students who had been there before her. Thanks to the water walking training she had received, her chakra control was leagues above the others. Kenko Sensei had simply rejected the idea that she had gone from a leaf on her forehead to running on water in only two days. When she was able to synchronize her chakra to match the woman's on her second try, the Irio Janin changed her tune. The medical instructor had fast-tracked her lessons to match her learning curve to the point that after three weeks of going to the clinic every morning, she was already being taught to refine the diagnostic scan for viruses. At the same time as their laps around the village, Sasuke had began training to use his dujutsu and was sparing with the one-eyed Janin. Whatever it was they had talked about a couple weeks ago had flared to life a raw dislike between them. Fear Sensei would now randomly put Sasuke in a genjutsu that made him trip or stumble. The Uchiha was able to escape it more often than not but he still got caught pretty often. During their spars however, Kakashi was slow and methodical, and highly unreadable. He only ever used the most basic combinations however his finesse at them made his movements more than enough to counter anything the genin could do. Uchiha Haim spent his mornings working on his ninjutsu. Naruto's clones had reported a few tidbits of his progress. The boy had finished a jutsu to hide giant shuriken in fire, and began trying to create a dragon bullet that was blue instead of yellow. Asking Sasuke about it, got the clone caught, but not dispelled. Surprisingly, the Uchiha answered without hesitation. The first form of it was the fireball, which was normally red, or orange. Depending on one's skill with it, the flame could turn yellow. The fireball could also change size. His normal fireball jutsu was about an arm's length to a meter wide, but his grand fireball could become up to three meters wide depending on the amount of chakra added. The more chakra, the bigger it got. However the better it was converted into fire, 
change the flame's color instead of the size. If he could get it hot enough it would turn blue. He couldn't do that with the fireball yet, however the dragon bullet was different. The dragon bullet would add compression. By forcing the fireball into a smaller space, the fire got hotter on its own, and the more chakra you added, the more fire would be compressed into the ball. This meant adding chakra would make it hotter. Once the jutsu turned blue it was called the imperial fireball, grand fireball or dragon bullet. Signifying that the chakra density was high enough for the jutsu to be raised by an entire letter rank. He had already been able to create a blue hand torch. Which he created so Naruto could see the change. It was a small flame coming out the back of Sasuke curled palm. Air was sucked into the tunnel created by his closed fingers and thumb and a flame came out the other side. At first it was yellow, but as the Uchiha refined it, the jutsu turned blue. After their mission and training, both of the boys would help Sakura gather her medical supplies from the various training grounds in the village. In one of them, Naruto felt a loathing from his past. He could remember fighting some snake freak grass Kunoichi. His memory was almost certain that the forest had been one part of the Chunin exam. He also knew that the grass ninja gave him the creeps for some reason. The second month since they became genin began with a C rank. It was the first mission they had been given, in which his sensei had specifically told him to go all out with his clones. The silver haired Jonin had actually asked him to make the clones before they headed into the mission's office and collected the C rank. The point of the mission was gathering certain berries. It took a good amount of patience to get at the ones needed, and he had to be able to tell the difference. Some were one color for ripe, and others were other colors when they weren't. There would be a few different harvests over each season. The first was just before spring, when the smaller berries would ripen, the second would be late in the spring when the larger ones would. And finally, there were a couple in the summer and one in the fall for the average sized ones. Naruto could remember doing this one before. It had been given to several teams. At least one team would be there every day of the harvest. Naruto hadn't used his clones for that because they would get dispelled every time they were poked by a thorn. This time though, Naruto's clones were a little more careful and they were able to pick all the berries in that day. They were told that they would be called back in about a week to pick the next batch as they ripen. When word of his abuse of shadow clones got out, they were hired to till a large field. The work went quickly and they were given a C rank price when they finished it that same day. Soon many other farms had begun requesting them. This was how Naruto found his solution. The time displaced Genin finally figured out how to ensure he would get the mission he could barely remember. Because his ability to use clones made him the perfect guy for a mission like building a bridge, which as far as Naruto could remember was the only thing that made sense. All he had to do was convince the drunken guy who requested the mission, that their team was the best. But if he just ran up to him and volunteered then the man would probably get suspicious. And worse, what would his teammates think if he led them into a mission that was going to go bad? He couldn't knowingly risk their lives like that and remain their comrade. Even if he did remember them surviving, things had already began to change, how could he guarantee they would live this time around? For that, Ebisu's words at the tea house came to mind. Making your teammates stronger will only make you stronger with them right? This must have been what he meant. The stronger they were, the less he had to protect them. He could do this. They could do it. But they didn't know what he did, and he wasn't about to try convincing anyone that it was real. So how could he get them to accept the mission without making it look like he had planned it? And furthermore, how could he even convince the man that they were the best team? If he just started telling him how good they were, the drunk would think it was just bragging, but if he told him specifics the man would think he was a spy. And something in his gut told him that the guy was hiding things anyway. So what could he do? Ignoring the secretive aspect for a moment Naruto decided to simply ask for help. It wasn't too strange to ask how to get other people to request them for more C ranks. And with the few requests they had already gotten he would be avoiding anything weird. So he asked the one man who should know exactly what he needed. The man that Naruto knew had to get people to hire Leaf Ninja. 0 o Octal 0. Hey Gigi. You don't look very busy, so can I talk to you for a bit? Sticking his head into the Hokage's window, Naruto received a groan from the village leader. Naruto, that entrance is for specific people such as Anbu and those with my personal permission. The stern parental voice held only a hint of amusement. I didn't really want to deal with the traffic of the long way. The genin replied as he entered the rest of the way into the office. Turning toward the boy, the elder began filling his pipe. All right Naruto. What is it you need? 
Do you know how those farms have been requesting Team 7 because of my shadow clones? The boy acts. When the Hokage nodded, Naruto moved to his core question. Well I was wondering what I should do or say if I wanted to get other people to request us for missions like that. The Hokage instantly understood what Naruto was getting at. He wanted to know how to get more of them to hire his team for D ranks that would be worth C rank pay when finished the way his last few had been. Internally the Sandame considered his ward's current finances. Ebisu had began showing him how to shop correctly and explaining the right prices by now, so Naruto should have been able to make do with his monthly stip. Damn it. The elder berated himself for his own stupidity. The boy was no longer receiving a stipend. He had to make do with only what he made from his D ranks. And that meant that the additional cost of buying proper foods wouldn't be as covered as the man had thought. It had been his intention that repairing the overcharging issue would permit him to start buying healthy foods again. However with only D ranks as income, the price decrease may have been the only reason he could afford to keep himself fed this last month at all. He would have to resolve this issue as well. Ebisu reported that Naruto had taught his teammates the water walking skill, they should be ready. Naruto, I can see if your sensei would like to start taking fully C-ranked missions if you are short on cash. At the Hokage's offer Naruto felt a stab of panic. If they received a new C-rank before the one he remembered, they might not even be here when it was requested. No. The genin responded hastily. I don't want anything like that. I just want to get more of the ones we're getting now. You know, with my clones. Well I suppose if it's fine with your team, I could set aside some solo missions for you? The elder suggested. I don't need to separate from my team, I just want to know how to get people to request Team 7 more. Naruto's panicked face was not too well hidden. He might not have wanted his teammates to know he was low on finances, or he might have a particular mission in mind. Either way, the Hokage understood. If you would like to advertise, then I suggest you use the same skill you wish to advertise. Send a few clones to the village square, and to each of the gates. The elder could have grinned at the boy's widened eyes. If you've ever just watched the market district, you'd see how it's done. You have something to sell and you tell the streets themselves about it. Don't speak to any one person in particular, but to the paved road. And above all else, make sure to tell the truth, and focus on the team as a whole. If you only talk about yourself then no one will take you seriously. Well that was a simple answer. Naruto was a little shocked that that was all he had to do. Grinning at the old man, the genin thanked him and fled out the window towards the market district. Zero o octal zero it had taken him a few days to figure out what he wanted to do, and even then, his extra sensei had suggestions to make it better. The main suggestion was a sign that read. Advertising clone not the real person the bold letters were worn on each of his clones as they hanged into one member of the team or another. He would send them out early in the morning and they would only dispel as he slept so that he wouldn't need to remember all the boring hours. If they ever did see the old drunk, they would send their own clones to report instead of risking feedback loss. As villagers passed he had his clones step out for each team member's showcase. As the one hanged into Sasuke stepped forward, the clones spoke about the abilities of the infamous Uchiha princess, with his rookie of the year title. Next it was the great, Cherry Blossom with her unusually high intellect and legendary perfect control. An aspiring medical ninja who was considered by the medical training corps, to be a prodigy not seen since Tsunade herself. Whoever that was, Ebisu had also modified his words too. And Naruto, the Autumn Leaf Army. Able to make hundreds of clones that could actually do the work alongside the real members of the team. He had originally wanted to call himself the Orange Shadow Army, but as the pervy Jonin said, Shadows weren't orange and that name would only give away his primary skill if it made it to the bingo books. Besides, he wasn't always going to be in his orange outfit. Autumn Leaf Army had been the Jonin's sensible equivalent, whatever the hell that meant. And finally, the legendary copy ninja, who was reading a different book this time. Team 7 saw the clones the second day he sent them out. Naturally they asked why, so he quickly responded with the Hokage's own words. He needed more money. He was no longer getting his monthly fund and the D-ranks were barely covering his rent and supplies. Kakashi visibly thought about it, before shrugging and pointing at the two other genin. If they are okay with it, we can start taking two missions a day. Uchihaheim instantly voiced his, definitely, while Sakura pondered Naruto's living situation. Either he was an orphan barely able to buy food, or he was a fully trained shinobi used to a janin's salary. 
Naruto needed more money. And besides that, her own medical supplies weren't cheap. That was one of the reasons she had Team 7 looking for the herbs she wanted instead of buying them. Another reason was so that all of them could recognize them in the wild, but that wasn't the issue right now. Of course none of them said anything else about the clones, even after they saw them again. It was safe to say they wouldn't care if he kept them up for the next month and a half. And by the time the man came to request a mission, it would be a regular thing. There was only a few weeks left before the break in which Aruka would return to the mission's office. Sometime between now and then, Naruto needed to get his team noticed by the drunken old man. His clones had been advertising at each of the gates and in the village square every day since he first got the idea. Because of that, Team 7 had been given a steady increase in missions. The fact that the clones were specifically advertising D ranks meant he didn't have to worry about someone requesting them to be out of the village. However, with his unique skill set they had taken over two dozen C rank missions that would have otherwise been D ranks spread out among several teams. There was the cleanup jobs for the village landscaping, training ground repairs, and the farming jobs for local villagers, as well as many various search and retrieve jobs that were time sensitive. Having Naruto look in hundreds of places at once saved everyone's time. Outside of their missions, the members of Team 7 had grown. Namely Sakura. Her speed and strength had been enhanced dramatically as she increased her skills. When she finally returned to sparring, she came at Naruto with a vengeance. It seemed that her medical training allowed her to pinpoint critical locations on his body with deadly accuracy. Naruto didn't even know what hit him. The Pinket was much faster on her feet than before. And at the conclusion of that spar, Kakashi's previous regimen was reinstated. For all of them. Days of running various distances with alternating speeds, climbing in an assortment of training grounds, and a day dodging just whatever the Janin felt like throwing at them that day, were followed by a rest day and then a spar day. Overall their afternoons were busy to say the least. In most of these training sessions Naruto had no use for clones. However on the dodging and sparing days, they were forbidden outright. On the climbing day he kept an abundance of clones out to catch them if need be, but they mostly sat around without being used. Sasuke's use of his Sharingan had been forbidden in their team training. However since Kakashi had began training him individually in the mornings, Naruto now needed to use his chakra in order to compete. He wasn't going all out, but before he had broken Sakura's arm, the blonde hadn't used any chakra. Even after Sasuke had finished the chakra training Naruto traded to him, the Uchiha wasn't as fast as Naruto, who had been trained to fight by getting his ass kicked by his own clones. Now he was using about a tenth what he used with Ebisu Sensei. Sasuke's ninjutsu skills had grown as well. With his chakra control increased as much as it was he finally mastered the Imperial Dragon Bullet and had began working on the Imperial Fireball. He was also able to use the Grand Fireball too. The massive orange and yellow ball of fire was at least 3 meters around. Sasuke wasn't as surprised at the size of it as he was at the fact it had turned yellow. All of his previous ones had been a dark red. Naruto also had great success with elemental training. His advanced wind manipulation had come a long way. After Ebisu had explained to him all the steps he was able to practice it on his downtime. He even left a couple clones to work on it overnight. He had passed the point of cutting a branch early on and now he was trying to cut lengths of metal wire made with escalating thickness and density. Once he had cut through the last one of them, which was meant to be roughly harder than cutting through a kanai, Ebisu would have him begin manipulating wind from his feet, starting at the beginning with a leaf attached to each foot. This however would all be done on his own time. With his taijutsu style completed, and all the practical lectures finished, Ebisu sensei had began preparing him to learn the kaden. Increasing his chakra control was the absolute requirement. They had done enough work on his control that Naruto could hold stones about a hand's length away from his skin over his entire body. They had only just finished getting him used to holding them all there at the same time and were ready to begin learning the spin. However to do that they needed a large still body of water. Ebisu was considering installing a small dam with flow channels at the bottom so the surface of training ground 17's river would calm and the small pond would grow. They discussed this idea over breakfast about two weeks ago. At that same time, the freaky tea lady managed to catch him alone when Ebisu was called away to deal with Konohamaru. The younger boy spent most mornings with Gemina. Sometimes Naruto would hang out with them too. He heard all sorts of funny details about Gemina and Ebisu's time as a team with super bushy brows. The green beast had been the way he was now, for as long as they had known him, 
and his father was mostly the same. The story of how the man had sacrificed himself using the eight gates to save them, struck very hard for Naruto. It was as if that act of love solidified the words that echoed through his memories completely. To protect those precious to you, to die saving them. But today Konohamaru had been with his grandpa, when an emergency came up. So there Naruto was, finishing his meal that Ebisu had already paid for, while the man's girlfriend flirted with him. She acted just as creepy as he had finally remembered. She cut his face and licked it then too he recalled. But he didn't remember why. He got the impression that he was in a crowd outside but he didn't recognize very many of the faces. When he tried to get away from her, she only got more handsy. All the while she was whispering to him how wonderful her relationship with Ebisu was. Naruto really didn't need to know any of that about his extra sensei. In the end, the next time they met up, they had settled for simply training at the hot springs, which suited Naruto just fine. This way he would be more likely to notice when that frog statue was built. So far the bet was coming along greatly. Ebisu had done research into the first two requests. His taijutsu was virtually finished and they were making great progress with the Kaiden. With his wind affinity training as advanced as it was, he should have it mastered well before the exam. Maybe even before the fogged over mission. He had even began adding it to his kanai once Ebisu explained the basics behind it. He could now get his kanai to pierce almost anything. And it dramatically increased his throwing speed. However, Ebisu had been adamant that he be able to perform his three wind jutsu before learning the four other elemental jutsu he had selected. Each one would need him to learn the first leaf form of that element. But as long as he didn't need to refine it, converting the leaf was all he would need to learn. For now however, Naruto had only began working on the wind jutsu. Zero o octal zero it had been over two months since they had been made a team. In that time Sasuke and Sakura had yet to figure their teammate out. His speed and skills were easily accepted, but his increased maturity and focus on helping them get stronger wasn't as easy to accept. But the biggest change in him was his intellect. He was smarter. That was undeniable. Many of his conversations with Sakura about human anatomy proved he knew far more than he had in the academy. The difference continued to increase when she told him things he didn't know already, and he not only remembered them, but had looked into them so they could pick up from there next time. Alongside that, his conversations with Sasuke about chakra usage and elemental manipulation often had details she didn't know. During a couple of their more mindless missions Naruto had began asking them about tactical scenarios. She didn't even bother questioning the fact that he even knew what those were. For a few days they would work over a situation and discuss the best possible method of handling it, then they would start a new scenario. Kakashi sensei wasn't always silent when they discussed these. Naruto had kept most of his little conversations among the three of them, but for these he would actively ask their sensei for current or updated information and ideas. And during their training he would begin spouting challenges. At first it was things like whoever came in last or got hit most would have to pay for one part or another of their group dinner, which Naruto had somehow set up as a team tradition on each of their rest days. For this week she had to pay for the appetizer and two sides. Sasuke had to pay for their entrees and Naruto had dessert and a side. He also gave out homework challenges, such as if Sasuke or her couldn't run their last lap blindfolded then they had to run three more laps. The one time he had given himself a challenge during a mission, Kakashi's eye flew open in a flinch you could only see after spending as much time with him as they did, and he vanished in a burst of smoke and leaves. Naruto had fallen from where he was climbing the side of a house and began laughing his head off something about eternal rivals. But he also did more important challenges such as if she beat Sasuke at something really difficult he would have to take her on a date. For as long as either of them could remember their teammate had been hopelessly in love with Sakura. However it seemed that overnight he had changed there as well. So far she had been on six dates with Sasuke. Ino had already conceded defeat. After their first date Sakura finally got to tell Ino and the girl had been devastated. It was possible that the only reason she didn't attack the pink at right there was because Sakura's arm and nose were both so obviously broken. It may have been the only thing that prevented her and her best friend from an all-out brawl in the streets. One more thing added to the list of suspicious behaviors Naruto exhibited. If. If he had done it on purpose, she had looked into so many avenues to that end and Sasuke's theory seemed to hold up at every turn. Instead the blonde sat in her angry defeat and listened to Sakura give a scene-by-scene -scene description of their date. Sasuke hadn't taken her out, 
instead he prepared a full picnic which they ate by the Uchiha lake. As it turned out he was an okay cook. Not as good as her, but far better than most guys their age. The best part was, that during the entire date, Sasuke catered to her. He poured her drinks and had already cut the food up into bite-sized chunks so she wouldn't have to use her broken arm. After they ate, Sasuke walked her home. Not straight home but around the training grounds. And that was only the first date. Each date had been different. Although most had either been home cooked or take out. Sakura did eventually ask why they didn't go on a date in public. As Ino had guessed, it was the fact that once someone found out he was dating, then girls from all over the village would start making a big deal and following him relentlessly was an acceptable reason, the Pinkette only hoped she could get Ino to keep quiet about it. But for her luck the blonde girl already knew the situation and had been doing intel control ever since their first date. After her fifth date with him, the blonde girl told her she had discovered something that almost broke her heart for Hanada. They spoke about it for some time before deciding not to tell the poor Hayuga. They hadn't told Naruto her feelings before, so they didn't have the right to tell her his now. Sakura wasn't sure how to feel that Naruto already had a girlfriend. He had been asking her out for so long she had a hard time understanding what the loss of his affections meant to her. It was strange, thinking of Naruto treating someone else to his attention. However her inner self ruthlessly crushed any sadness she might have felt over it. The description of his breakfast date with the woman Ino had spied on, left no chance that it was anything else. Her outfit and behavior clearly implied they had been a thing for quite some time. Zero O Octal Zero Naruto was some kind of freak. This was the conclusion Sasuke had come to after he finally managed to find Naruto training. Most of the times he vanished somewhere around their own training ground, but the Uchiha could never find him. It was the odd chance that on their rest day, he managed to find the fake training in a hot spring of all places. But for the training he was doing, Sasuke could accept the rationale behind the location. Naruto had been spinning in place while holding more than a hundred different small rocks about two feet from his body. When the Avenger tried to float a leaf that far, he failed miserably. Thinking to himself that maybe it was why he was using rocks, the Uchiha tried to float a small pebble, the increase in chakra consumption was dramatic. There was no way he would be able to hold it so far away. This small glimpse into the real gap between them left Uchiha Sasuke, humbled beyond any experience since that night. They trained hard together in their team sessions, and their sensei worked him even harder during their morning sessions. Without his Sharingan he couldn't see if Naruto needed to use his chakra for the team training, but he knew the boy hadn't been using it in their spars before his match with Sakura. Sasuke's attempts to find out more about Naruto left him at dead ends most of the time. Even Sakura couldn't dig up much of his paperwork. His enrollment into the academy had been a forced issue by the Hokage. None of the instructors wanted him there. And many of the parents had protested too. Whatever the hell was going on there was only adding to his theory. Sakura's luck with Ino because of her broken arm didn't make the cut as evidence. However if they could have proven Naruto had done it on purpose, it would have. After learning about his trouble enrolling into the academy, they also found more hard evidence in his medical history. There wasn't one. Every student in the academy had to have a medical checkup on file, but outside of behavior reports, Naruto's file was almost empty. So Sakura had checked the hospital and come out empty handed. She had even asked one of her superiors to find out if her teammates' files could be accessed because she was on the Uchiha's team. They spared a little concern towards Sasuke's file but she eventually got to see a few pages about him. However a file on Naruto wasn't to be seen, it was classified. While the Pinkette looked at the hospital, Sasuke had looked into the apartment complex. It seemed the Hokage was the one who had signed the lease agreement. And if not for his clan name, Sasuke was certain he never would have convinced the owner to give him any information at all. In the end it was because the Uchiha wanted to know more about who he would be going on missions of life or death beside, that got him his answers. Even Naruto's little advertising scheme was evidence. Sasuke and Sakura both looked into the marketing permits and found out that the Hokage had filled out the paperwork and allocated the designated spots Naruto's clones were using for village official use only. After a little convincing he and Sakura managed to get a look at their mission reports in exchange for sorting and filing some of the D-ranks on their rest day. That was how they learned the Hokage had even added a small notation on the DNC rank mission request forms asking if this mission would require a large number of bodies. Sasuke recognized many of the missions that had been checked in the D rank missions as ones they had performed as C ranks. 
The evidence was stacking up higher and higher. Then came their next big find. Ino and Sakura had been talking the night after their fifth date, when Ino told her that she had seen Naruto on what looked like a date with one of the Jonin women. It took Ino days to find out who she was. A high status assassin named Anko Mitarashi. The way she was dressed was bad enough, but the way she draped herself over Naruto had Ino's entire face turning red just from describing it to Sakura. Sasuke and Sakura's own sights of him spending time with the Hokage, Aruka, and a couple other adults convinced them he was definitely at least a Chunin, and definitely hiding his real identity. Zero O Octal Zero The day finally came. One of his clones at the main gate finally saw the old man. It was less than a week before Aruka would return to the mission's office. The man was at least in his late forties, probably older. His hair had began turning gray all over. He had a small crop of beard around his mouth and chin, while his cheeks and the rest of his face were cut to a stubble. He wore glasses and a wide-brimmed sun hat. His clothes were worn and old, clearly damaged and patched in many places. However, he wasn't drunk. That was one really big ticket item Naruto could remember of the man. So seeing him sober and professional was something new. For a few moments flashes of memory passed through each of the clones as they all recalled different times they had seen him sober. The man had gone halfway down the street before Naruto's clones realized he had passed them. So kicking their troop up the road they began their pitch. Hey old man. You're looking for a C rank aren't you? The clone hanged as Sakura began, getting his attention from slightly behind him. I don't need a bunch of brats. This isn't a job cleaning up the coast or any. The man's response was cut off as the next clone spoke. The Kakashi clone having a longer stride had passed and flanked the target, coming up on him from his other side. The team you need to be requesting is Team 7. The Sasuke clone landed from a high leap right in front of him, stopping him from continuing on his way. His disclaimer sign bouncing on its rope that looped over his shoulders. We can handle anything you need handled. Pulling on the back of the old man's tattered shirt, the Naruto clone continued, from manual labor to combat. We are the team you need. If you have rocks to move, bandits after ya, or even a massive flood that needs bailed out by the bucket, we got your help right here. The old man had actually began look at them seriously now, his attention was theirs. I am the representation of the team's medic, Haruno Sakura. My abilities include a photographic memory, mid-level Irionin certification meaning I can work on almost any non-life-threatening wound, cure the majority of illnesses and I am prepared for any and all types of traumatic emergency medical care. I am known for having the legendary perfect chakra control not seen since Tsunade herself, I will do my absolute best to provide you with exceptional care. She presented herself with a flourish and proper bow just as he had seen Sakura do in the academy. I am called the Uchiha Princess. My name is Sasuke. My fire style of jutsu is exceptional even among our village. I can handle almost any combat situation as I have been trained. I specialize in heavy frontline combat, meaning that I use a variety of powerful skills that can only be performed by shinobi. My clan's dojutsu also allows me to fight at a level far higher than any average shinobi of our age. If someone is coming for you, I will bring them down with swift and effective certainty. While Naruto was able to get Sasuke's looks, voice and most of his attitude down, the clear intimidation of his Sharingan still eluded the clones. The Naruto clone spoke next, and from him came a flood of information they hadn't even known they had remembered. I represent Uzumaki Naruto, also known as the Autumn Leaf Army. I can be one or one hundred. To emphasize this the Naruto clone created eight more duplicates all of them began picking things up and moving them as proof that they were solid. With me on the team we outnumber any job. You need stones or lumber moved. Each of my clones can lift ten times as much as a civilian worker using our shinobi strength. Move them farther and way faster than any non-shinobi. And if there are a hundred of us doing it at the same time, the job is done before you know it. For the next part most of the newly created clones hopped onto the sides of stalls and buildings. One of them transformed into a bucket which another filled with water and step onto. Got a river to cross we can walk on water and up the sides of cliffs. There's no need for boats or ferries, when you have shinobi like us working for you. And if there is an enemy, began the Sasuke clone, these clones are completely expendable. As he said it, he stabbed one of them in the eye, resulting in its dismissal. Whoever is attacking would have to kill off over a hundred of them before reaching you. And against a shinobi like him, it would take at least another shinobi to kill even one of them. Even if you have an army attacking, 
The soccer a clone pitched in. The Autumn Leaf Army is an army itself, and you can hire the entire army for the price of one genin. Finally, to finish it, the Kakashi clone stepped in. If there is anything these three genin can't handle, I represent Hitaki Kakashi. Trained by the fourth Hokage himself, wielder of a Sharingan, known as the legendary copy ninja who has copied a thousand jutsu, I have at my command a pack of trained combat ninja dogs that can each defeat a genin with their tails tied. As a pack, they could match even a janin. While I myself am a janin of the highest caliber available. So if we are ever in a pinch, I will settle the problem with ease. By this time, they could tell Tazuna was quite thoroughly convinced. The old man was wide eyed and looked as if he had been handed all the food he could eat. With a relieved voice, he agreed that they would fit the job he had in mind and shoved his way through the clones. The group of clones watched him until he was lost into the crowd. Not forgetting to send one of their number to tell the boss, they returned to their station and began advertising for D ranks once more. Zero O Octal Zero The rest of that week felt to Naruto as if it was the longest week of his life. He couldn't hold back the fear of missing their mission. It crept up on him every time he let himself think. To take his mind off it, he put the Kaden training on hold and began focusing all his efforts on mastering the three wind jutsu. He decided to begin with the one most like what he was already doing. The cutting breeze. He could already cut through a kanai if he wanted, surely a cutting type jutsu would be easy to figure out. However, after only one try, his extra sensei stopped him. Naruto kun, I think it would be better if I fudged a little on our bet and taught you a minor wind jutsu as part of your elemental training. The man spoke tentatively as he knelt to Naruto's level. Don't worry, this will still fall under item 5, but I think you should learn how molding your chakra in a hand seal will affect the elemental manipulation process firsthand. We have discussed it, however, I think you'd be able to grasp it better if you used a certain jutsu from the Traveling Ten. Naruto agreed immediately. He even knew which one Ebisu sensei had in mind the cutting palm jutsu. Naruto had been half convinced that all it was was the raw manipulation of wind chakra to cut things the way he had been doing for the last month. However, what Ebisu showed him was a set of two hand seals. The first was the bird. It was often used in wind jutsu as his extra sensei had taught him. So Naruto kinda expected it. The bird seal was followed by a one-handed ram seal. The ram seal was usually used when pulsing your chakra, most often in fire, lightning, or water jutsu. But it usually went somewhere in genjutsu as well. Making a fist with his first and second fingers extended, Ebisu cut his hand across the ground sharply. The result was a small parting of the packed soil. As Ebisu explained the second seal, the ram, was only needed to focus the wind chakra into the shape of the blade while the bird seal before it compressed regular chakra into and behind the wind chakra to make it more powerful. But if he was good enough with wind manipulation he could forego the last seal and produce the cutting wind from any part of his body. Ebisu was particularly specific about being able to do that. He spoke of a certain taijutsu style he had been told of in which the wind user used a blade of wind at each joint, knees, elbows, on each finger and on each foot. This created an extremely lethal offensive and left no openings in their defense. While the Janin didn't think Naruto would be able to recreate that specific style, he could certainly use the concept behind it. It only took two tries for Naruto to cut a deep rent in the hard ground below him. After that he tried the cutting breeze which also began with the bird seal, but that was followed by the snake seal before using the one-handed ram. Apparently the snake seal added range to it, drawing even more chakra into the jutsu so that the blade could expand outwards. His attempts at the other two were less successful. While the cutting type jutsu only took a few tries, his vacuum palm almost always overpowered and backfired. The blast of air that was only supposed to project or deflect an object in the air in front of him, normally ended up leaving his hands numb and his shoulders sore, while not even affecting the object. The air bullet however, actually knocked him out when it blew up inside his mouth, Ebisu was terrified thinking he had nearly killed himself. When he woke the man was furious, screaming at him about how much trouble the Janin would be in with the Hokage if he died. The missions for that last week had all been even slower than the rest. He felt excited each time he walked into the mission's office and disappointed as he walked out. He even mentioned to the team that he thought it was time for a more advanced mission, hoping that Kakashi would take the hint and accept the mission they had surely been requested for. With each passing day he grew more stressed, as he watched the days pass with dread that they would miss the mission. 
It took almost the entire week before he could complete either of the two wind jutsu as they were supposed to be. He managed to figure out how to focus the direction of the vacuum palm first. As it turns out he had been blasting air in all directions and only needed to pull it in and aim it. It took a discussion with Sasuke to finally finish the air bullet. Finally when the academy let out for break, and Aruka took his position in the mission's office, Naruto couldn't take it anymore. If not for the training session in which Naruto had mastered the air bullet with Sasuke the morning of that same day, he would have caved and gone to the Hokage the next. It seemed, what he was lacking with the air bullet was the ball of compression that Sasuke used in his dragon bullet. After a couple hours of working with the Uchiha, Naruto was able to produce an acceptable air bullet. So instead of caving and going to the Hokage for the mission, the day after training with Sasuke, he went to Ebisu to have him evaluate his now functioning air bullet. With those three jutsu finally down, Ebisu told him he would prepare to teach Naruto the first five forms for each of the elements. It would take a couple weeks to be prepared so Naruto should focus on his katan for the time. After agreeing to take a break from their morning sessions, Ebisu left Naruto in the circle of pillars. Zero o octal zero Naruto had been tense for the last week or so. However ever since Uruka began working at the mission's office three days ago, it became noticeable even to his teammates. It might have had something to do with Sasuke helping him complete his air bullet that first day, but Kakashi couldn't place how. It was like the boy was waiting for something. Looking into the Hokage's eyes Kakashi wondered if the aged shinobi had slipped and revealed that mission. Early this morning he received a message that they would be given an extended mission today. He had known for the last week or so that they had been requested for something bigger, however the Hokage seemed to have a reason that they needed to wait. So today, he informed his team to meet at the mission's office at 8 in the morning. Naruto seemed to have an internal meltdown from the instruction. When they finally gathered, they were informed they would be receiving a mission outside the village. In fact they had been specifically requested. The man had asked for a C rank discounted B rank stating that his mission needed laborers, security and even minor combat against civilian thugs. According to his request, his village had been building a bridge that the shipping magnate was opposed to and so the man had began sending thugs for hire to vandalize their supplies and rough up the workers. It would have been at least three or four C ranks to hire patrols and such, and several D ranks to hire the labor to get the supplies from their secured storage to the worksite. But with Team 7, he could pay just a little more than a C rank would cost for a discounted B rank and Naruto could handle the numbers issue. As Kakashi understood, it cleaned the man out. As such the village had put him up in a local hotel until Team 7 was ready for the mission. The third had been quite insistent that they accept how little the bridge builder had to pay. The pay cut was directly from Team 7's profits. All the taxes for a B rank had to be covered. After explaining it to his team, Kakashi passed on their unanimous desire to add a B rank to their repertoire. Zero O Octal Zero Sasuke and Sakura were a little stunned that Naruto had gotten the mission he had obviously been waiting for. The moment they were debriefed about the mission the boy seemed to melt compared to how tense he had been. The fact that they were given a higher ranked mission right after he said they were ready for one, only made them more suspicious. As Sakura looked into the details she realized that the mission costs were barely covered. If the old man hadn't seen Naruto's advertising clones he never would have been able to afford the right mission. They were all packed and Naruto was in his Anbu-esque uniform, he looked and acted like a professional. At the same time, a pair of his clones in the common Naruto orange walked behind him. Each of them were loaded with a backpack of supplies. He told them if they were getting the job based on that skill then they might as well use it from the start. Zero O Octal Zero Naruto's clone finally dispersed letting him know that the construct had told Ebisu about the mission, and the man's reaction. He had clearly known about it beforehand. His extra sensei's only instructions were to use the opportunity to train. Wave was an island surrounded by a massive body of water. It would be the perfect place to perfect the Kaden. Naruto had to agree. With a large enough body of water he would be able to put the full amount of chakra behind the jutsu and not worry about sending water all over the place or tearing up the ground beneath him. As Naruto walked along the road he had to contain his excitement out of sheer force of will. Each step brought him closer to his newest jutsu. He knew for certain that he couldn't even manipulate wind last time. And now. The thought of his last time on this mission brought Naruto down from his excited high. He still couldn't remember much about this mission. The mask, the mirrors, the cold, the girl and those words. The rest still seemed to be just out of reach. 
so Naruto tried once more to pull a detail from the memories of his last life. Creating his calm center Naruto focused on what he knew. Last time they had been on a sea rank to simply get the old man home. He was building a bridge, according to the new mission orders and there were thugs after him. Naruto was certain the guy had been drunk last time. But this time all his money was spent on the mission, he didn't have any left so the Hokage had given him a hotel for a few nights. The image of Tazuna begging them not to leave flashed through Naruto's mind, but that was it. No context. Focusing deeper. Naruto understood Tazuna had lied last time. The mission was too high for them and so they had to choose to continue. Why? This time he had explained the thugs. Maybe he hadn't last time, had they been attacked? Naruto tried to picture some rough looking thugs ambushing them on the road. But what came to the forefront of his mind was a pair of chains exploding from a puddle in the middle of the road, they coiled around Kakashi sensei and parted him into several disgusting chunks. The shock of what Naruto just witnessed shook him from his calm focus. It couldn't have been right. There was just no way that had happened. He had still had his sensei later on right? The man gave them their applications to take the chunin exam didn't he? But as Naruto thought for the image of sensei, what he saw was Ebisu and the hermit in the hot springs. Shaking his head Naruto tried to focus once more and pull the memory back, however before he could he noticed the road ahead. The puddle was visible along the dry road, even from this distance. Naruto wasn't sure if what had happened even happened, but he still had to try to stop it. He couldn't just sit there and watch as his sensei was killed. What should he do? How could he explain it? Looking at his clones walking behind him Naruto saw that they too had recalled the event about to happen. And they seemed to have a plan. With a nod from him, one of them slowed slightly and took off his backpack. Handing it to the other who loaded it on his front then turned so he could walk backwards. Zero o octal zero Naruto's attitude had slowly been building in excitement as they got farther and farther from the village. Kakashi was surprised to see his other two students seemed more focused on the cloned genin than the area around them. Not that they weren't keeping a good watch, however they seemed to be switching off. One would watch the road while the other studied their teammate and his clones. Then they would switch after a few minutes. When Naruto received the memories of a dismissed clone back at the village he and his clones nearly began skipping. Kakashi had to acknowledge the effort Naruto took in finding his calm again. The boy focused his center in only a minute or two before he took on an entirely different emotion. Panic. Looking around the Jonin tried to see what had set the boy off, but when his clones also began to panic, the copy ninja had little choice. He extended his senses outwards and even lifted the protector covering his eye under the guise of scratching. And that was when he saw them. Quite a ways up the road hidden in a puddle projecting genjutsu were two shinobi. Making a mental note to test Naruto for sensory abilities, Kakashi focused in on them. They were at least chunin level. And obviously waiting in ambush. It occurred to him to simply switch out and allow things to unfold. They weren't a threat to his genin. Sasuke could probably take them both out on his own. Naruto wouldn't have any problem overpowering them. But Naruto had panicked. Naruto had noticed them long before he had, and had yet to say anything. Why? If Naruto bolted or worse, attempted to engage the enemy, one of them might get hurt. Suddenly Naruto calmed. A brief exchange of looks between him and his clones and the Anbu-dressed child started walking slightly faster while his clones fell behind. What was he planning? One clone gave his pack to the other who turned and held the pack in front of the first. Said clone began digging through the bag looking for something. They were just passing the puddle when the searching clone, accidentally, dropped something from the pack, it jerked towards whatever the roll was and made to catch it. It ignited. And the second clone shoved off the first clone easily clearing the blast area. At the same time other clones appeared, quickly driving Sasuke and Sakura safely into the trees while Naruto himself grabbed the client and leapt with a massive burst of chakra. Kakashi was slightly surprised at the sheer volume of chakra the boy used in the leap. As they picked themselves up, the group saw the results of the blast. Most of the road had been charred and a fresh crater dipped into the compacted ground. The two attackers had been hit full force. The blast went off between them, sending them flying apart, they might have cleared it, however their chained arms kept them in range of the explosion. The links of their prized gauntlets were melted and deformed from the heat. The brothers themselves had been caught fully and were writhing on the ground. The stink of their burned and melting flesh was horrible. With a swallow, Naruto created two clones. Stepping up to the wounded shinobi, 
newly created clones used the cutting breeze to take their heads off, ending their cries of pain. The sight proved too gruesome for Sakura as the medic turned, retreating back off the road and heaved noisily into the ditch. Sasuke looked like he was in shock, but turned after Sakura and took hold of her long pink hair, keeping it from mixing with the expelled breakfast. The clone who had carried the two packs safely out of the area, walked forward holding a small book out. Handing it to the sickly original, he flipped a couple pages and pointed one out to the Anbu-esque Genin. The Demon Brothers of the Mist. B-rank rogue Chunin, and we just blew them up like it was nothing. Even the cloned Naruto spoke with a cheer that was obviously and poorly forced. The true boy's slightly green paler told of the impending vomit. And his multiple swallows showed how much he was trying not to. Closing the book, he unrolled a body bounty scroll and gave it to the clone next to him. Kakashi recognized the make and size. He must have gotten it from the Anbu Supply Depot. It was one of the ten count scrolls they carried. Why did Naruto have one of those? And a bingo book. What was Naruto doing with a bingo book? What the hell were you thinking, Naruto? A very harsh scolding was the least he was allowed to do after a stunt like that. But for now it would suffice. He would have to figure out some cruel punishment for him when they completed the mission. Hey it fooled and beat them before they could attack, didn't it? The indignant reply without any trace of respect bordered insubordination. Crap. This was getting more annoying by the minute. Your stunt was dangerous and could have gotten the client or your teammates hurt. You said nothing of your plan to the rest of us. We don't even know if those two were hostile or not, much less who they were after. Kakashi was reasonably certain they had been after them, and Naruto's plan was actually well executed. Informing the others might have given it away. And the original Naruto covering the client displayed a good sense of priorities. The Jonin was moderately okay with the plan itself. The result was a little messy but. The thunder and clouds Genjutsu had taken hold. Releasing a significant amount of his killing intent, Kakashi continued the scolding onto the heart of his personal issue with the action taken. I don't recall clearing you to use explosive notes, and moreover where and how you acquired the bounty scroll is going to have to be brought to the Hokage. Genin aren't supposed to have access to such equipment unless their Jonin sensei distributes it personally. His eye not leaving Naruto for a second. Kakashi took in the looks of shock and triumph on his other two Genin's faces. They shared another one of the looks they had been giving each other. Obviously they had expected Naruto to pull something like this. As for the bingo book, I will be holding on to that. Genin aren't permitted to even own a copy of the current bounty listings much less compile their own bingo. How you even knew how to is beyond my logic. He held his hand out expectantly. But instead of handing it over or protesting that it was his hard work or even bragging about how he made it, Naruto simply scowled and holding eye contact, tucked it in his vest. A deliberate act of insubordination. Great, now he had no choice but to bring this to the Hokage. He had been hoping to simply sweep it under the figurative rug, and torment the brat instead, avoiding the bad mark being placed on the genin's record. With a sigh Kakashi simply took the bingo book, his hand snatching it far faster than the genin could even see. The flinch Naruto gave when the book appeared to simply vanish into the genin's hand was nearly comical. The book itself was made with a durable and well-oiled skin. The ingrained details of various tea leaves were etched into the cover's design with painstaking care. Flipping through the book the genin was surprised at the level of information and analysis given for each entry. The pages cleanly laid out the names, known abilities, and weaknesses, along with suggested tactics such as flee on sight or use lightning elemental jutsu, or one hit kill method and flee. This is very well detailed. Some of the information here hasn't even been released to the public yet, Kakashi couldn't help but be impressed. However much of the information in the book was need to know. This has classified data in it, how you got it aside, if you were to lose it. The ex Anbu stopped mid-sentence as he found a hidden message in the lining of the page on the snake sonin. Clearly, Naruto hadn't made the bingo book. The message was written in Anbu script. It read, Inu return a NKOS hard work right now PG. 644. Anko had spoken of herself in the third person as a way to tell him who she was and claim her hard work at the same time. It explained why the bingo book was vastly more detailed and in-depth, along with all of the notes meant for a genin. She knew what she was doing. Turning to page 644, he found himself and all his own data, much of it personal. Here, Kakashi also saw another code, 
but this one had been seamlessly stitched into the bindings of the page, it was in the encrypted code of the Hokage's black missions. One that even Anko didn't know and only a few others after him even knew existed. By the promise of an old monkey return this to its owner or be demoted to Genin alongside him. That message basically exonerated Naruto for everything. After reading it again and double checking his translation with a key he kept in his flak jacket's inner pocket, the Jonin felt he had no choice but to accept the order. It would appear the Hokage had been behind it. Figures. It would seem the Hokage had commissioned the book from Anko and had to have personally stitched the Black Ops coded message himself. He must have told her it would be on the Jonin's own page so she could include the page number in her Anbu script message. Kakashi had been a little skeptical about Naruto hanging out in that tea house so often. If Anko was one of the ones the Hokage had rigging Naruto's progress then it all lined up. With a defeated sigh the Jonin closed the book and held it out to his student. Okay Naruto, you can have it back. Enjoy your tea. Naruto got the hint immediately, it was something to do with Anko. Had she been the one to make it? Zero O Octal Zero watching as their sensei gave the bingo book back to their teammate the other two genin nearly got excited at the blatant evidence displayed right in front of them. Except for the events that had led up to it, this was exactly what they had been waiting for. Naruto effortlessly dispatched two B-ranked chunin, killed them off as if he had done it before and then got caught using ninja supplies not available to genin. Sasuke had to ask the pinket what a bingo book even was. Her own knowledge of it stemmed from Ino's dad. To think Naruto had made a bingo book with classified details that hadn't even been listed yet. That was exactly the kind of thing that confirmed their suspicions, and as it seemed he had gotten away with outright disobeying their sensei. Then as the two execution clones finished their task of sealing the bodies and dispelled, the supposedly higher ranked infiltrator full on flinched and rushed to the side of the road. Watching the Anbu esque Genin bend over and puke was enough to get Sakura vomiting again as well. His focus was drawn downwards as she stretched her arms and back. A soft mule escaped her lips as her back arched. When she had extended herself as far as she could, she relaxed, letting her arms fall back to the bed. The Kunoichi opened her eyes and zeroed in on his stare. He didn't avert his eyes as he would have the day before, there was little point to being shy now. As he held her gaze, her smile turned into a savage grin enjoying the view? It is quite pleasing to look at. His admission seemed to satisfy her as she threw herself back into the bedding with a giggle, squeezing a pillow to her chest. So how do you think the Gaki's mission is going? Her words immediately cut through his mood. His mind was pulled towards his elder student's training. I'm certain the wait was worth it. They may not be there as soon as the man had hoped, but I am glad the Hokage agreed he should master those three before they left. It was his own insistence that they wait until Naruto had successfully finished the three wind jutsu he received from the Uchiha heir that swayed the Hokage to put the man up in a hotel for the week he had waited. His mission seemed to hold some combat potential, however the Sandame had other reservations about it. Though the old shinobi kept them to himself, Ebisu clearly recognized the suspicion in his browline. Anko gave a contented yawn and replied. It wasn't that odd for them to be requested. From the description of the mission, it sounds perfect for them. Her voice held a note of reassurance as if she knew what he was considering. Besides, Kashi kun is with them, and I seriously doubt a village like the Island of Wave would have anyone that guy couldn't handle. Yes, you're right. But I can't help but worry. And I'm sure I'll be just as worried when Konohamaru chan goes on his first real C rank mission, much less his first B rank. Sitting up, Ebisu turned out of the covers and set his feet on the hotel floor. I suppose I should thank you. Yeah, but it's fine, I had fun too. She curled back into the blankets even farther. I meant for the bingo book, I haven't seen one that well made in years. Leaning back Ebisu thought fondly of the boy's reaction when he gave it to him. He's grown so much in the last three months, you almost wouldn't recognize him in his mission outfit. Even his speech patterns have changed. Un. Well he seems to be benefiting from it. The woman suppressed a mischievous giggle only barely losing to the snort that resonated through the room. Raising an eyebrow, Ebisu turned to look her in the eyes. Do tell me what that is supposed to mean. And so Anko launched into an explanation of her breakfast with the Gaki after Ebisu had left, and how she noticed the Yamanaka princess spying on them. Once she saw the girl she couldn't help but get a little carried away making the girl jealous. The kid's reactions almost made it worth it. But the girl rushed away in quite a hurry. While Ebisu didn't approve, he didn't see any adverse effects in the time since, 
so it was easy to simply laugh at his student's expense. 0 o octal 0 The fact Naruto had emptied his stomach after killing the demon brothers didn't deter their theory. Sakura easily rationalized how it was possible he had done it on purpose, or it was also possible that while his rank was higher, he had simply been in the academy that long and had actually never seen that level of bloodshed. The fact that they both clearly remembered him as a child seemed to point to the later. A brief exchange of words between her and Sasuke confirmed their agreement. Turning back to the road, she thanked Sasuke for once again holding her hair. By the time she had finished sicking up, Naruto had recovered enough to set some more clones to the task of cleaning up the damaged road. With the silent promise to discuss the bingo book and scroll details later, the two real genins separated and began helping the clones dispel any trace of the explosion. Once they had finished clearing the road of any remains and filling in the crater, the three genin gathered around their sensei. It looked like the masked janin was pouting. At the same time Tazuna was cradling and rubbing one of his arms, a frightened look on his face. Since we have no actual evidence that those two were after our client, he let that hang for a moment as he gave a pointed look at the man in question. We should continue the mission. However, from this point onwards we are on high alert. Tazuna has admitted that it is possible they were hired to target him, however he claims the shipping magnate has only used civilian thugs up till now. Tazuna shunk under the glares of Sasuke and Sakura as they re-evaluated his character. If either of them caught the look of relief Naruto tried to hide, they didn't share their usual look. Kakashi on the other hand, had seen Naruto relax his stance. It was obvious the boy would have argued the point that he had taken them down on his own and as such they weren't a big enough threat for the team to turn back now. If they were hired by Gatu, it is possible that will be the end of it, but it's more likely that they were working with someone else. His tone changed from the firm but calm voice he had been using since his conflict with Naruto, and became a hard and commanding whisper that unnerved all three of them. Chances are that if we continue this mission we will be facing a high-caliber shinobi, and should that happen I want you three to focus solely on getting Tazuna out of the area. I will handle the enemy. Am I understood? He waited until all three of them had confirmed, before turning back to the client and jerking his head. Let's go. And so they began walking once more. Only two of Naruto's newly formed clones remained to carry the packs. Zero O Octal Zero Gatu strode into the room he had provided for these so called shinobi demons. His men had reported that Tazuna had made it to a waiting boat and was currently crossing the waters over to the island. The man had shinobi protecting him, as they had expected, and the best way to counter shinobi was with your own shinobi, and so he had paid quite a hefty fee to get the ones he had now. And they had failed. The door slamming open didn't even bother the murderous swordsman as he lounged on a couch eating from a tray held by his servant. The man took another bite shoving his whole hand over his mouth as he dropped the food inside. When his hand lowered his mouth was entirely covered by bandages. Your little boys failed. He accused loudly as he stormed into the center of the room. My men reported not even a single scratch was on any of the shinobi protecting him. And worse, there was only one adult in the group. The other five were just a bunch of children. Brats fresh out of diapers damn it. I paid you a lot of money for his head, and your supposed chunin lost to one guy and five lit. Five? The shinobi cut him off with a tone of voice that sent shivers down his spine. The man's eyes still lingered on the food tray as if debating whether he wanted to eat more or not. Why yeah why? He was able to get out as he felt his lungs clamp shut from fear. Konoha teams usually only have three genin. Without looking at him, the demon's voice had returned to a human tone but Gatu remained silent regardless. The adult is likely going to be a janin. A shinobi of my caliber and at least one or two of the five kids is going to be a chunin, the same caliber as the demon brothers. The janin alone would have been able to handle them, so they would have taken him out first, but with at least one chunin there as well, I wouldn't be surprised if they were defeated. Standing from the couch, the rogue finally looked at him. It would appear he managed to acquire a higher ranked mission than previously thought. I would guess he managed to acquire a B ranked mission with the little money this island has left. Gato began babbling at the killing intent directed towards him. He swore he had no idea they could afford it and vowed to find out how, he also promised to have his contacts find out exactly who was hired. But the shinobi towering above him simply picked up his sword and dismissed him with a roll of his eyes. Don't bother, I'll know who they are soon enough. I'm leaving now. Haku remember the plan. Zero O Octal Zero Naruto had a bad feeling about what was going to happen here. 
They all sat on benches of a small boat as it crossed over the dark waters towards the island of Wave. As they passed through the eerie mist Naruto couldn't help but feel an unease settling over him. It was as if he had been on the boat before, so yeah, something bad was about to happen. He had first felt the unease when he saw the boat. He immediately thought it was the boat that had him on edge and suggested that they could simply water walk to the island. That ended up being a minor argument between him and their sensei. Or rather, he had tried to argue and sensei had dismissed his arguments as he always had. Telling him that while the two of them might make the trip to the island, his teammates didn't have enough chakra to go even halfway. Besides that, if they met hostile forces on the water or the other side they needed to be rested and ready. Exhausting themselves before a fight could get them killed. So Naruto had relented. Now though, the unease was beginning to get to him and he had no choice but to summon his calm and focus for another session of memory retrieval. It wasn't the boat, that didn't bring any more memories than passing under the bridge, which he had remembered when his clones first met Tizuna. So it must have been something else that made him nervous. Slowing his breathing as he began to meditate Naruto realized his breath misted in front of him, even in the dense fog it stood out. The fog, in his mind Naruto could see the mist thickening, becoming so dense he couldn't see his hands in front of him, then from out of the mist he saw a massive sword spinning like a shuriken heading directly for him before it struck the memory dissolved into a man standing on the water. The man had bandages covering most of his face and his forehead protector angled off to one side of his head. The assassin's name was instantly in Naruto's mind. Zabuza. Demon of the bloody mist. He could almost feel his sensei begging them to run, as the janin was held in a ball of water at the swordsman's hand. Sasuke threw a fuma shuriken at him and yet, Naruto somehow knew he was the shuriken. Then that face appeared once more. A girl. Long black hair, soft pink lips, and a gentle smile. She was far cuter than any other girl Naruto could remember. The pain in his chest that told him she would die returned with the memory of her sitting over him as he woke. With a deep intake of breath, Naruto returned to the boat. One thought was in his mind. Who was behind the mask? Who was it that had killed that girl? He didn't know what it meant. But looking at his two clones, Naruto had an idea. He knew someone wearing a mask would be there. And while he wasn't certain how it would help, he felt that wearing his own mask would at least make things even. Creating a new clone, startled his other boatmates, however he had been as careful as he could and so it didn't make much smoke or noise as it simply whooshed into existence. And at the same time had the clone henge into a mask of his own. To the others it would have looked like he had simply create the mask directly. Putting the mask on, he hanged himself to change his hair color from blonde to red making it about twice as long as it usually was. And while none of the others could see it, he had also given his eyes the same red slit he saw his eyes having in the mirrors he remembered smashing. Both his teammates were looking at him weird as he secured the mask of a fox over his face. His sensei even raised his sole visible eyebrow. Any particular reason for the choice in animal? Not really, it's just that I don't think I've ever seen anyone in this mask before. Yeah, they usually only give that mask to loose cannons that cause massive amounts of collateral damage. While his voice was cheery and nonchalant, inside Kakashi was livid. Was it possible that the Hokage had even given him permission to wear the Anbu mask? The boy had the bingo book and the scrolls already, and from Anko, and the Hokage's hidden messages Kakashi was quite certain bringing it up would only result in yet another warning to leave his student be. It was as if the Hokage had only put Naruto on this team as a placeholder. Clearly the old man had personally force-fed information, training, and possibly even those jutsu through the shadow clone feedback. But how far was the village leader going to push the boundaries? On the other hand, when he added that mask to his outfit, the black vest actually seemed to blend in so well, he could easily pass himself off as a hunter nin if not a full-on anbu. Kakashi himself had a little trouble not expecting the illusion to become real and have Naruto begin reporting to him as his subordinates did when he was an Anbu captain. Both of the other genin's eyes had opened comically wide as they gaped at the Anbu-esque boy. His comment about the mask seemed to have struck some kind of chord between the two. Sasuke easily recognized the appearance that Naruto had now gained. It was an intimidating look to be sure. With the red hair and outfit he looked nothing like he once had. Sakura however was now convinced that the reason the village hadn't had a fox masked Anbu since the Uchiha massacre, was because Naruto simply hadn't been wearing his mask. It was a capital offense to impersonate an Anbu. And why the red hair? Asking about it, 
Sakura brought an end to the stunned silence. Simple, Naruto explained. This way no one realizes that I'm the one making those clones. If they see me they'll think that I'm a different person altogether. It was actually a good idea. The two clones sitting in the rear of the boat still wore Naruto's usual orange getup. And with the real Naruto in his mock Anbu uniform with red hair and a mask, they looked completely different. Sharing another silent look, the two real genin almost transmitted the same thoughts between each other. The reason they couldn't figure out his real identity was that he's actually a redhead. Then Sakura realized that the Uzumaki clan were all redheads too. She had thought the name had been fake when she looked into his parents and couldn't find anything, but this meant he might actually be a real Uzumaki. Zero o octal zero as they came ashore, Naruto put his hand on Tizuna with a warning clear in his grip. Whatever was going to happen, would be happening soon. Once the boat left, the group began its trek inland. The engine wasn't even out of hearing range when the blade passed over them. Fortunately Naruto had already remembered the blade. Even before Kakashi gave a shout of warning, the real Naruto had pulled Tizuna to the ground. When Naruto saw Zabuza standing on the handle of his blade which stuck out of a nearby tree, Naruto remembered clearly how the fight went the last time around. Sensei would be caught and he would free him. Then, so that was who wore the mask. It seemed Zabuza had his own hunter Nin accomplice. Was that who would kill the girl Naruto kept remembering? It didn't matter. They would win this time. They were much stronger than before. And if he managed to bring down this masked enemy then he might even save the mystery girl. As they stood, the mist thickened into a soup of chakra-laced clouds. A voice called out with mild amusement, listing the various points he could strike. Sasuke could feel the killing intent, it was far worse than what Naruto had shown in the few times he felt the boy's wrath. It was almost too much to take, he couldn't breath. Then one of Naruto's clones giggled. Oi freak chan. You got no idea how badly you just screwed up. The other one giggled from the Uchiha's other side. They quickly grouped around Tazuna. Kakashi took point, Sasuke and a clone took left and Sakura and a clone took right, while the masked original Naruto took the rear. In response to the clone's comment the listing stopped, and Zabuza spoke plainly. It's no wonder the Demon Brothers failed. This team is quite a gathering. So tell me Hunter Nin, was it you or the Jonin who killed them? Naruto didn't speak because he didn't know if he would be recognized, instead his clone spoke. Ha, huh, as if Kitsune Sama would need to fight against a pair of Chunin when we're here. Those two didn't even make it out of their puddle before we barbecued them. The killing intent around them flared to a height even Naruto didn't remember. Pulling his Hite aid up, the Jonin revealed his Sharingan. This time Zabuza didn't come at them from inside as Naruto expected, instead he dropped in from above, cutting down at Tizuna, who vanished in a burst of smoke. The blade had sliced through the clone before any of them could react. What? Zabuza's surprise was clear, even as Kakashi and the fox impaled the water clone who had spoken. This mist that rose up as we approached was created with chakra, Sasuke coolly explained, the Sharingan can clearly see that. So we decided to leave him behind. In fact, that had been Naruto's plan. He suggested letting Tazuna stay on the boat and meet them farther upstream. This way they could be certain no one was going to attack. What they could only assume was the real Zabuza appeared behind the fox masked boy, his blade swung across, stopping as it met a chakra coated hand. You caught my sword? The masked Naruto turned ever so slightly to look over his shoulder at the man, allowing his red slitted eyes to be seen as well. He focused all the killing intent he had. Which as it turned out, was a lot more than it used to be. He could remember the tale of this guy killing all of his classmates. A bunch of children got slaughtered by him and he laughed about it as if it had been fun. This man was evil. And his accomplice was probably the one who murdered her. Naruto wouldn't let that happen again. Sasuke put his kanai into the new assassin's clone's gut and both water clones burst. Kakashi watched silently, as Sasuke calmed and realized he could tell which were clones and which was the real one. So, are you going to fight us, or are you gonna stay out on the water? The Uchiha acts. His eyes bright red as his second stage Sharingan flared. It wasn't fully evolved yet, but he didn't even have it last time. Naruto knew that made all the difference here. Stepping in front of them all Kakashi reminded them of the order he gave them after they met the Demon Brothers. Their job was to stay back and make sure nothing threatened Tizuna, while he took care of the rogue Jonin. 
The two Jonin fought head on in a series of barely visible combinations, their blades clashing as often as their fists, feet, and other parts. Naruto was almost certain he'd seen Kakashi headbutt the guy's elbow when he pulled up for a downward slash. With the rogue off balance, their sensei pressed him harder and eventually they both wound up in the water. Then the water exploded around them both as a pair of water clones came at Kakashi from below either side. They were dispatched almost thoughtlessly before the water that composed them latched onto the leaf nin. He tried to move but this chakra laced water was too thick and heavy to be normal and soon he was ensnared in a water prison jutsu. The moment sensei got caught in the ball of spiraling water, Naruto put that plan in motion. He remembered exactly how it happened last time. And while this time was slightly different and his aim was certainly better, he still needed Sasuke to pull it off. He had never even tried throwing two Fuma shuriken at the same time. Kakashi told them to run, if they gathered Tazuna and fled deeper inland, he could meet them at the endpoint. But Naruto stood defiantly. So Kakashi began telling them of Zabuza's history. A tale Naruto clearly remembered from last time. The joy Zabuza expressed at the deaths of his classmates. Naruto couldn't forgive such an evil person. With his killing intent racing ever higher, the original Naruto laughed. Since he didn't have any other voice practiced as well as he did for his sexy jutsu, he had to rely on that one. But it seemed the lusty voice of his female henge fit well with his outfit. His clones grinned menacingly when they heard it. Oh. He killed a bunch of kids. So what? The feminine voice sang out, a few brats who weren't even genin yet couldn't have been that big a deal. He's just some eyebrowless freak no matter what his village calls him. Oh and you think you're something else? Zabuza replied darkly. Our graduations are quite similar Boozy Chan. The assassin's eye visibly twitched at the name, and then narrowed at the implications of that statement. However, my examiners were well-known Chunin. The lusty voice almost sounded carefree as he said it. Even the two Jonin flinched as the thought of Mizuki's betrayal managed to boost the fox-masked boy's killing intent. The pain he felt knowing the man had intended to kill him and Aruka welled in his gut. The feelings of betrayal compounded by his two separate memories of it. Adding to the intent he already felt towards this man. On top of that, the clone that was hanged as his mask also began to produce an equal killing intent. Both of them emanating from the same person seemed to mix and increase the intent even further. While their combined killing intent wasn't enough to equal or even anywhere close to, that of the Jonin, when leveled at them with the cheerful voice of the sexy henge, the effect was enough to unnerve even Zabuza as the man took half a step back, ensuring his arm remained attached to the sphere of water. The Mist Nin fully believed that this young Anbu had slaughtered several Chunin for his rank. It was clear the boy was at least as ruthless as he was. Creating a water clone, Zabuza sent it to attack the brat in the Anbu mask, it might not be enough to defeat him, but it should be enough to buy him time as he finished off the Jonin. The clone was almost to the redhead, when the blonde twin Jenin came in from the sides. Both of them were moving as fast as the Demon Brothers had ever been able to. The two of them managed to force the water clone to abandon his assault in order to remain intact. Only for the Jutsu to be finished off by the Uchiha. The water that formed the clone sprayed outwards as the Uchiha's kanai passed through it. The boy looked almost effortless and bored from the clash. Ha! Huh. Did you really think you could beat us with a simple clone? One of the blondes retorted. You're not just facing Kitsune Sama, you're facing Team 7 as well. The other declared, pointing at his teammates, the Uchiha princess and rookie of our year, Haruno Sakura, of the legendary Perfect Chakra Control, and also us. The other continued where he left off, by creating a bunch of shadow clones, all of whom spoke at the same time, we are the Autumn Leaf Army. The genin who will become Hokage. Uzumaki Naruto. So put that name in your bingo book and remember it. Then pulling a massive Fuma shuriken out of his pack the first one tossed it to the Uchiha, Sasuke. Your aim is double mine. Sasuke got the idea immediately after catching the blade. With a quick spin the Uchiha was in the air launching the Fuma shuriken towards the two Jonin. As it neared, Zabuza simply reached out and plucked it from the air, its momentum pulling his arm out to the side. That was when he saw the second blade that had been in the shadow of the first. He had little time to consider his options and simply jumped over the spinning blade allowing it to pass safely beneath him. It was exactly as Naruto remembered it would be, and so the blade burst in a cloud of smoke behind the Jonin, Transforming into another orange clone, 
who used his newly merged clone and henge combo to create a great Oma shuriken, shaped like a regular throwing star, yet at least as large as the windmill blade had been. He coated this blade with wind chakra just as Ebisu had instructed him, yet by having his clone hanged into the blade, also producing the wind chakra, its raw power and range were both increased as the brightly colored genin launched the spinning blade at his sensei's captor. The shuriken sped far faster than his kanai had last time and as Zabuza pulled his arm away, its invisible reach of slicing winds passed through the man's forearm just below his elbow. The janin gave a small shout of pain as his wrist and hand fell into the water. And when the blade passing by him also exploded back into one of the orange brats, he flinched backwards swinging the fuma shuriken he'd caught at the boy. Too late as that clone had already created a new clone behind the wounded swordsman and burst as the Fuma shuriken passed through him. The new clone quickly snatched the massive sword off Zabaza's back and sent it flying towards the first clone still standing out on the water. He caught it and wrapped a shadow clone hanged as a paper tag around the handle and threw it up as high as he could. When it peaked its drive skyward, the tag hanged back into a clone and sent the blade to shore from far above the Jonin's reach. By this time Zabuza had dispatched the clone from behind him and shifted his eyes between Kakashi and the clone out on the water. His bleeding arm curled into his chest as he raised the Fuma blade towards Hitaki. He was backed into a corner. Wounded and clearly outmatched. Even uninjured, Kakashi of the Sharingan would have been difficult to match, but with that hunter nin and the clear skill of those four genin, there would be little chance of victory without the janin even stepping in. There was no denying the fact that a simple genin with an extraordinary cloning skill had managed to take his hand and his blade in one combination strikes. He couldn't even attempt to retrieve the lost hand without inviting Kakashi to take him out. The blood loss was already beginning to affect him. As if sensing his thoughts the copycat spoke. It seems you have been beaten by a mere genin. Yeah, I'll admit that was quite a trick. Zabuza spoke wearily, waiting for one of them to act. Perhaps he should go ahead and be promoted here and now. I'm certainly considering it. The other Jonin chuckled. Then he came. His kanai slammed into the Fuma shuriken just barely in time to be parried. They clashed several times before the rogue managed to make a break for the open waters. As he turned away to retreat, he sent the Fuma blade back toward the Pinket, who had yet to move even once since her sensei had been captured. It passed easily by the other three Jenin only to be intercepted by the many bunshin around coast, all of them throwing themselves in front of the blade, not even hindering its path. Then, just before the blade would reach the girl, the fox hunter brat stepped in line with it and simply plucked it from the air, much as he had. That moment of Kakashi's distraction was enough for him to dive into the water to escape. Unfortunately the copy ninja used a lightning jutsu which required him to leap from the water to avoid it. He was mid-air when the senbon hit him. His body flew sideways parallel to the water as his momentum carried him forward until he crashed on the water's surface tumbling to a stop where he began to sink. Zero O Octal Zero Sakura could only barely feel anything other than her heart pounding in her chest as she looked with startled gratitude at the masked redhead who held Sasuke's windmill shuriken only a meter or so from her chest. Naruto had somehow caught the blade the same way the Jonin had, except this time it had been thrown by said Jonin, that was impossible. She wasn't even sure it was real, she almost knew she had died, but for the boy standing in front of her clearly proving she hadn't. Sasuke however had seen exactly how Naruto had done it. It didn't appear as if the clones had even slowed the blade as it passed through them, but they had. Each one forced chakra out one side of their bodies, resisting the spin of the blade as it cut through them all. By using them, not to stop it, but to slow it. Naruto had decreased its spin to the point that all he had to deal with was the forward momentum of the ring itself. The sheer amount of chakra flowing through Naruto's arm when he caught it was nearly blinding. And it was even less than the amount anchoring the boy to the ground. Looking back into the water, they all saw Zabuza fall as two needles struck his neck. A young boy appeared on the water beside the fallen rogue. The man's severed hand gripped tightly in the boy's fingers. The masked boy laughed as he took the body in hand in his arms, and addressed their sensei. Then turning toward the Naruto who still held the sword, if you would kindly return that sword as well, I will be leaving. It is one of the Mist Village's treasured weapons after all. I can't leave without it. All of the Naruto's were frozen at the sound of that voice. The masked one was the only one to step forward. Just take that guy and go before we have to kill you too. Sakura however seemed to have heard something else as she motioned to him two enemies. 
Zero O Octal Zero at the sound of that voice every clone he had created felt their chests tighten. That was Haku. Naruto had even remembered the girl's name. He knew she had spoken to him before. He could clearly remember them gathering plants. But another image flooded his sight. Haku stood in front of him, her mask broken and falling from her face as mirrors crashed around him. Had he been the one to kill her? He knew Zabuza was alive, but, he couldn't attack Haku. And so he tried to do the one thing that made sense. Just take that guy and go before we have to kill you too. Haku understood the meaning in his words, though he was sure his teammates would have heard it differently. The boy simply held up two fingers and vanished in a cloud of smoke. Zero O Octal Zero He wasn't sure why the boss wanted info on the demon brat, but then again. He didn't know why the boy was called the demon brat either. Still his boss probably wouldn't know the reason either. Most of the time they smuggled information out it was for another village or a merchant group. This time it seemed the request was from some corporate type. What they would want with specifics about a bunch of genin, only Kami could know. Pushing his curiosity aside, the youth shook his head, his job wasn't to ask questions, or, well, it was. But not about the boss and their clients. He could already tell his boss everything he wanted to know about the other two genin. They were easily researched. One would think it would be the Uchiha who would have the most security, but it wasn't. And everything on the Janin was basically public record already. But outside of hearsay, it seemed much less was known about the brat than he could have imagined. He had trouble finding hard evidence of even the most basic information on the boy, such as who were his parents. When was his last medical checkup? As he discreetly gathered what intel he could, he began to feel more uneasy than any other forge had ever made him. This one was out of his pay grade, he decided. He would simply drop what he had already and call it good. Depositing his gathered intel at one of his more hidden drop points, he headed back home. He didn't need to gather very much, there were dozens of informants in every village. Surely one of the others would find out more. Tomorrow he would dig into the Anbu looking kid. Oddly, as much as he thought about it, he couldn't remember ever seeing an Anbu with a fox mask. But then, as long as he didn't have to keep looking into the demon brat, he didn't mind the challenge of an elusive black ops shinobi. As he opened the door to his apartment, he felt the snake bite into his ankle. Its poisons began affecting him immediately. Thanks.